significant differences in our understanding of the underwater domain. And uh, the tropical littoral waters have their very specific challenges which need to be addressed. And that's how I thought of this organization where we are going to be talking, uh, work, working on the policy, technology and innovation and the human resource development. Because going forward, when we look at the underwater domain awareness framework, it's going to be a huge opening and the No, no, he is not. He's from Bhau Institute. Ah, you met him that day. Yes. Neeraj is part of the. Neeraj is part of it. Yes. You've already loaded, sir. No, 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 that we'll delete, sir. We'll, we'll, without permission, we'll not share, sir. No, no, no. No, that as soon as you're done, we'll delete it, sir. That much we'll do. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for joining us for day two of workshop two. We are happy this time we have some new faces and new people joining us for the second workshop. And uh, as always, our endeavor to give you something different, some new inputs, and also take your inputs to shape the future of the UDA framework. There was a very important uh, point raised by one of my naval colleagues yesterday. What is the roadmap for UDA in future? So I have a presentation ready, which I will, uh, it's not scheduled today, but uh, if there is a time, I will definitely. And I would also like to give you a larger journey of UDA globally. I mean, there are powers who have had a UDA journey earlier. It's probably the term which has come 15 years back, but it's only a Canadian naval officer who used this term UDA. But otherwise, it has been the MDA which has been talked about. And as I had mentioned yesterday in my presentation, after the 9-11 and the 26-11, it become became a very regular feature in every strategic discourse but uda per se has not been used so much and some of us believe that the mda is really not very inclusive and comprehensive in terms of the uda coverage 
So today we have a very good uh, panel discussion. We have a research and academia representation. We have an industry representation, and we have also a patent <coughs> counselor representation. We were supposed to have Mr. Mandar Joshi, who is the CEO of the incubation center in Pune Dabhao Institute. I think one of the most important incubation. Unfortunately, he is not able to join us for some reason. Uh, Mr. Neeraj Panchal is joining us online. Uh, so I will, and it is, it will be chaired by none other than uh, Admiral DSP Verma, sir, former Chief of Material in the Navy and also the Director General of the Nuclear Submarine Project. Sir has been instrumental in encouraging a lot of innovations, a lot of industries, a lot of startups for the program. So I think. I will hand over to sir without much delay. And sir, I think we will continue to sit there and I'll request the speakers to because Neeraj will be making a presentation on the screen. So uh, for ease of uh, viewing his presentation, I think I'll request the speakers or panelists to continue to sit where they are and we'll, they can come here. So you'll not be able to. Uh, sir, are you? okay, sir. Yes, yes, please, sir. So, sir, I'll request uh, uh, Commodore Talwilkar, sir, please come on the stage, and uh, uh, Professor Vijay, please come on the stage. And Admiral, sir, kindly take over, sir. Like to face the people. I thought we lost one naval officer, but I see him in CV, so it's okay. I saw him. Uh, I can speak from here. Yeah. Well, today's uh, panel discussion is innovation, the startup ecosystem. Now, all of you know what's an innovation, basically. Anything can be innovation. It could be a product, it could be a process, right? Could be anything where you think differently, make something that is more, it, it could be totally new, or you could be only making a change to make it better, et cetera. And this has been happening, but there has been no, uh, you know, uh, uh, focus in, in uh, innovation, because all of us, I'm sure, must have innovated something to make things better in our uh, time and uh, could have built on it, but there was no ecosystem or thing to help us or push us towards the direction. But today with the great demographic that we have and such bright people, I'm, I, I don't mean that we old people were not bright, but uh, brighter people, okay. It is important that we harness this uh, spirit of innovation, right? And give the direction. Uh, I can give you a small journey. I myself started after I left the Navy and my last uh, job that is around 60, at the age of 67, I also started a small startup. I mean, uh, but for sure it would fail and it failed. Uh, not because we couldn't finish the product. The product was made, product was tested out by big companies. Um, but then uh, there was one thing I didn't cover. I didn't cover my back. So those guys who are working for me, they all, obviously, uh, I get a pension, they don't. So they get a salary or whatever it is, whatever the compensation or whatever you call it. And I had one, uh, only one uh, promoter, right, who was supposed to be giving the money. First year was okay. Second year, you know, a, a promoter always looks for return on investment. So... His investment, return on investment is not coming. He says, I can put in FD and get more money than I'm getting from you chaps, etc. But then to develop something, to you know, innovate and put something, and especially in the area of cybersecurity, uh, it, it was a very good platform. Uh, I, uh, in, in fact, uh, even from the uh, department of uh, that innovation thing, which is in, I, I don't recollect now, DBT, 
DBT. Uh, I went and met the secretary. They were very clear. They gave me forms to fill up, etc. And of course, I gave it to the company to do it because I'm only a, you know, getting the people together. So-called mentor. I stopped calling myself mentor after I failed because uh, a mentor is supposed to take the system through. Um, uh, but yes, I learned a lot. And uh, I had to allow the people to go because I was not going to ask them to continue on hope, you know, so it had to close down. But there was a product completed in 18 months flat. It had trials. We carried out trials on, on a platform. We put it, we had um, Tata, uh, Tata Infotech to come and, uh, you know, um, uh, carry out the complete uh, uh, trials. They were very happy uh, and they were very, very, very ready to join us. But then I suddenly lost all the people because they also learned on the product. They learned on the domain that was given to them. Now they had a product, they had a guy who thinks so. They started on their own. You know, that's how it fissured out. But I won't blame them because obviously, you know, what keeps anybody is he has to look, he's a young man, he's looking at a thing. So there was a failure in the, in the system. Now to avoid such things, though of course it's uh, uh, the present, uh, uh, what you call it, innovation uh, thing that are utter mission, etc. They say if you fail, it's a trial. We'll again give you an opportunity. But uh, the utter mission didn't exist. I was slightly ahead of time at that time. Nor nor was I registered anywhere. Now the system is done. The total system is different. There's a lot of help for uh, people who want to innovate uh, to get into the startup. Think there's an ecosystem that has been created. All of you know about it. I don't have to repeat it. Um, you have, uh, you know, the utter innovation mission, and I think it's important for you people to just go and have a look at the um, uh, utter mission. Uh, it's quite good. I wish it was there. Unfortunately, it came in 2015 or 16, and my 2013 I started, and 2014 or maybe early 15 I had to end up uh, thing. Yes, I lost some money, but uh, not much of mine, more of the promoters, less of mine. So I got away, uh, you know, uh, thing. But yes, there was a big lesson. That is, before you want to mentor somebody, please tell him what are the failures that are possible if you don't look out. The country also, uh, in, the, the, in, the, in the last eight, uh, nine years, has come up with a lot of uh, things for which, which we can call up the ecosystem that has been set up. You have the, uh, you've been hearing of Make in India. You've been hearing of so many hackathons happening. You've been happening, uh, the IDEX, where you can give your ideas, et cetera. So there are a lot happening. So today, there is this, uh, 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 what do you call, environment for those who have uh, ideas uh, to, you know, put their ideas across or align their ideas to what people require. Because sometimes, like IDEX, et cetera, they give you a, okay, anybody who can do X, Y, Z, you know, come up. So maybe you can do that. Use your thing there. And uh, yes, Startup India is another one. Uh, uh, skill India, and that's why we are trying to get into that line in the in this uh, to skill India for with respect to the underwater domain and uh, stand up India and various things like that. So uh, as I mentioned, you know, you can have ideas. I mean, you will have ideas. Uh, you will have inventions. I will call it an invention. Invention is wrong, but then you'll have an, uh, an idea or an innovation in mind. And you probably will have researchers, right? Who, because some of them will have to be researched, will have to be researchers. Uh, you may also have, uh, you know, startups at various stages. Even they require an ecosystem to exist, even if you have managed to cross the first line. And somebody to put the money, right? And you, the, there's the first time, so they become entrepreneurs, right? You're, you're doing something on your own. And the entrepreneurship in the country has really improved. Wherever I go, everyone's saying he's working, you know, I think he's got 10 fellows and he's doing something, which is good. And as all of you know, today, I think uh, uh, number of startups and number of unicorns that India has, I think we are number two in the world. I don't know, is it number one, number two? Okay, I don't know. I think we are, we are uh, the second largest number of uh, startups and I think second uh, largest uh, unicorns also. So that's quite good. It's not small. Yeah? And 
it doesn't matter what number you have the very idea that you have a unicorn a chap who can make a million bucks million right million who who somebody wants to invest 1 million uh, in your thing 1 million or more a unicorn 1 million okay so that means dollars we are not talking rupees is is good right so we call them uh, they can be called angel investors some could be angel investors right that means they are just giving for the like the angels no love of uh, thing and wait for the thing to come and you require startup mentors because the process of uh, you know going from an idea to innovation to startup it, it, it has to follow some logical sequence to to be able to reach uh, 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 the final aim right you can't be an inventor all your life if it doesn't become a product doesn't go into the market there's so much of legal issues which will come in right uh, 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 i think uh, uh, the, the the next speaker uh, who will be talking on ip uh, hello sorry you're behind me but then i'll get to you when you're speaking so he'll tell you all about the ip you know think because i understand he is an ip counsel so he will he will tell you even i'll learn a little more on that uh, advisors lots of them i'm one of them so advisors are always there but please have mentors advisors are many right and uh, and you must have that mind for entrepreneurship anybody cannot become an entrepreneur an entrepreneur is one who is ready for a failure right and doesn't sit on it after that and with all these things come in today it is possible right and i also know i also know uh, this is my personal knowledge lot of nris are investing into this kind of startup ecosystem because i have my own uh, you know uh, i won't say friends but acquaintances who are heavily investing in this and looking at it now you require some organization also right like for example you have the bau uh institute here it's a uh, fantastic they they do incubation they do you know uh, uh, what do you call that um, they have accelerators startup accelerators incubators all of them they have and uh, they have also investors who you know they put you face to face for to get into that line and probably some ip advisors so they've got there's a start there is an ecosystem bau institute which has been created uh, it is in the college of engineering pune but i think it's a it's a independent uh, private uh, it's it's a non government kind of a thing which was set up uh we never heard of something called crowdfunding now crowdfunding also can can take place lot of people do crowdfunding uh, and uh, as far as for for disseminating disseminating your information you know everybody has blogs everybody has media so all these things get help so what i'm trying to tell tell you is basically there is today a culture for entrepreneurship uh, there is a platform for innovation right and uh, there is a uh, uh, what do you call organization to help you that is an ecosystem that has been created so this is the ideal time and i'm glad uh, uh, and and one one as i mentioned to you that to do all this right in all thing you might have an idea but you require somebody to work with your idea so you have to have people with the skills right so you have to start getting the skills also as like this man talks about uda everyone thinks uda means uda nahi uda nahi hai it is underwater domain awareness so you have to make them understand that what is underwater domain awareness everyone knows awareness everyone knows underwater what is domain domain is everything there right so what happens there how much is technology how much is process how much is you know data collection right what are the skills required can we skill them up right and create a ecosystem for them to innovate and think that is the aim of uda so i i suppose will come now uh, and especially for the underwater considering the sagar sagar vision you know you got a uh, uh, what do you call hand on top under the sagar vision you can get into atal mission and then uh, uh, you know uh, 
do a skill India. And yeah. We hope uh, we can use that. I, I purposely brought you back to UDA because this is a U UDA platform. So you must, some of us shouldn't be wondering what, wh what am I going to do here? There is a lot of work there which can be done. Now I leave it to the experts because, you know, I'm one of those generalist fellows speak more from experience rather than from uh, uh, thing. So I leave it to my colleagues here in the thing to continue. And before that, uh, Arna will take over the. Request uh, Talvelkar sir to kindly. Sir. He has a presentation, so you may have to go down. He has a presentation. Sir has a presentation. How do I change? May I start, sir? Good morning, everybody. Today is a pride moment for you, for me to be here with you for the very simple reason. This institute is my alma mater. I passed from this college way back in June 83 from the mechanical faculty. After passing out from college, within a month, I joined Indian Navy. To be very precise, 31st July 1983, landed up in Kochi. The Naval Academy was in Kochi at that time. And then for the next 35 years and four months, it was life in white uniform. Many of you will not be aware of what that life means. Lot of challenges. And despite being mechanical engineer, I had an opportunity to do my M.Tech in computer science from IIT Pawai. In my entire 35 years and four months, my mechanical engineering association has been very minimal. I did project management, I did budget management, finance, HR, training, you name it under the sun and the Navy provided me an opportunity to have an experience or then exposure to it. And that exposure is helping me in my second career in Bharat Forge. I retired from Navy in 2018 
and then for the past three years I am with Bharat Forge. God has got lot of designs for you. What you don't want to do, God makes sure that you do it in this life. I will cite two examples. When I did my MTech in computer science, I was offered MTech in vibrations. And I was very afraid with this concept that even these walls and the roofs, they have got natural frequency of vibration and I couldn't imagine the roof vibrating. So I refused that opportunity. But then my last assignment in Navy, which was Director General Naval Trials and Acceptance Authority, I was heading a unit which was deep into vibration analysis and necessary corrective actions. Second example, in Navy, being a mechanical engineer, I had no exposure or no opportunity to deal with weapons. Today in Bharat Forge, I am deeply involved in indigenous in indigenization of gun barrel and gun jacket. Okay, so moral of the story is do whatever you have to do early in life so that at the end you don't have to do it. Now coming to my presentation today. Innovation and startup ecosystem, underwater domain awareness, industry perspective. The heading is very large. Okay, but I was told that I have to focus more on the underwater domain awareness and also have to give a few of my thoughts on the ecosystem, startup ecosystem. That's why the heading is a little bigger. Next slide, please. I'll be covering my presentation under the following heads. Little bit of company introduction. The initiatives Bharat Forge has for skill generation and innovation. Then the products what Bharat Forge is dealing with related to underwater domain. Initiatives of Bharat Forge to support MSMEs. And then the wish list for a sustainable ecosystem. A very brief company introduction. Bharat Forge was founded in 1966. Initially, for, till about 2020, it was a component manufacturer and a preferred supplier. Subsequently, the company realized that they have to get into the design and then they became a design partner or a development partner. But then from 2012 onwards, a need was felt to get more into the design and then subsequently the company, what is today, is an engineering technology solution provider and it also expanded its product profile. It's, uh, the turnover is more than 3 billion US dollars and it has presence across the globe 16 locations in India, 5 in Europe, and 2 in America. The industries which Bharat Forge serves, automotive, commercial vehicles, private vehicles, oil and gas, power, railways, defense, agriculture, and aerospace. Some of the product profile related to defense are as shown. Artillery guns, armored vehicles, protected vehicles, ammunition, small arms, and a few electronic items also. Coming to the marine, where I am particularly dealing with, the first what you see is the naval armament, SRGM gun, which I just mentioned, the underwater systems, torpedoes, AUVs. I'll be touching this in more detail subsequently. Lithium ion batteries for the strategic submarines and electromagnetic launch systems. And in the core marine engineering, we deal with propulsion system integration, shafting, steering gear, and certain varieties of pumps. Now coming to the skill generation, Bharat Forge has got a unique program where certain select uh, personnel are sent for studies at the cost of company and while they are on the payroll of the company. A few of them go, uh, are sent for undergraduate studies, few of them are sent for postgraduate studies in both management as well as in technical subjects at IIT Pawai as well as with BITS Pilani and few of them are sent for postdoctoral programs. This trained manpower is utilized at something known as KCTI, Kalani Center for Technology and Innovation. There are two of them. One is in Pune at Keshav Nagar, second is in Bangalore. And this KCTI is the heart of technology driven strategy. The KCTI has got tie up with a large number of reputed academic and institutions across the world. The facilities available at KCTI Pune 
include failure analysis, metallography, a large number of NABL accredited labs are there for various testing of material and validation studies. In-house design capability has been set up at KCTI and we have a large number of software, Unigraphics, SolidWorks, CATIA, Abacus, etc. Finite element analysis, CFD analysis is also undertaken and the result of the, we also have a very unique software called as sharp designer software it doesn't do sharp design but it does calculations related to shafting alignment vibration analysis and the bearing reactions this is useful uh, during the design stage as well as during maintenance stage the result of kcti's facility is shown on the slide we have been able to develop the bitendetic steel for front axle beam. This has an impact on light weighting and higher strength. The, uh, there are eight artillery guns which Bharat Forge has developed and KCTI has contributed handsomely in that. The KCTI at Bangalore specializes in jet propulsion technology. So far, they have successfully validated and tested 40 kgf, 80 kgf and 160 kgf thrust jet engines and presently they are working for development of 400 kgf thrust engines. They undertake engine cycle analysis, design of compressor, turbine, rotor dynamic analysis, heat transfer analysis and they also have a lab to test the engine what they have developed. KCTI is assisted by KCMI Kalyani Center for Manufacturing and Innovation. And here, a large variety of sophisticated machine tools are available. Metal injection molding can be undertaken. We undertake 3D printing also, uh, plastic as well as metal. Very sophisticated gear manufacturing facilities there. There are nanotechnology lab, RF lab, AI lab, large number of facilities are available. One of the product what I like to mention here as far as the innovation is concerned is the in-house development of oxygen cylinder during the COVID pandemic. You will remember that during COVID there was an acute shortage of oxygen cylinders for patients and Bharat Forge undertook this task on itself. The in entire initial, I mean, development was done ab initio and then huge, I think few lakhs of uh, these uh, uh, oxygen cylinders were developed in a flat three months and delivered. Okay. Uh, the body is aluminum. Bharat Forge hardly deals with aluminum, but the complete design, development, proving, and supply happened in three months. This is the commitment. Now, coming to the products related to underwater domain, Bharat Forge is presently dealing with expendable underwater targets. This simulates submarine for torpedo firing and training. Having a submarine at sea is a very costly affair. And if we have something to emulate the presence of a submarine, that becomes much more simpler and easier. Similarly, we have a mobile target emulator. If you are firing a torpedo, you need a target. And for that, again, having a submarine is a costly affair. So if you have an active propelled decoy, you can use it very effectively. Then another area is autonomous underwater vehicle. Particularly, uh, if we have to do magnetic signature mapping of a ship, we need to go to Goa. Okay. And again, there are limitations because in monsoon, ships can't be deployed there. So there is an autonomous vehicle, which is underwater vehicle, and there are magnetic sensors provided. So the, way the vehicle can go around the ship and do the magnetic signature measurement. Then certain torpedo upgradation has been undertaken by Bharat Forge for a variety of torpedoes and the spares have been supplied. And Bharat Forge is also trying to do something with sonoboids and seabed surveillance system. Now you are aware that sonoboids are required because uh, the typical domain what we have, underwater domain, the turbidity of water, temperature and the profile, you know, is very, very bad for sonar. We hardly get any ranges. And therefore, to facilitate detection of underwater targets, we need to have sonoboys and that too in large number. And that is one area where Bharat Forge is trying to explore possibilities. The mobile target emulator, it looks like this. Uh, in addition to what Bharat Forge is doing, 
Bharat 4 is also trying to support some MSMEs. I will cite example of two MSMEs with Bharat 4 is dealing with. One is Aeron Systems Private Limited. It is a Pune based system, a Pune based company. They specialize in embedded systems and they are developing inertial navigation systems. Now you will appreciate that it is not possible for any company to have vertical specialization in many, many fields. It's a very costly affair. So best is tap the resources from outside so that, you know, the collaborative environment, both parties can win. Similarly, we have a tie up with Cognit Bangalore for development of language translators. This is particularly useful for my army colleague and he happens to be from infantry. So probably he will understand the importance of it more. Okay. And field trials are presently going on. Okay, now coming to the most important part of the presentation. Although it is just one single slide, I can spend hours and hours on this, but I will take only a few minutes. The first part is the funded R&D. This is the wish list of, an, of a company. And what I mean by funded R&D? I'll again cite the example of Bharat Forge. Bharat Forge has developed eight variants of artillery guns for Indian Army. This development has taken 10 to 12 years. And this complete development has happened ab initio, siu moto, on so-called NCNC, no cost, no commitment basis. Not a paisa has been funded by either government or any other agency. Okay, how many companies can afford this kind of R&D? Very few. Okay, so this is one area where, I mean, I don't find too much of thrust the companies are giving for R&D. But if the R&D gets funded, you know, we do not have scarcity of talent. There is enough talent. Only thing what we need is some helping hand and some backup. So funded R&D is something which the policy makers must take this point home. Second is willingness to accept failures in development. No development will happen without failures. It is impossible or rather impractical to expect that I will develop certain things which is new one and that to write in the first attempt. And unless we fail, we will not even learn. I'll just give one example. Sir, pardon me, it is, okay, I will avoid the classified part of it. There was a missile to be fired from one of the strategic platform. Okay, the missile was fired and it went somewhere else. When the analysis was done, it was realized that the system was reset once or twice. Every resetting, there was a certain algorithm which oriented the missile to go in a different region. Had we not failed, this important lacuna couldn't have been recognized. And imagine the consequences of this when we were in actual, you know, battlefield. Okay, so failures are a must and therefore we must be ready to accept failures for the development process. Every uh, failure has got cost and time implications and we need to be patient to see that we are able to move ahead despite failures. Now, another important one, new technologies and not merely tail chasing. Okay, there are dare to dream projects, etc. I'm not, you know, criticizing them. They are required. But are we really looking at Absolute new technology. Some of the examples which I cite there are like say water jet engines. Now water jet engines have been there for ages together. We are now trying to develop that technology. Okay, it's a good step because we did not have it. So we must have it now. But then that is not the end. We need something absolutely new. If you recollect the internet is because of defense initiatives, the defense ARPA program in America. Okay. Defense needs to be at the forefront of R&D. Unfortunately, in India, that is not so. There are many, many areas where we have a huge amount of work to be done. Underwater is a very, very important domain where huge amount of work is to be done. Okay, I have, in my last assignment, I was DG Nata, where I dealt with vibrations, underwater radiated noise, and mitigation technologies for it. I'll tell you a few examples where we are lacking badly. You know a fan, a propeller is a fan. 
any fan you start it makes noise propeller also makes noise that noise gets transmitted in water and it can be picked up by the enemy sonar and your position and your identity can be easily compromised we are looking at a propeller which minimizes noise generation okay we call it cavitation and this cavitation happens at a certain speed okay if this speed at which the cavitation occurs can be prolonged that means instead of say 10 knots if it happens at say 20 knot 25 knots the advantage would be that the speed of advance of ships can be effectively increased that will increase the maneuverability and will also affect or rather prevent detection of uh, ships at an early stage we have made extensive progress in the field of missiles in the field of nuclear okay space but i am ashamed to say that india does not do propeller design okay my colleague is here from you know i mean i at least i am not aware that whether we are doing any propeller design and if we are doing it then cavitation delay should be one of the major factors what we need to take into account second is the shock vibration mounts the entire equipment design okay we have got very good stealth platforms but they remain on paper the implementation <laughs> that you know there are simple things like noise shorts cavitation i mean the noise pass through the pipes the ventilation systems there are many areas where a good work can be done npl has developed fantastic sonars but then they have limited in a very very close domain the remaining of the navy has not got benefited okay so we need to have this you know the silos need to be broken and such experts which are there from npl who are retired scientists need to be tapped industry is available to you know undertake the work if the government policies facilitate and funding is done industry government and such academia can be a very potent combination to develop absolutely state of the art technology the last point the commercial aspects for msme verma sir explained in his opening speech that the efforts what he did you know in this uh, startup sector were could not be successful and one of the prime reason for that was the commercial viability of the project okay bharat forge is presently dealing with two msmes there is third one also black uh, black straw okay but at some point of time these msmes will stand on their own feet okay ultimately this is a commercial relationship so when they stand on their own feet you know things may not be so easy for them for many msmes they may not be able to be lucky to have companies like bharat forge to support them so their commercial viability needs to be ensured so that the talent doesn't go you know is not wasted well uh, i must thank arnav das to give me this opportunity because first is that i'm ex coep and then secondly able to air my views which are so close to my heart so thank you arnav and i'm coming to the end of my presentation here if there are any questions i'll be happy to take on i thought that i would be the last speaker because there are so many eminent speakers on the panel but then i was again pleasantly surprised to be the first one to give my talk thanks a lot as convenient yes okay
Thank you, sir. Komodo Talwilka, sir, thank you so much um, uh, for your very fine presentation. I will request uh, uh, Dr. Vijay Kumar to please come and give his uh, picture. Very good morning. Am I audible? Uh, I will, as a part of introduction. So, I joined Navy along with Arnav. We are NEC 7 engineers, naval architect, turned to naval architect. I did my BTEC from naval architecture and shipbuilding from Cochin University of Science and Technology. Did my postgraduate diploma from IIT Delhi, a two years course. Then, um, of course, as a part of the service only. Then did my IIT Madras MTech in the ocean engineering. That was a little bit of turning point. Till then, I was more inclined towards management and management side. Some insight into the research activity has triggered me there. <clears throat> we did a project um, that was uh, a vessel which was built in a country abroad. They were trying to plane. The vessel was just ditching. It was not even able to plane. So that was a case and it came as a, a surprise to them. They made a model, took it to our uh, ocean engineering department. I was doing my MTech. I took up that as a, uh, my guide was able to give me that as a project and we did it. Within 10 days, we could solve the issue. Uh, and that was one. Second uh, project, uh, what came was that, is that they built a lubrication oil tanker. The tanker was supposed to go and deliver the oil to the vessels which is there in the oceans which are at the anchorage and it was designed to go 10 knot speed and after four knots the vessel tried to read more than the four knots it starts vibrating at the aft so they could never go more than four knots then happened is the current at that place is four knots they were all panicking again it came to uh, IIT Madras to solve the issue. Professor Ananda Subramani was there. I was doing the MTech. I take it as a MTech thesis project and did a thorough analysis that gives uh, small, small mistakes what we make in the design lead to a bigger problem later on. And uh, which we try to ignore at the start of the point also create a uh, problem. So this too has initiated me into dwell upon into research. And as a part of the course, I did my PhD from IIT Delhi. That is also Navy related work and uh, completed that, continued in the service. And that after 21 years took a VR, then joined IIT Madras as a faculty. Now I am associate, pro associate professor in the ocean engineering department. <clears throat> uh, this is my small journey in the last 20 or 27 years into the uh, both in Navy as well as in the academics. So when uh, Arnab called me and told me you have to talk about innovation, in startup in underwater domain, I was a little worried. And in the morning tea, when so I was asking, are you ever involved with the startup? Then immediately my answer was to tell sir no, because I was quietly involved in the watching a startup to grow, flourish, and then suddenly demise. So that made me to not to accept that I wanted to be a part of that. Uh, part of in the startup environment or ecosystem. But if you really analyze what all says, when you do a journey of the startup and innovations, you make a lot of mistakes and a lot of learnings. So today also a lot of learning. Some of the questions uh, post also, I will be able to take up to back into it. Being a pure academicians, how to, I want to innovate and give a lectures. So my first introduction is to look at it academically and look at it what all the successful start startups which are there recently, which has developed and which we are all using it. And what is the startup ecosystem in IIT Madras? These are the three headings I will be able to analyze. The first one was to list down what all the areas in which, where we can a startup in the underwater domain. So I have listed down, I have made a list of 13 number of cases. I'm going to read it. Please have a patience to listen to me. I, I have got a presentation, but that is for the second sessions where I'm going to talk about underwater robotics and I will also deal with what all the work I do. So the potential startup area as academicians, I listed on 13 number of areas, which covers almost all the domain being most of your st students who want to look into the underwater domain and what all the areas I will list it down. The first one is marine energy storage. 
solutions for offshore renewable energy sources. We have offshore renewable sources able to pl place it somewhere, but you have to transmit, can able to store and then able to get it back. That is one area. Second, autonomous underwater vehicle for inspection, maintenance and research task already. So there are su certain successful startups which are available, but you can look at it. Third, marine robotics for various applications, including search and rescue, underwater mapping and surveillance. Fourth, sustainable marine coating to reduce environmental impact of marine transportation. Fifth, ocean monitoring system to track ocean, ocean, oceanic parameters such as temperature, pressure, and salinity. I will be talking about gliders in the next uh, lessons, uh, next uh, presentations. Sixth, Marine traffic management system to manage marine traffic in busy ports and shipping lanes. We also have certain systems which have been developed by IIT Madras for this. anti fouling technologies to prevent the buildup of marine organisms on the hull of the ships and the boats. Coastal protection technologies to protect coastal areas from erosions, flooding and other environmental hazards. Ninth, marine waste management system to collect and dispose marine waste including plastic waste and other water pollutants. 10. Marine aquaculture technology for sustainable sea productions. I'll just touch upon this in my next presentation also. Then 11th, offshore drilling technologies to improve the safety and efficiency of offshore drilling operations. 12th, marine seismic technology for marine seismic survey and explorations. 13. Marine communication system for ships, boats, and offshore uh, installations. 14. Marine materials that can withstand harsh marine environment, including maintenance cost and improving the lifespan of the marine structures. 15. Marine data analytics tools and perform to analyze oceanic data and support decisions making in the mar maritime industry. 16. Marine desalination system of seawater and brackish water. 17. Underwater mapping and surviving technology for underwater environment. 18. Marine cybersecurity solutions for maritime industry, including ships, ports, and offshore installations. 19. Marine weather forecasting system for marine environment. 20. Marine renewable energy storage solutions for offshore renewable energy sources. 21. Marine pollution monitoring system to track pollutants in marine environment. 22. Offshore aquaculture system for offshore seafood production. 23. Marine biodiversity conservation technologies to protect and conserve marine bio biodiversity and ecosystem. 24, marine tourism technology to enhance the tourist experience in marine environment. 25, marine search and rescue technology for search and rescue operations in the maritime industry. 26, marine cargo logistics and track system to track, uh, track and manage cargo logistics in the maritime industry. 27, Marine geotechnical engineering solutions for marine structures and installation. 28, marine hydrodynamics for marine hydrodynamic analysis and design. 29, marine spatial planning system for marine spatial planning and management. Then 30, marine biomimicry of nature solutions. Certain propulsion devices also can be a mimicking certain uh, marine organisms where they have the maximum efficiency compared to the propulsion it's 60 to 6 uh, maximum 65 percentage of efficiency which you can have so you have got a huge growth there also and uh, there are certain projects which you are doing we will discuss it in the uh, later so when arnab gave me this task i immediately went on to the internet and then searched what are all the latest uh, startups which are successful startups so it, uh, seven names have popped up and those seven names some of our who are working on the certain underwater uh, domains awareness and the underwater uh, robots building up should have approached them and got certain uh, items from there and used it so seven names which came out from the net once i googled it was so far ocean technologies that develops and deploys autonomous ocean monitoring system provide real time ocean conditions including temperature currents and the marine life blue robotics we also bought a lot of thrusters from them for making use in many of the uh, rovs then aquabotics, navatics, open ocean robotics, and the last one was planis technologies. That really in, in, in planis, plan planis, p a l n y s, planis technology. That is an ecosystem which developed from our ecosystem, IIT, the IIT Madras, which the two M Tech students started off, and then they have grown. 
and then grown big for the IIT system to manage, meaning they, they have been told to move out. So the IIT system worked and then they are quite successful. And uh, in fact, if you have invited them, they have been invited and they have been giving talks to many places. They, they started with the small robots. They do a lot of underwater inspections. They do inspection in the dams. They do, uh, they come out with many, many, uh, this one. So IIT Madras as a whole, it is to talk about uh, them. I also picked it up. Uh, some of the uh, numbers may not be right, but it is a quite good numbers to talk about. So we have um, around uh, in the uh, this one, there are more than 200 or more than 300 startups which have been there. We have, start, we have four startup incubations. Uh, this one uh, centers initially started with um, uh, this one. Incub uh, the incubation center started with uh, the rural technology and business incubator, then healthcare technology innovation center, then bio incubator and the research park. The research park, the facility which is available is to see, to believe it, uh, very fine buildings, got a very good uh, amount of uh, facility for uh, incubate, incubating and having a startup to startup. So I was also gone there and seen having an idea to have my own startup on certain research, which I am doing it. So it does provides you a space. It provides you a seed funding, uh, a, a initial amount of funding, space, space in the sense where your people can work free of cost and um, uh, certain labs and certain rooms, well furnished rooms for conducting your meeting with uh, others. They have a legal system to support you. They will do the market analysis of your product viability, whether it is going to survive or not. And they will mentor you through all your journey. The, generally, the startup starts with one or two persons. The IP production, they will give, get it. IP production, they will do it. Then when you grow, how to grow, where to market it. And that makes a lot of difference for the young boys. The main idea was to have it as at least we have to generate certain amount of job and job opportunity, and it has been successful. They, one of the um, old uh, numbers says that uh, more than 300 to 400 startups have been come out over there. They have uh, $135 million fundings combined over 1.4 billion or the earnings or something in that range it is there. Certain successful one or uh, develop into a bigger and bigger system, and then they transit out of IIT system. So some of them are Agnicool Cosmos, Fabred Automations, Data Technology, Modulus Housing, even 3D printed housings, all those things are available. Uh, so some, some other startups which are developed and then uh, they are able to venture into the market. See, the, start, the success rate of the startups incubated at IIT is also not very high. It's high, but not very high. I will not let out the numbers. I'm not sure about it. It depends on various factors. At what stage you are starting your startup, how the ind industry operate, and quality of your product, and what kind of service you can give to the product. All those things it depends upon. Of course, other factors like environment, where you pitch in, and how you are getting the help from the ecosystem and all those things. See, in conclusion, I would like to say that the underwater technology presents an enormous opportunity for all the people, all innovators and people who are in, in, want to discover new things, put up an idea and get up into a new products. It is because the domain is big and av available opportunities are there. Uh, by working together from industry, academia, and the partnerships, this ecosystem can be successful and startup can be successful. With this, I would like to conclude my talk, any questions and other things, you can have it. Thank you. Thank you, Vijay. Your ability to always focus and come out with very, very <clears throat> critical inputs. Uh, now I do... Uh, now I'd like to invite uh, Mr. Neeraj Panchal, my very good friend.
Uh, Neeraj, kindly introduce yourself and then uh, make your presentation. Thank you so much. Thank you, Arunab. Uh, if you can just thumbs up. Uh, well, if you hear me, okay. Am I audible? Yes, sir. Okay, thanks. Well, uh, uh, the topic which is very close to my heart uh, when it comes to innovation and the startup ecosystem where um, India is at the right spot currently. Um, so I thought it would be a good idea. I wanted to be there in person, but somehow some health issue erupted uh, last night and uh, I could not make it. Uh, we'll try to share my thoughts uh, as much as I can uh, through this medium, but uh, uh, we'll remain connected uh, later on also. My name uh, is Neeraj Panchal and I'm uh, intellectual property professional for last 22 years or so. Uh, worked with uh, different organizations uh, with IP firms, but majorly I uh, remain connected to the industry where uh, I can actually contribute uh, from the very beginning or conception of the ideas. Um, coming to the topic of today, uh, where startup ecosystem and innovation have been talked about. I was listening to uh, our earlier speakers and especially uh, Mr. Verma, who <laughs> mentioned uh, very nicely the entire ecosystem. One thing I picked up from there is the, uh, the risk, the risk uh, which is inherent part of any startup uh, or any business for that matter. So, how do we cover that risk? Uh, how we can somehow be prepared to mitigate the risk? Uh, at the same time, I feel that failing is important. I've seen that in many uh, inventions, which could not uh, make it to the commercial. As I uh, I deal with in innovations or inventions. Uh, on daily basis. So, my personal belief is uh, efforts are important and uh, the direction is definitely important, the guidance, the advisory uh, we get in the ecosystem, uh, which uh, as I was mentioning, the currently India is at, uh, at a point where <clears throat> I think we have everything um, which is needed to take it forward. Uh, looking at the all the possible driving forces which we have, whether we call it Skill India, Startup India, Innovation India, uh, those initi initiatives taken by the government, and then look at uh, the intellectual property. Um, and I'll briefly talk about uh, what IP is uh, for the for the benefit of everyone, uh, and please excuse me if it is um, any repetition uh, for anyone. But I'll be uh, talking the details later uh, during the later session. So uh, intellectual property uh, is a creation of your mind. Uh, it has multiple facets. It protects. Uh, the inventions uh, and inventions and innovations are two different things. Innovations uh, may not necessarily be uh, inventions, uh, but invention plus commercial aspect makes it innovation uh, where commercialization is uh, possible. So inventions are part of the patent system where uh, patents are granted and uh, patents are for limited period of time. Uh, across the globe, it is 20 years. A few 
uh, myths or misconceptions uh, some people have uh, that there's a global patent or worldwide patent. There's, there are no such things like uh, worldwide or global patents in whichever country you are interested in protecting your invention, you have to file the patent in that country. Um, there are some systems through which you can file globally uh, or in multiple countries. And then at a later stage, when you have funding, when you uh, have uh, proof of concept, when you are confident enough, then you can accordingly um, expand the scope of your invention protection. It's a costly affair. Uh, in India, it is not. India is still uh, very good in terms of supporting the innovation system, uh, the patenting system especially for the startups, for individuals, uh, for uh, individual inventors. So uh, that's majorly all about patents. Uh, then comes uh, design um, patents, which are protecting the aesthetics of any product. <clears throat> Coming to uh, the branding aspect, which is covered or protected by trademarks. Uh, unlike design patent or utility patents, uh, trademarks are mostly um, forever or sort of virtual, depending on uh, you have to pay the renewal fee on a regular basis. Now, uh, when we are talking about the ecosystem, there are two very important uh, statistics I would like to highlight here. Uh, one is Global Innovation Index. So Global Innovation Index is uh, published by uh, World Intellectual Property Organization that is part of uh, uh, UN or WTO, where India uh, in FY22 has reached at 40th position from, uh, I think, 83rd position in 2015. So this is uh, also indicating that uh, in terms of innovation globally being recognized and uh, we are making our mark. And this, uh, this Global in Innovation Index covers 143 countries of the world. So that is very significant. Uh, another uh, statistics which is uh, very important from the intellectual property point of view, and especially on the patenting side. Um, this year, uh, that is FY22, India has reached at the uh, fifth position in the world of patent filing, which is uh, which is remarkable. So. Uh, it is also indicating that ecosystem is supportive and we are uh, getting there where we should be. Uh, the only thing is that, you know, covering the back as uh, Verma sir was talking about, when you have uh, innovative concepts in mind, you need to uh, protect them. And that's how you can, to some extent, cover it. Uh, and there are a lot of uh, initiatives under UTL, under startup, where uh, that protection system uh, is basically available. If I uh, talk about the technology and uh, especially under the uh, uh, under water domain or Sagar, uh, the initiative started by the Prime Minister in 2015. There are uh, several areas where uh, uh, potential is pretty much there. If I look at the top domain areas um, in which uh, patent filing is happening across the world is computer technology, communication uh, technology, and artificial intelligence. At the same time, uh, looking at uh, the frontier technologies, uh, which are like 
next five years uh, defining the world or maybe uh, covering 50 percent of uh, the growth areas are like uh, internet of things iot machine learning uh, deep learning and things like that and all those um, areas all these domains i strongly feel uh, there's a lot can be contributed under the those uh, initiatives under the initiative like this where uh, we are gathering together and uh, doing brainstorming finding ways how to uh, how to skill the right uh, people or how to uh, enhance those skills where people can contribute and leverage uh, there are certain uh, initiatives which everyone should be aware of that if we uh, leverage the patenting system it also helps in uh, uh, your funding uh, when you raise funds um, some of the inventors or i would say most of the inventors would like to uh, see how protected you are and ip is the best measure of you being innovative and being careful um, to protect your innovations average patent granting time uh, is usually two years which should not be bothersome to anyone so once you file your patent application you you can take a call you can go to the public you can talk about uh, the invention because that time <clears throat> once uh, the patent application is filed for uh, for at least 18 months till the time pa uh, patent application is published for uh, review um, it is confidential and uh, patent office under obligation that they would not reveal so it is confidential that's one secondly you secure your date so you have the priority over anybody else who comes after you so uh, that is that is one thing which many people uh, take leverage take advantage recently i met one startup uh, that was in the field of two wheelers though but uh, they are coming up uh, on a uh, electric two wheeler and considering an area where a lot of uh, companies are getting into uh, they first what they did they filed some 20 plus patents uh, to secure their innovativeness their uh, novelty features and looking at their confidence level uh, and the kind of funding they have already received 150 crores uh, as i understood they have uh, already received this month i think 17th uh, march they are uh, uh, bringing their first product uh, into the market so they have uh, fully leveraged the the entire ecosystem and i see that uh, looking at pune's ecosystem uh, which is i would say after bangalore uh, where uh, these initiatives are being uh, you know concentrated and uh, our new controller general of the patent who uh, who's actually coming from the industry uh, this is first time that's happened is also very supportive um, towards creating that strong patent system uh, collaborating with uh, industry collaborating with academia um, he was sharing one story that he was a researcher and he uh, he wanted to file his patent application which took a uh, good number of years so he understands the pain and keeping that in mind he is keeping the uh, the patent system at the forefront at the same time uh, whether you can say uh, you know g20 uh, uh, presidentship that India is uh, leading. There are some uh, uh, questions asked in the past uh, about the Indian patent system. So I think all those things are also uh, playing key role in uh, 
in support of uh, this ecosystem where uh, uh, where we are at par whether you take any uh, any developed nation's name or their patent system i think we are uh, at par if not better than yeah. Yeah. hello yeah uh, better than their uh, patent system so our laws are fantastic enforcement wise also things are way better i can say way better than china despite china is uh, number one country in the world for filing patent applications this year they filed 1.6 million patent applications whereas we at uh, uh, fifth position have filed 65 65 patent applications so the gap is huge so the journey is long but i think we are uh, fully ready uh, to take on and uh, um, yeah, I think that's all what I would like to share now and uh, happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Neeraj. It was definitely very comprehensive and uh, a broad perspective on the entire startup ecosystem and innovation. Uh, so any questions from anybody? Kindly uh, mention your name and uh, whom is the question uh, for? Uh, okay, my name is Aditya Thakre. Uh, I am from CIP. My basic question is that, like Talwarkar sir has said, willingness to accept the failure in development. But when the failure jab, uh, failure jab bhi aata hai, to wo mitigate karne ke liye usse pehle risks kaise calculate kiya jata hai? The question is to uh, Commodore Talwilkar. Anyone? Anyone. Uh, Thank you. My, uh, I would like to answer your question by another question. Do you really need to assess the risk? Okay, what is the risk in the first place? Okay, if I have to develop something, for example, I have to develop, let's say, a rocket. Okay, the biggest risk is that I will fail, right? Okay, is there any mitigation technology available to me? Okay, see, the problem is, I mean, don't feel bad, but we get too bogged down by these theoretical terms, risk, risk management, etc. If we have to transit from place A to place B, there will be problems en route. Okay, we have to prepare ourselves to address those problems as and when they come. When I meant for, you know, the, we should be ready for failures, what I'm saying is that the development process is never smooth. There will be issues which you have not foreseen. And as you cannot foresee all situations, it is difficult to assess a risk. Are you getting me? I can assess a risk if I know what are the problems. But my first problem is I don't know the problem. I hope I'm uh, making it clear. You see, risk management, risk assessment, mitigation, everything is fine. But then, if you are in a state where you're doing something first time, it is very unlikely that you will come across with all the possible problems in the first go. Okay, I'll give you an example. We were involved in Bharat Forge to develop certain components of a pump. It is a main circulating pump used on board submarines to provide seawater for cooling application to a variety of consumers. Okay, it's an established design, right? We manufactured components as per drawing, assembled it. When the pump was tested, there were problems which we had not foreseen. Okay, and we had to come up with you know answers to those problems as we face, right? This kind of risk. It's very difficult to assess earlier and then mitigate it, correct? So if I have to go for any development, I will not give too much of thrust for risk assessment and risk mitigation. For the very simple reason, I am not in a position to even understand what problems I'm likely to face in future during the development program. Okay, so one more question. 
जैसे कि लास्ट वीक में सुबेदार सर का वर्कशॉप वर्क, सेशन हुआ था उन्होंने वहाँ पे बताया था कि कंटेनर मैन्युफैक्चरिंग जो कि चाइना काफ़ी सस्ते रेट में हमसे सेल करता है वैसे जब मैं डिग्री में था तब मैं मेरे दिमाग में भी आइडिया था कि कंटेनर हाउसिंग्स वगैरह उस सेक्टर में उतरे या कंटेनर मैन्युफैक्चरिंग में उतरे तो जो कि रॉ मटेरियल मिलने की जो रेट है जो इंडिया में उसका रेट भी ज़्यादा रहता है और मिलते भी नहीं है इन कम क्वांटिटी में तो फिर उस जगह पे हम कैसे कर सकते हैं और एक कि जब भी कोई भी स्टार्टअप्स के अंदर हम जब उतरते हैं तो फिर मार्केट रिसर्च रहता है या मार्केट सर्वे रहता है तो कौन से क्राइटेरिया फिक्स करें जो कि हम फिर उतरेंगे या रिस्क कम आएगी या फेल्यूअर जाने के चांसेस कम रहेंगे उसमें Uh, I'll hand over to Neeraj. Uh, uh, after, I mean, even your first question also, I think Neeraj should intervene. But I just want to. You mentioned about the last uh, week's pre uh, presentation by Captain Subedar. See, many times what happens is that we do not have the global picture. I mean, particularly when you talk about containers, uh, container is not a domestic requirement. It is an international requirement. So, वहाँ पे what i could i mean i have not got into the nitty gritties of that issue but broadly what uh, uh, and there are issues of politics also in that so we'll not go too much into that but you must understand the global picture also when you do uh, because see at some point i mean sometimes what happen my understanding is sometimes startups do not have the broad picture they have a great idea they even think that they will be able to pull off the product but you have to look at the long term viability of the product what is the policy existing policy and what is the possibility of future policy because see it takes a long while for you to come out with a product if the shelf life of the product is very short and if your agility to transform does not match up with that then you're totally out of sync with what's going on but in the case of container containers is a global entity and it has to follow the global standards so you must be aware of the larger i mean like what uh, mr neeraj has been talking about you know you have to have a global understanding of the whole i mean patent is just one i mean even what i learned from him is that even when you want to do any innovation what is innovation which has not happened before right how will you ensure that this has not happened before so even going into the patent literature like in normal research we do a literature survey but literature also of is of different types and there are different areas where the literature is available one is the research literature one is the corporate literature both have a very different aspect and their agenda is different a corporate literature is different where the corporate wants to reach out the research literature is literature is different where they want to report something which may not have practical relevance but the way they put that literature is different and the third literature is the patent literature what all innovations are many times many startups think that they have a fantastic idea but when you get into this what you are thinking has been thought of by somebody maybe 10 years back or 5 years back and it's already done and dusted so it's very important to start right and you also have to have a sense of the ecosystem ki where is this information because that patent literature will not be available in the other search engines that you are looking at so you have to be very specific you have to know where to go right so i hope i have answered your question neeraj i would like you to intervene on his first question i think you will be most appropriate to answer that thank you sir i think you one second neeraj uh, sir wants to yeah yeah sure yes sir just uh, first plan is to make a housing container yes yes so so why why i mean 
there are container houses everywhere right in the recent um, dubai you have seen that no so what is, see first you have to decide when you're going in what is the innovation part what is the thing that you're going if you're just going for a manufactured container and convert it into a house by containers being used as you know thing example in uh, in uh, in uh, the dockyard where we have we don't have enough place so we're using containers right because when the ship comes Rahul Gandhi went all over the place. There were those containers. So you have to find out what is the, what is the, what is the USP? What is your USP? What is the new thing that you are bringing out? Right. That is more important. Right. The next step is once you have that thing that there is something uh, new or something that is going to be a thing. Just an affordable is only price. But we are talking of innovation. If you want to be affordable, though, it could be you can use less house. May you don't require transportation container. Your steel can be different. It doesn't have to be. So those are the things, right? So I, I'm not sure if I've answered your question, but I thought you said how containers for homes or whatever it is. Actually, the idea when Kokan me Malin ka jo landscaping hua tha, tab aaya tha ki jab yaha pe hamare yaha pe landscaping ya earthwork jaise hote. तो हमारे जो कंस्ट्रक्शंस है घरों की जो नेचुरली है तो वहाँ में वो तबाह हो जाते हैं तो जबकि ऐसे को, कोई सिचुएशन जैसे कि अभी माधो धाम में भी ये सिचुएशन चल रही है कि लैंडस्केपिंग की आ, हो सकता है वहाँ पे और अलर्ट भी किया गया है और क्रैक्स भी गए हैं तो इसी सिचुएशन में अगर ऐसे कोई होम्स हम अवेलेबल कर देते हैं उनके लिए या कोई ऐसी स्ट्रेटेजी बनाते हैं तो फिर जो भी जो तब नुकसान होगा वो कम होगा कंपेरेटिव वो वो तो ठीक है आप जो बोल रहे हैं एकदम ठीक है मैं मैं यही बोल रहा था इसमें तो इनोवेशन तो नहीं है क्योंकि घर तो बने हुए हैं तुम्हें एक्स्ट्रा तुम बाथरूम लगा दोगे या वो बस वही है उसमें तो इनोवेशन नहीं है ना सो यूजिंग दैट यूजिंग दैट एज अ होम और यूजिंग दैट एज एन ऑफिस इज ऑलरेडी एग्जिस्ट राइट नाउ द क्वेश्चन इज यू सम व्हाई डोंट व्हाई डोंट व्हाई डज सम कंपनी मेक दीस थिंग दैट इज द बेसिक थिंग Actually, there are companies who are making it also, right? So, I, it is not an innovative idea or something like that. And as he, uh, Dr. Das just mentioned, they go go if there is any if there is a patent at all in India, local patent. That's the next thing, uh, Neeraj. That uh, because he said national patent, global patent, etc. So that's the question I was going to ask. I might have an idea, and I am interested only in this country. Then what happens? The same and question it, in my mind. You know that kind of a thing, right? So that's the question I was going to ask him. You know, because somebody might have done it somewhere, but in my country nobody has done it. Why can't I do it first time? So that's the that's the next question I was going to ask him. But probably what I said makes sense, right? Yes, sir. Uh, that's all I want. Yes, thank you, sir. Thank you. Uh, Neeraj, over to you, please. Yeah. Well, I think uh, answer is very well <laughs> covered. I'll just try to add something. Uh, one thing is when since we are talking about innovation, so we have to think from that perspective without fearing, first of all, whether what is there in China and what wherever, whatever is there. The only thing is, first of all, we need to know what we would like to do. And then comes the aspect of whether what I'm planning to do is new. Uh, is it really first time I'm doing? If it is not first time, uh, then it might be a good idea that I, uh, you know, learn it from whatever is being done in the past. So either do some research. Um, patenting could be one definitely aspect which will tell you the technological advancement, whatever has happened so far. Uh, you mentioned about China thing. So China require their requirements, their scales, their entire ecosystem, their focus is all different. When we are addressing our problems or the problem which you uh, are interested to address through your innovative idea, which you would like to build up as a business. So, uh, 
review it from the point of view that whether I have sufficient information on that, whether it is new, you can certainly take the advantage of patent database because patent database gives you information from across the world. This is the best state of art document which, which can tell you what is the state of art at, at a particular time. So, unfortunately, in our education system also, and even in general practice, we don't pay much attention to the uh, patent literature. As a result, we do not create much innovative products. Uh, when when it comes to the uh, to the startup, also I see mostly it's a trading kind of uh, uh, system where people are using. It's not completely uh, the trading, but trading is taking the major chunk where you are getting things from here and there, and then. Uh, assembling them and providing the services. Look at uh, what happened two years or three years uh, ago, and it's still impacting when uh, chips or semiconductor issue was faced. And what we found out that other than Taiwan, which is, and listen to this number, one company in Taiwan, which is making 60% 60% of the semiconductors that world requires one company. And then there are a few companies in Japan, uh, uh, I think uh, Vietnam and all. But that semiconductor is uh, largely being produced by Taiwan. And situations like pandemic, we did not have any solution. We don't have any uh, manufacturer. So look at those aspects, look at the gaps and look at your skills and then if you can fill those gaps uh, i don't think there's any any hurdle um, on the on the question what verma sir uh, raised about uh, i think it was uh, if it is not patented here can i go ahead so yes so if it is not patented in a particular country and you want to uh, start uh, that business you can go ahead the only uh, aspect that you need to be aware of that one that product is being ma manufactured if it is landing into that country where it is patented then it may uh, be a risky affair where it would be con con uh, considered as infringement in that particular uh, geography i hope i answered like uh, that's that's exactly because uh, uh, we have ideas that something has happened there but i'm not I know that the product will be there, but I can have a different idea on how to get it done. So I have a process patent. So I can go yeah. for a process patent, even if I'm aware that something has happened. Obviously, he's followed some process to get to that thing. But I'm now thinking of on, on my own, and I have a process to come to a product. So I can patent that in this country, because uh, I really don't know whether his process is same as mine. I won't know. But when I come to you for patent, you'll probably check and say, hey, this is patented in this country. You still want to go ahead with this or not? Yeah. Am I right? Absolutely, sir. In any case, if I get to know that it is very close to something, I'll do, I can tweak my. You can work around. Yeah, I can uh, work, well, you work can around. Improvise. And yeah. that's how uh, the innovation process works. Works. Uh, no, basically, uh, it's for youngsters because most of the time, as you rightly said, Patenting is something that is very patent line. This is the first no. thing I have seen. No, you are the first person who is saying it is not. Because I know of some of the young guys who have ideas, who who are also done some, uh, what is that called? Their own. POC. Um, yeah, yeah, POCs. They, they've done the product uh, concepts. Uh, they've also tried it out. You, you understand? But then uh, I. Either they have not read the whole thing properly, but their reaction, because I will always say, this is a damn good idea. I haven't heard this before. <laughs> For heaven's sake, go and patent it before you start. So therefore, an idea can be also patented? Pure concept uh, with some, concept. some technical knowledge, then uh, it can be patented, and then you can further uh, actually prove it, prove it. Uh -huh. which, which would definitely help you. 
Okay. But if you, but the easier would be make uh, have an idea, make a concept, and then go for patenting. You at least you know what you're getting into. Correct. Absolutely. Thank you. Actually, these questions are meant for those people because this is in my mind. I'm not going to use it, but uh, I hope uh, it covers some of the things in your mind. Sure. Thank you. Thank you, Neeraj. Thank you. Vijay, Thank you want to say? So, Neeraj, I have a question. Like, how do you quite familiar with doing a research cap analysis and doing a research literature survey and other things? A patent survey, an easy way to explain to all the audience. Patent survey, is that patent has already done? Is it available online? How do I search it? And is it available or not? It is available online. Uh, you can uh, go to the World, World Intellectual Property Organization's website. Which you know, I think uh, if I can interrupt you, you can actually cover this in your lecture post lunch. Sure, I can. Uh, but uh, quick you answer is answer uh, because uh, uh, Vijay may not uh, be able to wait till then. You can just yeah. explain that to him. Yeah. All right. So, uh, quick answer is that yes, uh, it is available. So there are uh, different offices websites, uh, whether it's USPTO, US Patent Office, Indian Patent Office, Singapore, etc. Uh, some of the patent office uh, provides the information of. All the global patent applications, if are filed and are published, so you can see that. World IPO is a, a sort of centralized organization which will uh, publish all the international applications, or we call them PCT applications. So, uh, in short, answer is yes, it is available. It is freely available also. Uh, there are some paid databases which which are used for some analysis, etc. But for starting an idea or things like that, you can actually search on your own. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Neeraj. Uh, thank you, <coughs> Admin Verma, sir, Komodo Talvelkar, sir, Vijay. Thank you so much. Uh, we'll take a break, uh, tea break, and then we'll come back for a session by uh, Dr. Vijay Kumar. Thank you so much. Tremendous opportunities that are come going to come, but to have a coherent and a comprehensive way forward, all the three aspects are important, and that's how we are uh, looking at all these things. India is home to over six percent of global marine diversity. Over a seven thousand five hundred and seventeen kilometer coastline. Indian oceans have been protecting us for millennia. Now, it's time for us to protect our oceans. Let's start conversations, strive for innovations, and vote for protection of Indian Ocean region. Introducing Marine Time Research Center, Foundation for Underwater Domain Awareness. The concept of the Maritime Research Center, I thought of as a technology-driven think tank because I feel there is a gap in terms of strategy not being backed by sound technology. And particularly when we talk about the Indian Ocean region, there is uh, significant <coughs> differences in our understanding of the underwater domain. And uh, the tropical littoral waters have their very specific challenges which need to be addressed. And that's how I thought of this organization where we are going to be talking, uh, work, working on the policy, technology and innovation, and the human resource development. Because going forward, when we look at the underwater domain awareness framework, it's going to be a huge opening, and there's tremendous opportunities that are come, going to come. But to have a coherent and a comprehensive way forward, all the three aspects are important, and that's how we are uh, looking at all these things. MRC is driven with a three-pronged mission to engage with decision makers and policy formulators, to facilitate technology and innovation, to spread awareness and start conversations on underwater domain awareness.
The underwater domain awareness framework is a concept that touches all the four stakeholders. When you look at the underwater domain, there are security requirements, whether it is internal security or external security. Then there is the blue economic requirement. There's tremendous opportunities uh, in terms of shipping, undersea resources, a whole lot of other things. The third is the environment and the disaster management. That also requires tremendous technologies and also proper policies where they can be addressed effectively. And the fourth is pure science and technology. We all know science and technology will be the driver for all things to come. But specifically having science and technology tailored for the requirement is very, very important. And that's how MRC tries to address the UDA framework in a very, very comprehensive manner. MRC wants to be a nodal agency dealing with the UDA framework. We want to look at all aspects of policy. We want to look at all aspects of technology and innovation. And we also want to be a nodal agency for the human resource, multidisciplinary human resource development. Here, when we look at human resource, we are like looking at two distinct communities, if I may use the word. One is people who are already in the domain, people who are part of the stakeholders. They have a reasonably good understanding of the domain, but they need to be given the right academic backing and the theoretical understanding or the research background so that they can contribute. So maybe, you know, stakeholders can go into the policy level with a uh, sound understanding of the domain. Also, we need younger people to come in. I mean, we have, uh, say, a computer science uh, student, how he can apply his computer science understanding into the underwater domain awareness, or an electronic student, how he can apply his understanding in the underwater domain awareness, or even a law student, uh, or a history student, how they can bring value, or a mass communication student, how they can bring value. So we are looking at a multidisciplinary approach and also distinctly kind of uh, make it clear that what they can contribute and what, how they can build a future career in this domain. The 21st century has seen a decisive shift in the global order. The Indian government has demonstrated significant maritime intent with the Sagar vision of the Honorable Prime Minister. This maritime focus has resulted in multiple mega projects by the government of India. Like the Sagar Mala, Bharat Wheel, Inland Water Transport, Multimodal Transport, the Deep Sea Mining Mission, International Seabed Authority allocation. With this strong maritime intent, India is well positioned geographically and geostrategically to play a leadership role in the region. The tropical littoral waters present unimaginable living and non-living undersea resources. The economic opportunities in the Indo-Pacific of the global commons as a facilitator for economic growth are waiting to be explored. It also comes with its fair share of challenges. The Indian Ocean region today is at the risk of facing political challenges like volatility, fragmentation, instability, lack of synergy among nations in the region, over-dependence on extra-regional powers, economic challenges like inequalities, growth challenges, lack of big investment, and technological challenges. There is one promising solution. The Underwater Domain Awareness Framework proposed by Maritime Research Centre provides a solution to these challenges and opportunities. Let's understand the UDA framework in its horizontal and vertical construct. Four stakeholders of UDA are maritime security, blue economy, environment and disaster management, and science and technology. The horizontal construct looks at resource availability in terms of technology, infrastructure, capability, and capacity. The vertical construct gives a hierarchy for establishing underwater domain events. Ground level looks at sensing underwater domain for threats, resources, and activities. The second level makes sense of the data gathered for security strategies, conservation, and resource utilization plans. The third level formulates and monitors regulatory framework 
at the local, national, and global level. In this way, the underwater domain awareness framework provides a comprehensive way forward for stakeholders to interact and solve multiple challenges being faced by the nation. Today. The group of 20 represents world's major economies, 80% of the world GDP, 75% of global trade, and 60% of the world's population. This year, under the Indonesian presidency, the G20 is focusing on the theme, recover together, recover stronger. The Indonesian presidency has set three pillars for its term, global health architecture, sustainable energy transition, and digital transformation. The UDA framework proposed by Maritime Research Center talks about pooling of resources and synergizing of effort across multiple stakeholders, such as maritime security, blue economy, disaster management, and science and technology. The three agenda points of the G20 summit meeting are explicitly addressed by the UDA framework as follows. Post the pandemic, the global health architecture has become a prime concern. Fresh water is the most critical component of human survival. UDA will play a key role in real-time monitoring and effective desiltation of the freshwater systems, as well as acoustic capacity building for water resource management. The underwater domain is a storehouse of energy with both conventional and unconventional alternate energy sources. The UDA framework will be a significant driver for effective and efficient extraction of these resources for a sustainable energy transition. The UDA framework will play a key role in the digital ocean vision, through its science and technology lead, artificial intelligence, and underwater robotics-based data analytics. UDA aims at achieving effective governance in the Indo-Pacific strategic space through a digital transformation. India will assume the presidency of the G20 for one year, from 1st December 2022, to 30th November 2022. India's presidency at G20 summit would consider introducing the UDA Green Park for a comprehensive policy and technology intervention with acoustic capacity. The entire Indo-Pacific strategic space can be included for the implementation of the UDA framework, which will allow all the member states to participate enthusiastically and place India in a very good position to play a leadership role at the G20. The 21st century is witnessing unprecedented strategic interactions in the Indian Ocean region, IOR. The global power play is unfolding in the tropical littoral waters of the IOR. The region is also experiencing dramatic consequences of climate change, including sea level rise and warming ocean temperatures. This plethora of challenges and the regionalism has ensured that the IOR remains underdeveloped. The Indian Ocean Rim Association, IORA, was formally launched at the first ministerial meeting in Mauritius on 6-7 March 1997. It is a dynamic intergovernmental organization aimed at strengthening regional cooperation and sustainable development within the Indian Ocean region through its 23 member states and 10 dialogue partners. The IORA nations need to be extremely creative to appreciate the potential in the region and formulate their strategy to harness the opportunities. The four major broad opportunities are living resources, transportation, petroleum and minerals, along with science and technology. The underwater domain awareness, UDA framework, proposed by the Maritime Research Center, MRC, Pune, progresses the digital oceans construct to ensure good governance across the entire IOR. The transparency as a result of effective realization of the digital oceans will serve all the four stakeholders, namely maritime security, blue economy, environment and disaster management, and also the science and technology providers. The genesis of the UDA Digest was to provide a platform to present the multiple dimensions of the UDA framework 
the two year old platform has come a long way in generating the body of work to demonstrate the wide spectrum of stakeholders disciplines applications dynamics and more underwater domain awareness uda in simple terms is a desire to know what is happening underwater the indian ocean region iowar is of immense strategic importance countries in the indian ocean region vary in many areas including economic development demography ethnic and sectarian issues relations with neighboring countries and more these challenges are compounded further by the actions of the extra regional powers india as the lead player in the iur has a lot at stake the key is in capacity and capability building we need pooling of resources and synergizing of effort at national and regional level india must take a lead role in driving underwater domain awareness to realize this vision UD Digest has emerged as a platform that is willing to give space for quality content so that we can deliver in a simple yet humanist manner. Hi, I'm Nishtha and I am the editor of the UD Digest e-magazine. Ever since I took over as the editor of the magazine, I've only seen exponential increase in the readership of the magazine. Some of the domains under which we expect our experts to write for us are blue economy, underwater archaeology, geopolitics and IR, science and technology, maritime security, marine environment, and so on and so forth. Become a part of our UTA Digest community to dive into an underwater adventure coming to your inbox every month. India is home to over 6% of global marine diversity. Over a 7,517 kilometer coastline, Indian oceans have been protecting us for millennia. Now, it's time for us to protect our oceans. Let's start conversations, strive for innovations, and vote for protection of Indian Ocean region. Introducing Marine Time Research Center, Foundation for Underwater Domain Awareness. The concept of the Maritime Research Center, I thought of as a technology-driven think tank because I feel there is a gap in terms of strategy not being backed by sound technology. And particularly when we talk about the Indian Ocean region, there is uh, significant <coughs> differences in our understanding of the underwater domain. And uh, the tropical littoral waters have their very specific challenges which need to be addressed. And that's how I thought of this organization where we are going to be talking, uh, work, working on the policy, technology and innovation, and the human resource development. Because going forward, when we look at the underwater domain awareness framework, it's going to be a huge opening and there's tremendous opportunities that are come, going to come. But to have a coherent, and a comprehensive way forward. All the three aspects are important and that's how we are uh, looking at all these things. MRC is driven with a three-pronged mission to engage with decision makers and policy formulators, to facilitate technology and innovation, to spread awareness and start conversations on underwater domain awareness. The underwater domain awareness framework is a concept that touches all the four stakeholders. When you look at the underwater domain, there are security requirements, whether it is internal security or external security. Then there is a blue economic requirement. There's tremendous opportunities uh, in terms of shipping, undersea resources, a whole lot of other things. The third is the environment and the disaster management. That also requires tremendous technologies and also proper policies where they can be addressed effectively. And the fourth is pure science and technology. We all know science and technology will be the driver for all things to come. But specifically having science and technology tailored for the requirement is very, very important. And that's how MRC tries to address the UDA framework in a very, very comprehensive manner. MRC wants to be a nodal agency dealing with the UDA framework. 
we want to look at all aspects of policy. We want to look at all aspects of technology and innovation. And we also want to be a nodal agency for the human resource, multidisciplinary human resource development. Here, when we look at human resource, we are like looking at two distinct communities, if I may use the word. One is people who are already in the domain, people who are part of the stakeholders. They have a reasonably good understanding of the domain, but they need to be given the right academic backing and the theoretical understanding to, or the research background so that they can contribute. So maybe, you know, stakeholders can go into the policy level with a uh, sound understanding of the uh, domain. Also, we need younger people to come in. I mean, we have, uh, say, a computer science uh, student, how he can apply his computer science understanding into the underwater domain awareness, or an electronic student, how he can apply his understanding in the underwater domain awareness, or even a law student, uh, or a history student, how they can bring value, or a mass communication student, how they can bring value. So we are looking at a multidisciplinary approach and also distinctly kind of uh, make it clear that what they can contribute and what, how they can build a future career in this domain. The 21st century has seen a decisive shift in the global order. The Indian government has demonstrated significant maritime intent with the Sagar vision of the Honorable Prime Minister. This maritime focus has resulted in multiple mega projects by the government of India. Like the Sagar Mala, Bharat Wheel, Inland Water Transport, Multimodal Transport, the Deep Sea Mining Mission, International Seaway Authority allocation. With this strong maritime intent, India is well positioned geographically and geostrategically to play a leadership role in the region. The tropical littoral waters present unimaginable living and non-living undersea resources. The economic opportunities in the Indo-Pacific of the global commons as a facilitator for economic growth are waiting to be explored. It also comes with its fair share of challenges. The Indian Ocean region today is at the risk of facing Political challenges like volatility, fragmentation, instability, lack of synergy among nations in the region, over-dependence on extra-regional powers, economic challenges like inequalities, growth challenges, lack of big investment, and technological challenges. There is one promising solution. The Underwater Domain Awareness Framework proposed by Maritime Research Center provides a solution to these challenges and opportunities. Let's understand the UDA framework in its horizontal and vertical construct. Four stakeholders of UDA are maritime security, blue economy, environment and disaster management, and science and technology. The horizontal construct looks at resource availability in terms of technology, infrastructure, capability, and capacity. The vertical construct gives a hierarchy for establishing underwater domain awareness. Ground level looks at sensing underwater domain for threats, resources, and activities. The second level makes sense of the data gathered for security strategies, conservation, and resource utilization plans. The third level formulates and monitors regulatory framework at the local, national, and global level. In this way, the underwater domain awareness framework provides a comprehensive way forward for stakeholders to interact and solve multiple challenges being faced by the nation. The group of 20 represents world's major economies, 80% of the world GDP, 75% of global trade, and 60% of the world's population. This year, under the Indonesian presidency, the G20 is focusing on the theme, Recover Together, Recover Stronger. The Indonesian presidency has set three pillars for its term. Global health architecture, sustainable energy transition, and digital transformation. The UDA framework proposed by Maritime Research Center talks about pooling of resources and synergizing of effort across multiple stakeholders 
such as maritime security, blue economy, disaster management, and science and technology. The three agenda points of the G20 summit meeting are explicitly addressed by the UDA framework as follows. Post the pandemic, the global health architecture has become a prime concern. Fresh water is the most critical component of human survival. UDA will play a key role in real-time monitoring and effective desilitation of the freshwater systems, as well as acoustic capacity building for water resource management. The underwater domain is a storehouse of energy with both conventional and unconventional alternate energy sources. The UDA framework will be a significant driver for effective and efficient extraction of these resources for a sustainable energy transition. The UDA framework will play a key role in the digital ocean vision with science and technology leading, artificial intelligence and underwater robotics based data analytics. UDA aims at achieving effective governance in the Indo-Pacific strategic space through a digital transformation. India will assume the presidency of the G20 for one year, from 1st December 2022 to 30th November 2022. India's presidency at G20 summit could consider introducing the UDA framework for a comprehensive policy and technology intervention with acoustic capacity. The entire Indo-Pacific strategic space can be included for the implementation of the UDA framework, which will allow all the member states to participate enthusiastically and place India in a very good position to play a leadership role at the G20. The 21st century is witnessing unprecedented strategic
uh, welcome back. We'll continue with our second session for the day. As you know, we are trying to piece together various aspects of the underwater. Now, I would like to invite uh, Dr. R. Vijay Kumar, Associate Professor, Department of Ocean Engineering, IIT Chennai. Vijay, you've heard him in the morning. Somebody who has almost 25 years of academic experience and almost 22 years of experience in the Navy. While introducing Vijay, did not mention his achievements in the Navy. I know him very closely and in the Navy also, he has some remarkable contributions to indigenization. He was in the di design directorate also. He has been in the dockyard as a manager and for technical officers in the Navy, being a production manager in the dockyard is one of the toughest jobs one does. And knowing Vijay, he has done a great job there. Some very critical projects. He was even involved in indigenization in the dockyard also. So I'll not take any more time and I'll hand over to Vijay. Vijay. So, very good morning. Uh, thank you, Arnab. Uh, I have uh, split my presentation into three heads. The first one is to introduce to certain hydrodynamic aspects of facility what we have at Ocean Engineering Department, IIT Madras. I'll take few minutes there. Uh, then the second set of presentation, I made it into what is my research interest. And the third one is, of, of course, on the robotics. Even there also, I have split it into three, in which introduction, part of it is just to give a glimpse of it, and what is the work I am doing on the hull form development and other things. And the last one is what all the uh, certain uh, changes and other things, what could be bring about in the underwater domain or robotics domain that is going to change in the future. So the first one is, can you please put it up? Uh, you can share it. Can I have the slide changer? That pen drive is what Wi-Fi, yeah. Yeah. It is to change. So first, uh, few five to ten minutes on the hydrodynamic testing uh, facilities which are there in the ocean engineering department. Uh, ocean engineering department is a part of uh, IIT Madras. One of the department thirteen. One of the de uh, thirteen department where. Uh, initially, the department has come out as a center, then it's become a department. There has been a lot of German funding and German collaboration at the initial stage, and certain facilities which have been set up then, 50 years ago, still running fine, and it is working. And we, if you look at it in the research uh, group, we are a group of five verticals. One is naval architecture, five faculties of the naval architectures are there then offshore structures, ocean science, petroleum engineering, coastal and near shores, uh, structures and the process. The petroleum engineering joined very late and uh, it's three to four faculty there, naval architecture, five faculty, and other sites, 13 faculty, a, gap, a group of 23 faculties working together to this. We offer BTEC in naval architecture and uh, ocean engineering and a dual degree, the BTEC converting into dual degree, uh, 15 of them. Then we offer three of the MTech programs. In that MTech programs, now we are club all the three into ocean structures. Initially, it is ocean engineering, intake of 12 to 13. 
where a lot of naval officers come and do. I also did my MTech program in way back in 2002, 2004 in that program. Then Ocean Technology, a user-oriented program for NIOT. NIOT has got certain specific syllabus and we conduct the course. Then this one has stopped. LNT1 has already stopped. We are converted into ocean structures. Then we have got MTech and Petroleum 12 to 15 is the intake. Then we have a huge number of MS as well as PhD program in that MS every year 15 and uh, PhD almost 10 to 15 every year in the month of June, July and December we have an intake. A total of uh, 550 is the student strength what we have in, uh, in our department. Uh, in India, of course, not many institutes are there. We rank number one in terms of publications and based on the publications. And uh, main hydrodynamics laboratory we have. This is one of the unique features. If you if you generally visit to IIT Madras, please come to our department. It will be my pleasure to take you over there to show the facilities. I got certain videos and the slide to show it. We have a wave basin. We have a tank, towing tank, four meter deep water waves. Two, two meter shallow water flume, then two meter wave and current flume, shallow water basins and the glass flumes. And uh, we have a discovery campus now, uh, 36 kilometer away from that, where we have a very huge facility of coming is a uh, sea capping basin. It's coming uh, a shallow water sea capping basins where a bigger model can be done. It's completely indigenous and a huge facility is coming up there. Further, we have a uh, idea of having a tank facility of 500 meters long and having a uh, towing carriage facilities. Okay. Uh, let's speak about it. If you look at it, uh, the six to seven test facility under one roof in one institute, I don't think so anywhere else it exists. Uh, I can proudly say that because they may have a bigger than us, bigger facility, but it will be one or two. But we have these seven facility at one places. Other than that, we have instrumentation lab, model making facilities. I'll show you some of the photograph. Petroleum, okay, petroleum engineering, offshore structural dynamics lab, then certain other small, small labs we have. Uh, this is one of the facility where we have a wave maker. The wave maker is a paddle. That paddle uh, uh, runs to generate the... ...keeping and uh, maneuvering analysis. The sea keeping analysis that a yeah, model is there model ship and a model uh, equivalently modeled oceans created into the laboratory and how the ship is going to behave, how much is going to pitch, how much I mean I'm going to fix the equipment, how it is going to behave. And maneuvering is that when I want to do the path, how it is going to go, how the rudder is going to be effective and uh, how is the zigzag or uh, spiral path maneuver if it takes such kind of experiment we can do. Okay, that uh, the wave boy, this video should be running. That wave boy is the one which is that tsunami boy has been, the hull form has been designed. It's way back in 2002, 2004. Another one is another ship, a container ships, the stability analysis in the waves. The static stability analysis in the waves, how does it going to behave? That was being analyzed during that time. Uh, this is another one where they were manufacturing certain amount of pontoons or uh, non-propelled cargo and then stack it over one another and transport from a coast in China to a Norway, how it is going to, whether it will have a stability or not, or whether, how many, how is the vagaries of the seas, how it is going to behave. That analysis was done in one of the wave flume. It can generate all directional waves that all the uh, flaps, 50 flaps can independently act and then create a direction of the waves. Mm -hmm. This was installed uh, in with the help of Germans and still functional. Now, in the Tayur camera is completely indigenized. And none of the parts, uh, some of the parts like motors and other thing, we have it and much more huge, much bigger and larger ways which we can generate has been done over there. Next is the towing tank where I am the in charge where I was telling we do the resistance predictions, design the propeller and then how the propeller on water characteristics, then fit it behind the ship, how it is going to perform behind the vessels and all those te tests will be carried out there. This is around uh, 90 meters in length. Uh, 2.8 meters in width and 3 meters depth and it can go up to a speed of 5 meter per second. Now it is refurbished and this one what we are showing is a planing hull and another one what I was showing is the the wake behind the hull. The problem I just uh, stating it the wake behind the hull how an obstruction can create and then that can induce a vibration onto the hull part of it. Hull propeller interactions can be studied. There's certain model making and certain tests which are done. So there you can see that paint flow test, even any appendage need to be fitted behind the hull. How do you do it? That kind of test. 
this facility which is there this is a open water facility with a propeller with a cot nozzle how it is going to perform and the effectiveness both accelerating and decelerating cot nozzles whether it will going to give extra thrust that can be there another one is the pump jet propulsion device which is uh, being tested over here uh, uh, this is the uh, this is the propeller which is having uh, wave uh, water uh, it is coming out of it and a catamaran being tested and all those test facilities we have then certain another flume where we generate the wave and then test the offset structures the forces coming on the structures this is the one where we will able to test that so we have got a deep uh, four meter depth in the uh, to represent the deep depthness, depthness within the basin of three meters uh, one a deep well is there there we can place it and then moor it and or if it is a floating object floating and then able to find out the motions and the forces coming out in that this is a two meter flume uh, it's a shallow water flume uh, able to generate the shallow water near the coast the coastal structures which are going to be uh, designed and built and what all the forces going to come how to lay the breakwaters and study on the breakwaters and displacement of those things can be studied using this uh, two meter or shallow water flume then we have a, a parallel two, two meter wave and the current flow the, it also generates a wave also generate the movement of the water current also is there there also we used to study the uh, breaking of the waves on the structures then on how the coastal structures were able to withstand such kind of forces model study on that is being there then we have a, a non-intuitive measurement device like a glass flume that you don't interfere the instrument also will not interfere you be your instrumentation is generally piv have a particle image velocimetry and then measure the waves and wave velocity current velocity and can be measured using the uh, glass wave flume in this this is the one on a shallow water basins all other basins are depth is three meters and this shallow water is 60 centimeter depth all the coastal structures where a distorted model can be generated and then studied this is one of the structures which are being studied for one of the beaches in the uh, one of the coastal structures in the us the, that is being generated over there and uh, the currents and the waves are generated on the sites able to study this kind of shallow water basin then came these are certain models we have in-house model manufacturing to the these models has to be made as per the uh, ittc recommendations and these models are being manufactured as per that and then do the test in the towing time we have the we have the model fabrication facility certain instrumentations we have been involved with the uh, nations in the nation building activity from age memorial when virat was having the ski jump it, it was not having a ski jump and we had to design the ski jump and having it then fdn then gsl we launch off late you would have seen in the news also one of the helicopter accidentally landed on a water then the four floats came out those four floats are able to make it to float they towed it, towed it for almost four hours and then able to bring it to it this was the floats was designed meaning of course hl for hl the floats all the analysis and design was done in our place now i am doing it for the luh uh, recently then certain coastal protection measures groins of the coast of chennai on almost if you take from this Calcutta to this side, uh, Gujarat, anywhere on the coastal structure, there will be an imprint of our department, ocean engineering department, in certain design analysis or even in constructions. Somewhere or the other, some faculty will be involved in that. Okay, so <clears throat> these are that. The another one is on the biomimicking uh, in the robotic side, where you are familiar. This biomimicking propulsion device is being researched by Professor Krishna Koti, just retired. He is uh, spearheading the one of the projects for NRB, where they want to make uh, one uh, biomimicking a robot. They are in the stages of making that. Uh, I will talk to you in the last slide of my presentation about that. Certain uh, things which have been designed, uh, uh, experimented, and even the small prototype are being made. Other protection strategies on the coastal areas, uh, these are the works breaking of waters a pointed breaking of waves on the structures the forces required and the measurements being simulated and studied certain coastal production wave energy so these are the hydrodynamic activities which we 
get involved in the faculty of 23 faculty at the one not only that there are many other structural and other things are there since i am more interested in the hydrodynamics i prepared a presentation to showcase certain activities which hydrodynamic activities which uh, we undertake c2 now coming to the uh, research activities which i do i work on the 10 verticals or in fact four verticals and 10 different topics i have uh, uh, six seven phd students are completed under me and uh, 14 are doing uh, currently and uh, doing under the research activities <coughs> yeah that is the one so somebody who is interested in joining my team can join certain so i put four verticals <coughs> Uh, okay, so once on the uh, ship uh, aerodynamics part of it, in that I work on the three verticals within that ship aerodynamics, then comes to the green ship initiatives, where how to reduce the drag of the vessel, I work on it. Third one is the uh, gliders, underwater gliders, two PhD students are working, and some on the uh, propeller, sir, actually morning he was uh, mentioning there are no design, designers are available, but only manufacturers are not available, sir. That is the only thing. Designers of the propellers are available. I work on reducing the noise of the propeller on a non-cavitating regime, uh, not even going to the cavitating regime. At certain speed, at certain pressures, the uh, propeller cavitate, and then the cavities implode and make noise. I'm even working on the propeller to uh, non-cavitating, even below that. How do you reduce the noise of the propeller? Is the one of the research area which I am working on. So. Uh, First uh, vertical is my research work, uh, which initiated, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, this is the, uh, when we have built the uh, project 15 and then went for the first sailing, there was a problem that the smoke from the exhaust have started coming into the intake and uh, the ship had an issue. So it was being analyzed by Professor, uh, uh, this one, uh, my two guides. Uh, Professor S. N. Singh and Professor Seshadri. Then from there, that idea of how to mitigate this problem for old when you want to do the superstructure analysis. So this was the my PhD topic. We have come out with many ideas. Now we are able to give to the designer at the earliest stages of design, where, what should be your mast height, what should be your funnel height, where it is supposed to be placed, how far it is supposed to be placed, you can pick up into that level. So two PhDs have been done. One was prior to me is Commodore Kulkarni, PR Kulkarni has done it. And then I followed it upon and then did the second part of it to give a conclusions. So after that, many uh, research activities, even the private shipyards, which are doing the defense one, they, uh, we have done the certain analysis and given. Now two, two of the ships which have been awarded, they are coming to me. We are going to do both experiment as well as the CFD studies to avoid, uh, to have the smoke, to avoid the smoke nuisance problem on the uh, warships. Now coming to the second part of the aerodynamic, where the helicopter landing on the vessel is the most, in, in the naval vessel, is the most unsecured place, I would like to say, or most difficult uh, place because there is a bluff body. In aerodynamic pass, a bluff body is there in front of it. And then I want to land a helicopter there. While, while landing the helicopter, the aerodynamics part of the whole of the ship is completely changed. In that yeah, object, helicopter is going to land. Now, many accidents, possibilities are there. But that is a place where you have to have the best of these thrust and the thrust control. And that is the time where the sudden change in the airflow pattern occurs. So how do you avoid it? So we have come with certain innovative ideas, even uh, implementable, non-implementable in innovative ideas, worked on it. And uh, we are able to uh, do it the same also. Every ship which is going to be constructed, they, they do this analysis, CFD analysis and the experimental studies to avoid mit, uh, or avoid uh, to reduce that problems on where, when the helicopter is going to land. Three PhD students have completed work on it. We have done a uh, Naval Research Board project on that. Certain data are available, still being referred to me, uh, but me or our team particularly for this analysis. Uh, the third one is also related to the Navy, where aircraft is going to land on an aircraft carrier when we have an issues. Uh, this also just we have completed this project and we are going to have decimate this information what we have done on the 24th. We are going to have NRB panel meeting there. We are going to decimate. It will be available for many people to attend. 
uh, and here also two ms students have worked and one uh, phd student have worked it's a typical burble effect they call it as a burble just before the uh, uh, aircraft is going to land the variation in the vertical velocity it's given in the bottom variation in the vertical velocity variation in the vertical velocity and the horizontal velocity just sudden change how is the going to have an effect on the pilot which when he is going to land on it these three are directly relevant to navy they are now coming to the um, uh, green ship initiatives the first one on the air in uh, air induced bubble induced drag reductions when i inject the bubble in the front of the vessel how is the drag frictional drag of the vessel is going to be reduced uh, so it's a promising field and our ship has been now installed with the bubble induced drag reduction in the uh, by japan and they have in the in one of the japanese vessel there they claim 10 percent or 6 to 10 percent of the reduction in the overall energy efficiency of the vessels so we have taken a container vessel uh, no sorry we have taken a um, uh, flat bottom vessel and uh, it's more like a, a cement carrier or a flat bottom vessel and able to inject the air and then find out how much is the drag reductions we have six to seven publications on this. One PhD has been completed. And in order to carry forward, how is this effect on the shallow water? Because we are all talking about the Sagarmala projects and all the vessels are going to go where the underkill clearances are very low. And how can I reduce the drag even furthermore? So we are taking up that on a shallow water effect. And what happens to the maneuvering effect of these vessels when this vessel is proceeding ahead? So the maneuvering part is uh, done by another student and uh, uh, shallow water is being done. The, particularly the maneuvering is a keen interest with the Germans also. There is a student who has gone on a dad scheme to do a collaborative work on this uh, shallow water uh, maneuvering of the uh, using bubble induced drag reduction. One of the experiments which is being conducted in our towing tank where we are able to visualize how the bubbles forms, how the bubble uh, coilase and how the bubble splits and how much is the total area it is going to occupy and how is the frictional drag reduction of the vessel is happening. Next, another one is of uh, quite interest to any high fruit number vessels, vessels which are going at little higher speed like uh, naval vessels. There are simple objects like introduction of a flap at the stern of the propeller may uh, will reduce the drag of the vessel to 6 to 10 percent of weight. So we have taken it up and uh, this also is as a part of green ship initiative we have taken. Uh, IMO has mandated that at uh, 2025 and 2030, every vessel has to incorporate certain measures, commercial vessels to incorporate certain measures to reduce the greenhouse uh, effect, uh, the, the, uh, the NOx and the SOx productions of the vessel has to be reduced. So this is quite popular and few of the firms are approaching us. Coming to the propeller, Study of the propeller um, acoustics is one of the quite uh, important one where the propeller geometry of the skew, uh, rake and certain tip, introduction of the tip to the propeller blades and the propeller hub, how does it affect the uh, noise propagation even below the non-cavitating regime, in the non-cavitating regime, not even the cavitating regimes. Hmm? We have found that skew has got a certain effect and doing over skew also will not able to produce the thrust. We have taken the already proven uh, propeller DTMB 411, uh, 4119, 4119 propeller and it's certain experiment in our towing tank and also numerically we can predict the noise uh, even before. That also used both CFD as well as the uh, noise prediction methodologies to predict the noise levels at the lower frequency. Higher frequency, we can get it with the uh, experimental methods, but lower frequency, we can only, as of now, we can predict by the numerical methods. This is another propeller where we are um, uh, testing the um, composite propellers. Even the composite propellers are quite uh, uh, in the literature for many times, but use is not much. So how is that the weight reduction of the composites? It could be as strong as the, or even we can, I can row it in a way, it can be where it is, can be even equivalent or comparable st strength of the normal metal propeller. So here also we have taken designed a propeller for vessels. We manufacture a small two comp uh, composites. And uh, next idea is to stitch the strength to my requirement so that the profile, the aerofoil profile will change with certain thrust to produce the efficiency level better. Okay. So this uh, is under uh, testing now. The boy who has done it has been 
called to the Cyprus and he has been awarded the one of the medals and they have offered him a job. So it's quite promising and uh, we have already have uh, 20 centimeter, uh, no, 30 uh, centimeter propeller manufacturer doing the test. In order to measure the deflections uh, when it is rotating uh, with uh, inbuilt, uh, uh, this one, inbuilt sensors, it was a difficult item. So we have evolved a method, we have applied for a patent and uh, first uh, patent licensing has been awarded to us for this uh, propeller uh, deflection measurements. Now coming to the underwater one, I work on uh, gliders. Uh, we have been, me and Arnab also started long time back, 78 years back. I'm also showing to you, show you a photograph of then taken. The, I work on two type of gliders. One is a Meiring hull form gliders and uh, most on the hull and the um, maneuvering characteristic of the uh, gliders, not on the any other part. So this Meiring hull form and the um, uh, blended wing one, we are working on it. We will discuss about this miring and the blended wing into the uh, as we go into the robotics part of it. Then I also work on the maneuvering characteristics of the motions. Uh, where ahead there have been a lot of research has been done. But when the vessel moves back, do I going to move in the same direction in which I desire to go? It so happened that certain LSTs when move back, it was coming back to the shore. So in such kind of vessels, can I able to get a directional stability while moving back? While moving back, do I have the directional stability research on that? Of course, I told you about when I do any interruption in the hull in form of vane, in form of a flap, in form of inducing certain air, then how do we is going to affect my maneuvering characteristics? So that also we are doing. These are the 10 verticals I work on it. I have 14 students with me, PhD students with me who work on this work. Now coming to the underwater robotics, I also prepared a few of the slides. I will go with this. I will be slow and steady in this part of it. presentation mode. What is underwater robotics? You have to use the robots for explore, study and manipulate the underwater environment or underwater complete domain. So it, com it combines various fields, naval architecture, I missed it, that is important, naval architecture, because we have to understand the weight and buoyancy much properly and the stability at the floating conditions and as well as on the submerged condition and when it is going to transit. If you don't make that right, thinking thrusters will manage it, it is going to cost you in terms of energy. So naval architecture, mechanical engineering, electrical engineering, computer science, of course, some kind of communication to transmit the data, and what all the robots is going to do the work in such environment. So typically underwater robots are known as AUVs, autonomous underwater and remotely operated vehicles. It could be a glider also, and it has got sensors, cameras, and other requirements so that you are able to do the function of gathering the data and also underwater, study the underwater world. It has got many applications in the deep sea explorations, oceanographic research, underwater, archaeology, pipeline inspections, marine biology. These uh, should be able to operate in the most hostile environment, hostile in the sense in terms of the NACL, the aqueous medium, and uh, difficult to human to access, make them invaluable tools for scientific research and applications. Coming to the development of robotics, uh, innovations in the um, Many of the activities like bio-inspired designs that mimic the movement of the fish, improved battery technology, machines, machine learning algorithm to enable robots to learn their environment and then move about it. I have got a certain pictures of this underwater robots. The heading was uh, looking like it's also called underwater litters. So it will litter the world, whole world with so, so, so much small objects. We'll go in detail with one another. 
let us look into the applications and the motivations behind it. Uh, if I have in the x-axis the task which it performs, the underwater robots perform, and the power which is going to consume on the x-axis, I can split this into three components like gliders, AUVs, and ROVs. The more the task you require to do and the power consumptions are more, then the operability and the class in which you fall is also there. If I take gliders, it will be only hydrography survey. We'll spend much time on the glider. Otherwise, it could be without the help of the ship, mothership, I can launch it and then have it in the form of gliders, a long endurance vessels. Then AUVs, you require a mothership, but still it is not tethered. If you have tethered, then you have vagaries like this in this form that uh, two measurements which have been taken when the sea was rough, uh, one with tethered, one with non-tethered one, you can see the clearly the, uh, the image or the data accuracy of the sonar which has been able to scan. So AUVs, autonomous underwater vehicles is much more uh, reliable. It can give much more reliable data compared to a uh, remotely operated uh, this one vehicle which with a tether which the tether it is itself is going to have a issue i will again touch upon this in the few slides little later this is uh, one of the uh, yes sir i am not audible huh? okay 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 you should have told me in the starting <laughs> Okay, now it's better. Okay, this is one of the um, side scan sonar image of the sea surface in front of uh, one of the straits which have been taken. One of, these are the applications which are looking at. So which will be able to give you where the hydrothermal vent is there or where the uh, plankton growth is there. Those things can be obtained. Uh, under ice operations, under ice operations are more uh, difficult than with, uh, with uh, compared to the one which is not under the ice operations, where we, not only it has to scan at the bottom, it has to scan even on the top to know what is the profile on the top so that it's able to maneuver properly. So the requirement doubles up when it wants to do the under ice operations. Uh, then comes is the certain underwater robotics which has taken the scanning of the the images high resolution mapping of the underwater one can be there. It can be even used for the covert operations. The covert operations uh, could be for surveillance, mine detections, covert insertions, or even you can go and deploy your sensors in the locations in, in which you want to be there. One such area is AUV, which is doing for the current profiling and the data monitoring, and then you can use the ROV for that. Now coming to the ocean samplers, we have many samplers are there. There is a mood boys, which generally take these instruments. These mood boys are the one which is anchored to the sea floor and used to monitor the sea in terms of temperature, salinity, currents, and fix, uh, in a particular fixed lo uh, locations. Another, is, another one is Lagrangian dr uh, drifter. The drifter is we call it oil oil iron and Lagrangian format in the max you would have studied or physics you have studied where oil iron Lagrangians moves or drift along with the currents and then able to map the all the requirement of the currents and other things the movements of the circulation of the water over the mass over the flow and then it could be for a short term studies space bond sensors unmanned surface vehicles picking up a lot into the one where you want to have unmanned surface vehicles where autonomously it will be able to run. Then Argo floats, uh, underwater gliders, uh, and uh, you have cabled seafloor observations. Then human operated vehicles, it's also picking up human operated vehicles. India is making one of the human operated vehicles, unlike a submarine, deep sea uh, submarines. Then Hadal uh, landers, these are instruments designed to study the deepest part of the oceans uh, and known as the Hadal zones and able to deploy from the ship and then able to get the data from there. If you look at it, typically the depth ranging, operating depth ranging, it can operate in a shallow water, coastal waters to the deepest oceans. Uh, somewhere it can even go up to 11,000 meters. Uh, so one of the vessel designed is Neerus, uh, Neerus, which goes up to that uh, level. And typically endurance is around um, uh, 
5 hours uh, or AUVs and uh, little long endurance is 24 to 36 hours. It can, sometime it can operate up to 20 days. Uh, they claim Remus 6000 can operate up to 20 days. And uh, there is a lot of uh, market pull for this kind of AUVs, oceanographic, military, commercial domains. So there are many people are into it and uh, making it small and bigger as per the requirement. And uh, even, even we are also into it and we also want to have a AUVs for the specific purpose in which we are looking at it. I'll come to it a little later. Uh, so there is a rate of advancement in this sector is very, very fast. You have to be competitive, it should be there. Uh, then we would like to have an unattended deployment and uh, development, how I am going to do it. I deploy it once and then get the data for a long time and then able to process the data without an unattended one. Because it's a characteristic of AU and RU, otherwise going on a ship, it will be attended. It could be a long range system in the development is the one. If you look at the cost analysis of this one compared to ROV and the AUV on the heading like mobility, put it on the heading like mobility, transit, survey, turns, tracking of boats, reporting, uh, surely I will say that AUV has got a uh, uh, lesser cost compared to a uh, towed array survey where we have to have a mothership or a boat or a uh, support system to do it. But you have the data, you have, you have the unlimited power supply can be given to the towed, towed one, whereas the limited power supply is the only disadvantage which is come to the AUVs. There are certain another one which they come is uh, Dorando, Do, uh, Dorado, which is an autonomous underwater vehicle. It's a modular concept that can be customized for the various applications where you have different uh, different modules like uh, semi fuel cells a bot battery module or semi fuel cell tail section tail section will have only the propulsion head section can be changed middle sections can be changed so that you have model a set of uh, one we can as per the mission requirement you can have it this one is a modular auvs or dorando then you can look at the hull form also the, uh, the hull form is completely miring hull form with many modules then came is the autonomous benthic one deep sea explorations it operates from 4500 meters to 14 uh, uh, it goes and you see the hull form hull form is kept in three modules you can interchange the modules and uh, one does the function of propulsion another does the function of your uh, side scan sonar and even there you want to keep the sonars in much little away from the noise generating your th thrusters so you are able to place it there then you have certain other functions which does is the uh, uh, it's quite good in maneuvering because many thrusters can be positioned in the way in which i want i would like to have it it's a benthic explorer this is another one is a sentry it's uh, generally used for exploration and mapping. This is also developed by Woods Hole Ocean Oceanic Institute. It's an institute developed one. And uh, it has gone up to 6,000 meters uh, and able to make um, exploring at the deep sea. And uh, you have a, another one which is there in the photograph you can see. Able to go there and then assist, communicate, and then underwater communications able to have a command and control from another manned submersible. Seabird, here you can see the hull form, split it into two, and then it's used for a deep ocean benthic survey operations, highly maneuverable at the, the near the, near the uh, bottom, where it is maneuverability is required. High resolution imaging and bathymetry it can do, and it can go up to 2,000 meters rated. Some of the images explored by this. So another one near us, uh, it's a deep uh, diving remotely operated vessel designed to operate at a depth of around uh, 6,000 meters. And actually uh, this one in 2014 mission, it has gone up to 10,902 meters depth. And then after that, I think as per the record, it collapsed, it went up to the depth able to collect certain data and recorded uh, this near record for a human operated vehicle it has gone so it was lost during the mission due to catastrophic implosions the the pressure levels at that place and it, at extreme depth and despite the setback it's a groundbreaking ground groundbreaking accomplishment because it able to go to that kind of this one they yeah, named it as near us because it can change that uh, that uh, god no 
that changes its form as per the requirement that is why they named it as nearest into that name and then used it uh, quite a inspiring read if you would like to go through it and then uh, look at this accomplishments now coming to the indian scenario many people are making it one such is the nio team they have many um, smaller um, auvs they are called matsya they do for environmental monitoring by you i not put the photograph of that all the things i not put it inspection of pipeline and cables setu for seabed and collecting environmental data samudra for exploration and research the skin for collecting oceanographic data so these are all small small auvs they operate and uh, one what is in uh, figure shown is the um, uh, deep sea mining uh, one there they are going to do the deep sea mining where the uh, nodules uh, cobalt uh, rich uh, or magnesium rich uh, nodules are there able to go at, to a depth of 6000 meters and then want to do the uh, harvest those nodules they have a lot of difficulty because it is from the ship launched from a a frame and they have a long cable to run till the 6000 meters depth and this should have adequate buoyancy just to float over the seabed not to give the load to the seabed and then able to collect the nodules and then crush it pump it on top of 6000 meter every aspect is a challenge every aspect going to the deep sea and then having a ship to lower it the motions of the ship should not get transferred to the vessel so many time if it get transferred then the tether and the cable breaks you lose the rover at the bottom and when it is at the bottom the moment the bottom soil is so loose and it cannot bear the weight of the rover then you have the problem there it gets stuck or you are you are not able to collect when it moves it generates the hydrodynamic forces and nodules get separated to another side you are not able to collect economically harvest so we are also involved they are doing it and they have got quite good advancement these challenges need to be met in fact uh, you have to look for a ship where the sea keeping characteristics that is the heaving and the pitching and the rolling these three motions are small or how do you have it avoided uh, or how do you not to transfer those motions back into it all is such study uh, we are little bit involved and uh, we will be doing some work on this aspects of the one next is the everybody would have known about this niot is making the manned submersible this goes to a depth of 6000 meters a three man can go um, it's really a technologically challenging aspects the hydrostatics and the um, uh, resistance hydrostatic and sea keeping study i'm doing for them uh, we are working with them in this aspects of course structure and other things they are managing a small portion of the initial study of course it has to flow upright and do the hydrostatic part of it rightly uh, we are doing something for them also now coming to the aspects of gliders uh, which of my interest and i am doing certain research on this so i have two students one is lieutenant commander sheshank sankar Uh, who is doing phd under me and is almost completing this and submitting in another month and uh, another candidate is uh, mukesh gudila mukesh he is a pmr prime minister's research fellowship candidate and uh, i should give a credit to them so that's why uh, the work which i am going to show it in next few slides are the works which are done by them under my guidance so the question arises is what is a glider a uh, glider is a one which we are very quite familiar in the air which glides in the air which does not have any propulsion device it doesn't have a propeller or it doesn't have a turbo engines but it glides it use the wind flow patterns and adjust itself and able to glide in the uh, air to a certain level so the people who are good in flying the kite he knows when to give the thrust from the back or when to change the direction of it or how do i orient the angle of attack for the wings or the glide to float the way in which it needs to float so he will be able to do it so a kite when flown in air does not require any thruster it uses a difference in altitude to create the kinetic energy and then keep alight 
can i do it the same in the water so in underwater aevs i have put the underwater glider uh, similar to it's an autonomous one it glides very slow speed using the principles of change in weight so if i change the weight make it positively negatively buoyant it will try to drop down without anything in while dropping down if i have a wing but big enough able to produce the dropping down to a moving in front i will get i will move front as well as drop down so this can be given as a propulsion in front i don't have a thruster so changing in weight a measured quantity of changing in weight will play a role to move forward if i have a wing so that is the principle in which it works and um, being it is buoyancy driven and there is no thruster it is are le avu loka em cheddar railo na pan le mote vishaya yeah it is characteristically small to wala support wala to itun bolto na मीटर या या ओके so in the figure i have given uh, it follows being buoyancy driven it is small or very big it's very small and it consumes very low power you have to go next next no with this previous slide number i think 23 yeah this is this is next one yeah side number 2 right no 24 okay so being buoyancy driven these gliders are small uh, it require very less power and one important factor is very very long endurance and the cost is very low endurance can be as much as 6 months they are proven it has been uh, going around the globe for 6 months uh, it follows a typical pattern that pattern of the uh, path is called the short saw tooth pattern okay and by adjusting our buoyancy engine what we are going to have we can determine the path in which it should follow okay and uh, it can have a pressure sensors uh, tilt sensors magnetic compass and every time when it comes up it communicate to satellite whatever the data it is collected transmit to them and then can come to the store station and then it can fix itself where it is as as it is following or not not that it is drifted away Uh, from the its original position so the collection happens at the top and the bottom actually uh, the figure which i have been showing it's not visible from here uh, this is an electronic glider and uh, this uses for descent you can see it while descent uh, the it is uh, negatively buoyant while ascend it will be positively buoyant so that when coming it and if you look at it the accelerating phase is very small a duration in which it is going to accelerate after that it follows a very constant velocity to go down and come back so it is one of the uh, uh, this it's quite a novel idea it is happened in the uh, 1990 or 1995 in this range only the people have thought about this kind of gliders i'll repeat the slide again uh, just to make sure that uh, is that the operations when it is slow uh, small and uh, long endurance it cannot uh, do a too much of activities like scanning and other thing it's mainly used for hydrographic survey and some kind of alert system we can have it when you look at it um, the legacy glider the legacy gliders are all in this type where i have a ring type one axisymmetric all are wiring hull forms this axisymmetric hull forms uh, are the one the two three legacy gliders i have listed are um, spray glider sea gliders and solcom gliders if you look at little close length is around 2 meters 2 meters to that range and then uh, weight is around 
50 kg 50 to 60 kg and wingspan is around 5.502 uh, meter may square centimeter square that is the wingspan if you actually put in the length of two meters the length of the wing also will be around two meters uh, thumb rule if you look at it in that form so that is required to generate the the lift or the propulsion in the forward directions uh, this is the typical uh, legacy glider configuration little in detail i have put it on the the next one this is the scripts c spray which is a volume of about 250 cc uh, it can make 815 cycles the what which you said when it goes down it, it may in one cycle it may traverse about uh, five kilometers you can even program it it can go up to five kilometers to that range and the glide angle that the angle in which it goes is around 20 to 25 degrees and uh, the velocity is quite small uh, it is about one knots it is uh, one to two knots and um, the range is about horizontal range it would have traversed i said five kilometers no to 4702 4, 4, it, it clearly gives you the picture how how much is that length is two meters wingspan is around 1.1 uh, and the mass of the payload and gps for navigations and other things so certain pictures of the gliders what do they do is they have the antenna into the wing or on the tail so when it comes on top it rolls over to 90 degree and then use that as an antenna to communicate and then go back roll back and then go down so some of the pictures of it i have put a sea glider solcom glider and the sea spray the sea glider uh, that the one type of glider is the um, one in which the tail is used as the antenna the tail we have the antenna so it goes down come back and then able to communicate in that and the communication device used is also is very um, simple means of iridium based uh, satellite based phone so that the data transfer could be even much more cheaper so uh, when this has come and it goes to a depth and then come back it's a sawtooth pattern i want to uh, have this in one single band of depth in which i wanted to maintain how do i go about it then i have to change the hull form and at the same time it should use less, less energy that uh, changing the hull form and coming out is the uh, uh, this miring hull form uh, sorry this is the uh, what is that um, blended wing hull form it uh, similar to a z ray uh, the it's called z ray glider uh, typically they want to identify an object moving within a certain depth range i want to track it so it will be able to track within that space in that and then able to come up and communicate you can understand it could be a submarine it could be anything so this the completely in the wing shape changes and it's like a manta ray fish uh, manta ray okay so all these things are quite um, difficult to maneuver you, the requirement of the maneuvering study was the one which i have undertaken uh, this um, can go to it can have uh, generally it can have a ctt platform range up to thousands of kilometers weight is 50 kg speed is around one or 1.5 or even less than one knots communications they can use whatever the iridium based or or book on communication system what what is there so now coming to the maneuvering study uh, these gliders are characteristic by a large wing span and a cylinder hull form uh, and it follows a sawtooth pattern uh, they call it in terms of uh, dubin scar analogy dubin scar analogy means everything it can do is move forward only i can't move back but at the same time if there is an obstacle comes i have to avoid the obstacles i have to make a turn how do i do the turning by this that is what the maneuvering characteristics are going to have an impact how is the hull form is having a performance effect on this if i want to do certain places i can want this glider not to go the way in which it want i want to give a station keeping a station keeping glider then what kind of hull form i should make and what kind of this one i should do to have a station keeping the station may be a five kilometer range it will be keep going down spiral maneuver down and come back on the top it be able to domain it will have a domain of five kilometers within the domain i want to be able to maneuver that so such uh, do it for that uh, individual hydrodynamic coefficients have been taken up studied and look at the hull form and what will impact can i have certain weights within the hull form which will be able to do both anti-roll and changing the characteristics have been used such studies have been published regularly we have published eight papers on that i will uh, give you the glimpse of those papers in next few slides see if you look at him at the end only two forces are playing around with it when it goes down and come back one is drag another one is lift 
the drag force is mainly due to the hull form the way in which the hull is there any any object which is moving is like experience an opposite force is the drag force is a hull form force hull form another one is the lift of course there is a variation weight and buoyancy and also the wing the hydrodynamic lift it will generate if i able to manipulate all these three things i am able to control this one so how what are the things one is nothing great things are there only is the hull form is there another only wing is there where do i am going to place how i am going to place what kind of sections how do i modify the small hull forms all the things boil down to this the lift and the drag coefficients once i have to put this into the lift and drag coefficients in the uh, this one then i find that the power required is directly proportional to the drag and the lift if i want to increase the, this one the operations reduce the drag and lift i can do it by changing the hull form and also changing the altitude also the angle of attack also i can change and play around and then do it this is one part of it so all specific energy consumption is related to drag versus the lift a non dimensional coefficient drag by lift of the body and the hull model can further modify to greater endurance and faster speed i can play around the speed also there so the blended wing hull form came into play in this case where the inherent hull characteristics conform to the above above goal of achieving when i want to study about the aerodynamic forces and other things i have to rely upon finding out the um, uh, aerodynamic coefficients nothing but if i have a equation i have a coefficient the coefficients if i change and play it will change the uh, certain way the equations will going to be play the e equation is going to play around so the forces on the glider as a function of aerodynamic coefficient as shown in the equations and all these things i am studying uh, traditionally like an aircraft unlike like a ship where i measure the drag and the lift and then try to get the coefficients in the form of drag and the lift alone and then i change the axis as per the uh, axis of the one so this is the way we have studied and we did certain experiments both at iit delhi and iit madras because iit delhi where we had the ncw and um, Uh, sorry uh, we have the applied mechanics department and we have the wind tunnel and i worked there so i could uh, do certain analysis the miring hull form has been taken we have a wind tunnel of 1.6 into uh, 1.6 into sorry 75 into 45 cm the cross sections and able to have a 25 m per second of velocity so we did the analysis there and then this analysis have been used to validate the uh, cfd model and iit madras in the towing tank both the hull forms miring hull form and the blended wing hull forms the drag and the lift characteristics have been studied for various speeds uh, the model which we have made it for the miring is almost uh, i think 1 is to 1 and uh, for the sorry miring is 1 uh, is to 3 but for the uh, i'm i'm confusing miring is 1 is to 1 and the blended wing is 1 is to 3 so we had to go at the highest speed to meet the reynolds number criteria over the study okay this is the model which we have manufactured sorry not sorry the model which is manufactured and the towing tank studies have been undertaken there that is missing here okay so uh, systematic review of the published literature whatever has happened the review of dynamic turning uh, turnings undertaken from the equation of motion has been studied some empirical numerical and experimental study analysis were there identified the gap areas all those things have been published in a technical paper in the uh, uh, journal of small crafts and uh, technology it's a uh, rena publications one of the rena publication in the part b2 in this we have published there and uh, this gives an insight and the next study of the detailed study of the locations and the position of the wing and its effect on the drag and the lift characteristics have been elaborately studied both experimentally as well as on the numerically and this we have uh, published as a, this one uh, in the numerical study of effect of wing position on the autonomous underwater glider in the defense science journal uh, and it is available on the net and um, we have observed that there is no major changes have been observed with high angle of attack when with the wherever, wherever i am going to position it but you can go back and have a look at the other three gliders legacy glider where they have positioned this almost it is aft uh, in the middle uh, almost in the middle and almost all these aerofoil sections are all um, symmetric aerofoil sections so that uh, going down and coming back are almost uh, symmetric then next study is that i want to keep the station keeping what are the parameters of the glider 
or the hull form of the glider is going to do it. Station keeping is to do the spiral maneuver. I have to move forward and take a turn. And I can only do is move forward and then take a turn. So for that, all the hydrodynamic parameters have been listed and then studied the sensitivity analysis of this. Each one hydrodynamic uh, co coefficients, what is going to have the effect on the, the radius of the curvature or radius in which it is going to make a turn. This uh, gives that uh, lift coefficient uh, the, on seeing that on the glider turning uh, uh, using rudder, lift co coefficient increases does not result in any major change in the radius of the motion, whereas the drag coefficient increases. So I have to do certain nose shaping and the tail shaping to achieve the um, increase the drag at the same time if I want to do the station keeping of the uh, miring hull form glider. Then uh, uh, again on the virtual mooring, I want this also called the virtual mooring. A review uh, we have done an analysis on the uh, brief review of the development of design and processed a model for virtual mooring and this uh, are uh, presented in the proceedings of the international conference of coastal and Inter uh, coastal and inland water system in 2019 then when we are developing into the um, blended wing hull form what happens when the glider is not having a wing if i have a flat plate then I have a knockout profile, a different knockout profiles, and and blended to it. Of course, the volume is a matter for the glider to be there to accommodate certain volume, and then study about the lift to drag uh, coefficients. In the whichever is giving the lift to drag coefficient is giving the higher slope is better in the performance for the longitudinal motions. So that is the one the criteria which we look forward to look into the different design aspects of the glider. Then what happens when I give a sweep angle to this, a different different sweep angle, and then do studies? When I do these studies, here also gives an important one that um, lift to drag ratio of these five models are plotted, and then it shows that there are certain possibility where the application is that I can choose the way in which the sweep angle can be given, where I can generate, whichever is one having the greater slope is important, as I told, and lift to drag ratio plays an important role in the longitudinal motion of the uh, vessels. These are the certain studies uh, we have undertaken. Some more are the on the wing shapes and the hull forms. And if you look at the research findings, uh, we have the, the lift to drag ratio plays the sort of pattern, the motion of the vessels, identifying the important hydrodynamic coefficients which are useful for virtual mooring, sawtooth uh, pattern or spiral motions have been identified. The span to wing ratio, uh, wing span of the wing increases, L by D ratio increases. Symmetrical NACA is the one preferred by the blended wing hull form. Position uh, of the wing along the depth, along the length of the glider do not show a variation in uh, L by uh, lift to drag ratios. Higher angle of attack is located better in the display of lift to drag. And certain algorithm which is identified to solve this kind of one has been identified. So number of publication looks, we are in better. Now it is a time that we should go for um, uh, um, uh, getting into the production of the platform. This is me. Uh, I am trying to present this glider in Navy when I was in uniform on a Navy day to CNS house in this day, the, just before retirement 2015. Then it was shown in IFR also. Still some research are being continued. Uh, that I will, thought I will stop, but it is not right without showing that other part of the one, uh, which I picked it up from net, the 12 robots that could make or break the oceans. Mm. One is the autonomous ships. A lot of things are being done. People call everything as autonomous ships, even if it is remotely operated vessels. They, re they remotely operated with all the sensors. Then also they call it as autonomous. Autonomous meaning purely autonomous, meaning it should be able to move freely by sensing itself and to go. It will going to take a long way where big data and then AI has come into play, but, but the steps have been taken, people have proved, people have able to do, to remotely operate the vehicles. Even the big ships can enter the port, leave the harbor without the assistance of the human, uh, without the assistance of the human present on board. They are present, but they can remotely operate it. The such things have been shown in many of the one. Then another one is on the um, scuba diving. <coughs> the operation can itself can be undertaken by a robot then underwater augmented reality of the glasses where it can be there 
Then the blue, blue revolutions. Uh, as per the data on 2014, the first time in the world in which world ate more fish from farms rather than from seas. We have migrated. We have been once a long time back, uh, ocean going fish, we used to have a fix. Then we have migrated and a lot of farm culture happened on the land. Now this is the first time even in the sea, we make nets, have the nets uh, there and then have a culture there and then have a farming. This has happened and many such firms have already come up. Personally, we are also doing a certain resistant test for fixing of nets into the oceans. And then within that, you do the culture and then able to aquapods. These are all cages or aquapods which are coming into play. Innovations can be there. Under, under, undersea cloud computing. 95% of the internet or 99% of the internet traffic is transferred via cables and you can have and it's a quite good sync mechanism whatever the heat generated it could be there it can be data could be there then wave uh, new waves of ocean energy after the war they want to be away from the fossil fuel a huge investment is happening on the energy generations on the oceans waves and on the wind installed in the oceans a huge and huge investment is happening and we will see it in very near future within two years or that many mega mega generators will be there available in that okay ocean thermal energy is another aspects deep sea mining is another one ocean big data is another one a field in which you can look at it then food not only food medicines from the sea is another one then you have got coastal sensors, sensing both you are able to have a defense mechanism as well as rapidly warning system, even for tsunami, early warning and other things can be there. The coastal sensor and the last one is biomimic, uh, bio, biomimicking robots. This is taking into a shape where you want to uh, repeat the mother nature, the, which is, says that efficiency is the maximum if you follow the mother nature. So you want to repeat that and have the biomimicking propulsion devices. Uh, a lot of research is being going on. I also showed you something. NRB is organizing something to make at least one prototype module on the biomimicking uh, propulsion device. They are trying to make um, something similar to the bitkey fish, uh, replica of that uh, shape as a hull form and then able to have it. Uh, with this, I give you a small glimpse of the underwater robotics uh, any questions and other things please open to dr vijay i have a question some this question is pending on my head from december yeah yes sir there is a international convention on marine engineering held in uh, Vishakapatnam, 2nd of December, which I happen to attend. So there are uh, some small institutes who are working, uh, you know, in Chennai and in Kakinada, etc. There are some institutes. So they came and presented a paper. He is working on, first, my question is, you showed a composite pro propeller. Now, is composite propeller in use today? In in ships yeah yes sir where the figure which i showed that was a, a one composite propeller fitted on a japanese uh, one of the japanese vessel it's, and it uh, it's a what a merchant ship a merchant ship sir okay oh. right the second question is he had uh, a, a propeller which is uh, impregnated with car graphene so uh, and he found that the thrust is much more is is a lot uh, uh with that so we get a good good thrust with it so he asked whether it could be used on you know some submarines or ships or something i didn't have an answer for that uh, so i told him go and use it for a torpedo since i was sitting in vishakapatnam i said and still is here yeah so you can have a look because there is it's very interesting that uh, paper where you're getting good thrust yeah. for small power it's a power versus thrust thing so, but I have not come across, uh, uh, we've used composite propellers for torpedoes, et cetera, I'm aware, that's why I told him. But definitely I've not seen in any ships and things 
So that was one question I have think. But you are telling me there are some shifts. Then yes. Why is it that we're still using uh, uh, the alloy propellers? Uh, why they are using? Why not composite? Why are we not going to composite? If if you if you say that there is already in use. Uh, yes, sir. It's in the development stage. Uh, in the sense, uh, uh, one is that uh, material is a composite. I can stitch the way I want. Uh, the way in which I want the strength, I can stitch it. The way in which I want to have a flexibility, I can do it. The, the When you said that, sir, the efficiency is more, I give a certain kind of flexibility to, to the propeller. And the same size of the propeller, the weight of the composite propeller will be much lower than this. But the longevity of the propeller is a question mark. Yeah, long. So that, is, that is exactly what uh, my this thing was yeah. because how I mean, how many times will I have to change the propeller because of that? Uh -huh. You know, because you say longevity. Yeah. Because we so uh, this is a question which is pending in the domain. Yes, yes sir. Uh, that if you make a propeller like this, which has got graphene, because today a lot of people are working in composites. Yes. So this one was a new one which I saw with graphene in it, and the reason because the structure is there, which gives it that it's like using Kevlar or something, you know, mm -hmm. in a thing. So that was my question. That a if it is good, where can it be used? Though I said torpedo, where can it be used? Two, if composites are good, why are we not switched to say ferries, small boats, etc.? Why haven't we gone to that yet? And why as a nation we can't do for inland transport? In, uh, I think why aren't we taking up for that? It is good to have, and you are a practical man. You've been in the navy, you designed, etc. We have to get into the market, no? So yes. Uh, so that's what that was my question because all the people will be here thinking that okay, you've come and given a presentation, but where is it being used? Is it being used at all? What are the advantage you are getting by using it in the thing? So that is what also uh, that's why I asked you this question. Yes. Uh, it's in the development stage. One is the at at present until unless you make it in the mass more, the cost will not come down. So that is the first question. So my intention was that after returning from navy and then visiting a beaches and the fishermen's and then spending the time with uh, certain time with the fishermen's, there are so many fishing boats are there. When I look at that propeller, which is small in size, not very complicated, and uh, simple. And uh, it is not designed to the hull and the boat. It has somebody designed, just fitted, running, efficiency is low. So my intention was to change the attitude there. So when I interacted and all, and they just believe in the the mass of the propeller, the weight of the propeller. The moment they say, sir, it's, something is tilted or turned or corroded or something has happened, I just take it go to the vendor who is giving a propeller, not, nothing is matched. Engine is not matched, propeller is not matched, uh, hull is not matched, and we have plenty, thousands and thousands in number, and almost in similar sizes of the vessels itself. So they just go, give it to for a weight, and pick up that as a, another weight. So there has to be a change, it has to come. So we are working on that, sir, maybe in few years. Yeah, I, I got few photographs in my WhatsApp. I'll just show we are, it. Uh, we are asking the fishermen to change their attitude. What and, uh, about us? <laughs> we have we have designing. We have got the capability to design propeller, but there is no no place where we are manufacturing propellers. I'm talking of, when I say propellers, I'm talking for either the merchant marine or for the navy. Yeah. We still are importing propellers. So with you know having what is what is preventing? That's the that's what I have not been able to see. We're able to design. We're able to analyze. We're able to this thing. Material, I don't think is an issue because you can you can develop your own alloy. I mean, we have got that uh, uh, thing also. We are making so many new alloys which are coming out out of the Midani or out of thing which we are using it. We are using in space. I'm quite aware of that. So why is it that that because that is the main thing. The characteristic of propeller will define a lot of things, especially for underwater objects. I'm talking of. Uh, sir, sir, can I take an analogy a little away mm -hmm. and then come back? Uh, 15 years back, steel, shipbuilding steel, we were not having. Not that we were not having capacity, not that we were not having the metallurgy, not that this one. But the volume required was not meeting the commercial need. And there was a dictum somebody has imposed 15 years back, we will never go and get the steel from outside. Now we are in a state. All warship shipbuilding steel is indigenous. 
similarly there has to be a dictum for propeller not that we are, we are actually manufacturing about 2 2 meter diameter of the propeller in india certain places in chennai itself they are manufacturing and then it's recorded uh, it's uh, manufacture uh, process yeah the casting we make castings without any defects of ideals of 5 di 5 meter diameters in brass so that technology is also available so it's only the willpower that this day onwards i want to manufacture propeller only in india it will be manufactured and apart from that sir i would like to quote here also uh, we have one faculty who has come from uh, did his pdf and come he has made uh, is uh, that an abroad they actually uh, the, uh, made a propeller of 2.5 meters in diameter by 3d printing uh, uh, different technology to to print this kind of having a uniformity in that then having it so he is also manufacturing a small impellers and other things of 1 to 1.5 uh, less than 1 meter diameter so if it could be scaled up it could be uh, it is not uh, uh, difficult see uh, uh, as you rightly or somebody said right in the we have all the brains we have the yes. technology we have the understanding but we don't do it so my only question is why are we still not doing it okay when i was in the navy i fully agree that we were importing uh, and we, actually we didn't even uh, there is nobody here even those who are in the dockyard once a do thing gets chipped what do you do you ask Replay. yeah so the question no we try and do something to yes, uh, his Pretty. officer says i'm putting too much noise so then we go and change the propeller other we think he also doesn't know correct docker admin so the question is propeller is very important if you are making the whole ship if you are making the whole uh, thing in india and it is like you said steel but i know the story of steel yes, yes, sir. that's right? why i took it yeah because i was i was very much there yes. it was made for something else and said you bloody well use it first okay so it it got you yes. right but the question is uh, why okay if somebody could do that for steel why can't somebody do this for propeller and every time we've been saying that we don't manufacture propellers we don't manufacture at least let's start manufacturing for all the other thing inland board transport this that etc start making the propellers then you you know you say, ah there's a Propeller manufacturing company in thing. Then maybe we can look at. So it's yes. important to, and I'm only worried about much much later is underwater propellers. You know, the, I'm talking the submarine, but that that is another uh, thing which we will only get to there if we move these steps. Let's move. Sure. Sir. Good afternoon, sir. I'm Deputy, Deputy Commandant Samir. My question is related to the uh, drag reduction technology that you were mentioning using the bubbles. Yeah. So my question is, are there any ships actually using this technology? And if yeah, 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 it, it is there. If yes, what is the uh, difference in terms of speed uh, that we gain using this technology? Um, um, I'd say more than the speed it is gained. It is more than the fuel it is consumed. They look at it in that form. So one of the cement carrier. Uh, which has got a lot of generation of the air and other things for pumping out and cleaning and other purpose. So they are using this for the uh, bubble induced uh, drag reductions. Uh, now it is getting popular and these bubbles are there. People are gone, gone into even micro bubble and other things. I am not getting into the micro bubble, just uh, air injected uh, this one and then able to generate. The thumb rule is that um, it should be a flat bottom vessel. Bottom should be flat. Then, um, but we, in our research, we have found out is that if we inject the bubble and that flat bottom, 80% of the uh, bottom is covered with the air bubble, it will cover if you go at certain altitude. Then you will have more than 6 to 7 percentage reduction in the power. So you have to produce the bubble and then pump it inside. So we have done the economic analysis and published a paper in the um, uh, this one, SLAMI. Uh, US uh, journal paper which talks about all these things. So anything less than that is not that advantageous. Uh, but 80% if you're able to cover it, it is quite good advantages. You have to maintain the altitude and other things for that. Sir, uh, and if we are using the bubbles and after a uh, certain point of time, those bubbles will split. Mm. So uh, will we not have a cav cavitation effect in the hull of the... Uh, yeah, um, we, in fact, one of the papers is, uh, what is cavitation we have to understand? 
cavitation is the formation of water molecules into water vapor water molecules into a water vapor so how does it water vapor like in a fresh pressure cooker you have got a high pressure even at a very low pressures at low temperature it can bubble and form that is what cavitation uh, in the fuel so the front and back of the blade from the back of the blade where a negative pressure is generated to give the thrust negative pressure is generated to give the thrust that negative pressure is so low a cavity is formed water is become water vapor and then stick into the propeller and then it doesn't explode it implodes it collapses it implodes it when it implodes it's eat away the material okay this is two different things medium is different and it can be a nucleus this air bubble can be a nucleus to generate a cavity so the cavity uh, so that we have to read it in little more in depth to understand so it is not that uh, cavitation is a uh, air is being formed it is a water going into water vapor getting attached to it and then implodes rather than air which is there aer aerated water aerated water could be a nucleus to generate but certain literatures when we are reading it and finding out it is not creating in fact it is better for it so we have to do a research on this topic so I, that is why i don't uh, give this idea to the uh, warships when it comes to the um, bubble induced drag reduction it reduces the frictional resistance not the wave making resistance the frictional resistance are high in a slow speed vessels slow speed vessels are oil tankers and then uh, not even uh, container vessels so commercial applications are much more for a uh, air induced lubrication compared to a uh, high speed vessel high speed vessels we have other alternatives where we induce a vane where we induce a flap all those things we have done it for one vessel a lot of commercial people are approaching us to into that we are only not responding because their restrictions are too many uh, so we are not responding to them otherwise for a high speed vessel different application slow speed vessel different application medium speed vessel different application we are attaching uh, looking into these three little differently on the green ship initiative thank you sir okay. so i just had a question regarding this communication thing you brought out uh, the communication i mean still bit uh, the mode of communication that you brought out was basically the uh, satellite communication mm -hmm. so is there like fine now with regard to gliders it's a satellite communication with regard to uh, you know tethered web uh, they saying if it is a it's having a cable then absolutely there's no issue but what about auvs i mean auvs with any of the submarines is there any uh, any other mode of communication apart from uh, satellite communication for communicating between the auv and the sub submarines i think uh, arnab so, can answer so anything underwater has to be acoustic communication there is no other way so if you have to do satellite it is rf right so for that you have to be outside the water so what he mentioned is that uh, it comes out uh, on the surface and also you may need a height so either an antenna goes up or even the body goes up to make sure that the antenna is on top but anything underwater has to be acoustic communication so there are modems but once it is the the signal is acoustic but rest of the things of coding and all those things are very common to any communication system excuse me sir uh, can i ask a question Uh, we'll just come to you, sir. Just having okay. a discussion. We'll come to you. Oh, okay. Thank you. Anything? I mean, anything actually in nature is not digital at all. Anything in nature is analog. so that analog signal could be acoustic it could be em or whatever it is but it is only when you sense it and then you convert it to digital after that it is like any other uh, signal that you are dealing with so in underwater it has to be acoustic so for accordingly you have to have a acoustic sensor uh, both for transmission and reception yes sir basically that is what my question was ke apart from acoustic maybe if there is any other uh... you know source of uh, communication which is no see the biggest ABS. problem in underwater is uh, the attenuation it can only handle i mean the underwater uh, a channel 
supports uh, acoustic only because it has to, I mean, the acoustic uh, range is 20 hertz to 20 kilohertz, right? And uh, in underwater, it is a band limited channel. When we say band limited, the upper limit is decided by the frequency which gets attenuated. Higher frequencies get attenuated underwater. The lower frequency is determined the, by the size of the transducer itself. So you can't, I mean, the motivation would be to transmit as low as possible, but uh, antenna will not support that. So that's why we call uh, underwater channels a band limited channel. I mean, uh, very low frequency of 100 hertz or something can travel thousands of kilometers. But you can't generate that kind of, uh, at least in the transmission mode, reception is still okay. So that is the limitation. Uh, any, uh, any other form will not last or they will, and you know, there's a relation between the resolution and the uh, frequency. Very high frequency will give you very high resolution, but it will not have long range. Sir, uh, my question uh, that uh, whilst uh, I have seen that a lot of focus is there on uh, AUVs and autonomous uh, underwater vessels, is there enough focus on tethered uh, drones and tethered vessels? Because uh, I see that uh, they have a uh, greater chance of success and uh, uh, lesser cost towards development because we do save on communication aspects and faster data communication rates across these vessels. And is it that uh, India has moved across this and directly transgressing into uh, the autonomous part or we do not require to now go to the tethered aspect? I think uh, tethered one, as per the need and the scientific need, whoever is doing the research, they are making on their one and then de deploying it. Gave a list of six in number of examples of the AUVs and the tethered one used by NAOT. And uh, tethered one, even with the uh, one, it is being developed. AUV is a little more challengeable compared to tethered one. So we are slowly progressing from the tethered to AUVs and further more but into is, uh, group of there is also one angle of you know depends on the application mm -hmm. see what you said rov if you have to go very deep managing the whole tethered cord itself is not easy as x officers you'll appreciate you know uh, maneuverability underwater because the weight itself becomes very difficult so uh, but certain applications we require so the, the tethered part is called an rov Yes. And otherwise, it's AUV. But ROV has certain limitations and certain advantages also. But if you have to reach very far, then you know it will be very difficult to have a long cable. It will have a many other maneuverability issues uh, in terms of managing that. No, no. If your your power is on top, your communication is on top, you can really control it. Wherever such application is that ROV is used. What I want to. Uh, what I wanted to say is that are we focusing enough on tethered because uh, close to coast applications of tethered drones or tethered ROVs are uh, much more and uh, uh, we are likely to experience greater success in, uh, in my opinion, uh, towards uh, tethered ROVs. So is it that uh, we are directly trying to uh, go towards uh, AUVs and not focusing enough on uh, tethered uh, drones? Is what I want. No, I don't think so. I That's don't. Uh, same thing. I also don't think so. Application or yes, I don't. Uh, long back, I think we were also very concentrating on ROVs, wanting to get ROVs onto our platforms, etc. But you're right, the focus seems to be AUVs. I don't hear about anything about ROVs. Is it because of the handling equipment? That's a question we need to ask ourselves. Anything towed, anything, you know, thing has got different, uh, uh, you know, issues, seamanship, there's that, recovery, the... So we have no, I have noticed that everywhere we have shifted from toad to if something can do it on its own and give me the job, I don't want to do it. So I think more it is on that. While toad cannot go far, all that I can agree with you. But there are requirements for ROV and why don't we have ROVs? It's a good question. 
So I have a feeling from my experience and thing, whatever toad we had, we have done away with. Whether it was a toad, uh, what you call boy, toad noisemaker, toad, uh, uh, what do you call that, sonar, yeah, long back. I'm talking of uh, not the toad array, but toad sonar we had. Or hum, um, uh, hull, uh, variable depth sonar, you know, which we had from the Russian ships and ours also uh, on the Leanders we had. And later, we gave up. And everywhere, the problem was handling, you know, because of the handling, maintenance of the handling equipment, right, etc. But instead of finding solutions for that, we abandoned it and we started going elsewhere. So actually, it depends on the need, as he said. If it is required, I think we have adequate uh, the thing, especially in the uh, for uh, the um, toad uh, machinery. You know, I, I'm forgetting. Sorry, my the that I think we have. See, when anything gets stored, right, it cannot be a rope. It has to fare for a while and then sink. So those things, we have stopped working on it. I, I, I know that we were working at one time, we produced, but then the requirement from the Navy itself changed. So if there is a thing, it can be done. In areas like he's talking, I know about uh, toad uh, thing being used by NIOT for a lot of uh, uh, application, but then that is research. We are looking at, at operations, et cetera. Am I right? We are looking at operations. So if the need is there, it can be got. Otherwise, the thing. And at the same time, I don't know very many toad, uh, I mean, toad means uh, like ROV, you know, being used now. Earlier, ROVs, big fellows used to be on the side of the ship like your boat. And uh, I've seen not in our ships, but in the other Western ships, which thing. And at one time, we were also uh, planning to. Uh, when I was young in the Navy, uh, the Navy was planning to look into it. But for some reason, we dropped it. So I don't know. It could be one, I believe, handling because anything that we handle has a risk in in terms of uh, maintenance, in terms of when bringing it up back. Because for some while, it'll come back. After that, we'll tow it and bring it back. Did we probably we, that will be the thing? Or is it there is no requirement? Or Ottoman AUVs? meet your requirement then why should you go for anything that is stored so that also is a uh, is a thing that needs to be looked at but so unless there is a need the further research into thing i think will not happen so that is the if yeah, but still i agree with you that people keep doing research on in the uh, in the academia you know, for them it's a study for them it's a study but for us if there's a requirement then we have to put that requirement and get it done There was a question from somebody online. Can we? Mr. Krishna Kutti? Uh, yes, sir. I am attending online. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, sir. Please go ahead, sir. Okay. Uh, this is, I had put two questions on the chat box uh, first, but uh, what I want to ask please, now uh, read is. Read out your question, sir, please. Pardon? Can please read out your question, sir. No, 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 that's okay. Uh, that you, you will see eventually because it's in the chat box. But what I want to ask now is something different. Now, we're talking about the uh, cavitation and uh, the effect of uh, producing water bubbles for to relieve the hull friction. Now, I, I want to ask whether the, these are uh, two different uh, situations because in the case of cavitation, uh, the bubble formation by is by the evaporation of the water, and when the bubble implodes, uh, almost perfect vacuum is produced, and that creates a, a high velocity water flow. And when uh, that hits the hull, it produces erosion. This is what I have understood about cavitation. But whereas in the other case, the bubble is produced by the air, and when that bubble collapses, uh, does it produce a vacuum? Uh, then only it can create a, a erosion or cavitation. Now, uh, am I clear? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, is it a question or it is a remark? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So my question is: this uh, bubble formation for the uh, reducing the hull friction can it result in cavitation? Yeah. 
see in this uh, bubble actually we are sending uh, high pressure air or little more pressure than whatever the pressure which is being experienced at that locations then only the, it will be able to pass through it when the bubble passes through it or the air passes through it it splits it coalesces it forms a bigger dynamics and then bubble itself will form into a different layers and it is buoyant and like other other things and then because it is buoyant it will come on top when it's coming on top it sticks to the hull so this dynamics itself is completely different from the way we are looking at the cavity formations it is not a cavity it is a bubble it is filled with the bubble it doesn't i don't think so it implodes or explodes it forms and coalesces and forms its own dynamics differently so this itself is another big study which people are doing and then um, uh, erosion because of this i don't think so maybe corrosion happens because of the air bubble is there but i don't think so erosion happens that is what the literatures and the published one is uh, giving an answer sir so i also go along with the statement what you made thank you now the questions i put in the chat box yeah uh, for, can i read it now or yeah please okay now you mentioned that uh, the sweep angle uh, oh, yes. the effect of changing in the sweep angle you made some researches mm -hmm. now this uh, change of angles was done to the for in the same model with the arrangement of, to change the angle or you used a different model and uh, because how costly is the model that's why that's the ba basic uh, reason for my asking question so the sweep angle uh, on the same uh, meaning uh, the one why what i presented was only the numerical study oh, not the uh, oh, okay okay not oh i understand okay so, sorry okay okay and my second question was uh, in the riding uh, like kite for example the proportion okay. power is produced by the movement of air or water if it is under water is the movement of the water right Yeah. For yeah. maneuvering the uh, glider, you need to change the uh, certain changes you have to make. And in a paragliding, the person makes the changes. Mm -hmm. so, yeah. so, how do you do that in the case of a uh, model? Uh, yeah, or the uh, model or the actual? Ah, uh, it's the actual model, right? No, uh, yeah. Actual. How does it do? Is by two ways. One is uh. the rudder. Another uh. one is uh, the weight. Changing the weight. When I want to change the altitude of the vessel. I used to change the mass, the mass which is the heavy mass which I have a battery. I load okay. the battery in such a way that I can change the mass. Change the by changing the mass, I change my center of gravity and the center of gravity. So by giving that, I am able to change and also it can roll. It's a, a different mechanism for the gliders. The whole weight can be rolled to one direction to change the uh, altitude, both in the forward direction that is the pitch as well as on the roll direction so that i am able to change that and then able to attain that and have the altitude change change in the okay. this one so these two has to be performed similarly rudder also is rudder is the most effective one and this also people use that even for minor corrections on the altitude the change of weight is being done inside right. the uh, okay i understood that but how do you make the changes by remote control uh... No, no. It has to sense. We have made a small change in the model which we have shown. It has ah, to be able to sense. I want to may ah. maintain a thirty-five degree, or when it is going to ascend, this angle should be maintained. I should not change the uh, this one. It will be able to sense and change the weight. Okay. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, sir. So I have done. So I have done one research paper on biomimetics mm. and. Uh, This is a, this is actually basic doubt, but mm. it's been plaguing me from the very beginning of that research. Thing is that, for example, let me take a let me just give an analogy. In the 1950s, the U.S. Is it okay, sir? Yeah, yeah. Okay, sir. In the 1950s, the U.S. decided to make one submarine. Uh, it was I, I again I forgot its name. Like again I forgot its name. Like I did. Did this paper one year ago, so just uh, I just searched it up, but still I couldn't find it. The main problem was that it was it was actually the biggest submarine till then, till then in the U.S. Uh, with the in the hands of U.S. in the hands of U.S. Navy. The problem was that they 
it they they used the biomimetics for uh, they used biomimetics for the designing of the hull of the submarine and the animal which they copied this was from the dolphin still uh, it showed some problems with the maneuvering abilities and all because of the, the copying mechanism like the uh, the way they copied it, it it went it went horribly wrong and this uh, this actually led to a one one more paradox again in the in the field of biomimetics which was a subject of debate till 1970s and 80s until the mit scientists proved it wrong that the that, that the paradox itself is wrong innately and it ended but still uh, my doubt is that for example for, for the time being let us consider two different organisms one is uh, minkley and the another one is prestidae or, or in simple terms uh, it is a cichlid minkley is a cichlid and uh, prestidae is a sawfish both of them uses stealth for very different purposes in their life cycle this cichlid uses stealth for uh, mating and the uh, prestidae the sawfish uses stealth for hunting purposes so how does we overcome this confusion when we are choosing a, a an organism for our design like both of them like if you are ch you, you can just search in the internet for their pictures and you can see a widely different organism both of them are widely different in their body functions in their body structure in their morphology so when we are uh, suppose you are designing a, you are designing one submarine and you wanted it to have the maximum stealth and you are actually f trying to follow the path of biomimetics so how can we overcome this thing this confusion yeah that persists there so you are looking Thank at you. the stealth or the propulsion okay, okay. see the propulsion by bio biomimicking i don't think so submarine exists okay it's a very uh, even though it has been started a long time back the success or the it's still in the nascent stage because we are not able to mimic the fish as a whole some of the fish, fish is having a flap like this whereas whales have a flap like this it's a different 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 configurations and other things and um, the propulsion device is not only the fin the way in which you are looking at it the whole body itself is a propulsion they adjust the buoyancy they they got a fins of different caudal fins and other fins to adjust the stability and the whole body moves it's all into the form so now we are in a stage where we will use a flap as a one is flap as a propulsion device and then even in the flap the flexibility in the flap is introduced now it was a fixed flap with or with the rigid flap the flexibility in the flap then not only the flexibility in flap we will have two different layers of that then people have studied even furthermore when the flap flaps the flow pattern around the flap this is a vertex vertex is generated what is a vertex vertex takes away energy from the flap and go but the same vertex is providing the thrust vertex is the movement of water in a direction so they have found out it is not the vertex the vertex assist it it is a one common reverse one common vertex assist to pull, give a thrust in the front so that happens in certain stroke number that also identified so if you operate on certain stroke number to produce the reverse one common vertex if the flap is able to create then you will have a positive advantage of giving a forward thrust so we are working meaning the team is now the whole world is working within that stroke numbers to give that reverse one common vertex so that flow pattern assists the forward thrust so it is still a lot of study and other thing is going on smaller and smaller objects are mimicking the biomimicking propulsion not the big submarines not the big ships with the flaps we and even i have showed one uh, small videos where flaps are there when the flaps moves it move vessels moves in front it will take long time to come into that and this one but smaller objects i want to stay longer use less power more efficient and still i can do it and then go for it efficiency is the only thing your question is where do i have this stealth or other stealth this propulsion or other propulsions okay sir yes. where do i get the maximum efficiency one number i told you was struggle numbers where i want to use the science of producing reverse one common vertex to give a forward thrust if i operate within that whether a flap is like this or flap is like this if i am able to do that i am in an advantage where my propeller is 60 to 67 percent if i increase to another six percent 70 73 percent i can stay longer that is the only thing 
and that is the main uh, this one all the all the uh, objective of any research is that how do i activate to get a better efficient propulsion device sir but in the case of uh, submarines and jewel, i mean literally in the case of warfare when we are coming we cannot always depend upon the pro 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 we cannot always focus on the propulsion efficiency like stealth is also an important factor yeah, yeah. it's stealth so it then, is still there this is more still there yes sir you have a fixed machine rotating and creating so much of noise a flap rotating at a very low struggle numbers move forward and come back you don't make so much of noise sir uh, like i just give this an example like an example only mm -hmm. i'm not asking about stealth particularly on stealth mm -hmm. For the, like this is an example, and this is a just basic question, sir. Not not about the uh, biomimetic, not about the propulsion or the maneuverability, nothing like that. It is a basic question, like how will we overcome the confusion of selecting which animal on the designing part? That's my only question. Like uh, proper literature review before you have you within your objective of project or pro, uh, this on research objective and proper literature review, technical review will give a. Conclusions on the gap area and arriving at fitting yourself into the research domain. Yeah, that was, I think, a very good question. But if you remember yesterday, Venkat was mentioning about you know a clone. If you have to make, see, finally you have to understand the whole dynamics of that particular animal. How or if I mean for biomimicry, you have to understand every aspect of it. You know how they are doing it, and. Till very recently, we did not have the computational power. See, finally, it's modeling and simulation, right? You have to for, to understand, as Vijay said, you have to do a lot of models and then simulate and understand various aspects. But now I think we have reached this level where we have a reasonable amount of computational ability to really model something to as much accuracy as we desire. And as Vijay also said, there are so many questions to be answered. Right. I mean, what are you trying to learn from that? So to learn, you have to first be able to clone the same thing. And you have to be able to do simulations with every possible representation of the animal behavior. And we really did not have the kind of computational capabilities. It is getting better and better now. But I think it will still take a long time, as Vijay said, to really understand and also, you know, when you do something, you have to have your research question very clear. What are you trying to achieve? And it has to be multidisciplinary. A lot of modeling and simulation will have different, different pers uh, uh, perspective, different, different research questions that need to be answered. So, but I think it will, uh, I mean, as he said, it's an effort of so many different researchers over a period of time and, you know, slowly we are maturing. I think it still has some distance to cover. I, I will simplify this in a small nutshell and answer. So if you are doing a prototype and the model scale test anything, we follow three laws of similarity. Okay. This is dimensional similarity, then dynamic similarity and kinematic similarity. But you cannot meet all the three in most of the time. Even today when I want to do a model testing of a ship, I cannot meet on the dynamic case, Reynolds number similarity, I cannot meet. Then we evolve a method, still we are designing, we are having a propulsion device, fixing the main engines and the propeller, understood, no? So this we would have studied in second year of BTEC, loss, loss of similarity, this we have to follow, and it goes, dimension goes bigger and bigger as you go more similar to the cloning. Okay, I think uh, we'll break for lunch. Vijay, thank you so much. Uh, it's I mean, we have not only been able to engage for the time, but beyond. And I think there would be many more questions. You may like to talk to Vijay during lunchtime. And otherwise, you can always send a question to us and we'll reach out to Vijay to answer. It's It was very thought-provoking, uh, Vijay. Thank you so much. And you really covered a lot, uh, uh, wide spectrum of issues. And you represent the hydrodynamic community and the naval architecture community, so which is very important when we talk about the underwater domain. So thank you so much, Vijay. Thanks, thanks. Thank you so much.
interactions in the Indian Ocean region, IOR. The global power play is unfolding in the tropical littoral waters of the IOR. India is home to over 6% of global marine diversity. Over a 7,517 kilometer coastline, Indian oceans have been protecting us for millennia. Now, it's time for us to protect our oceans. Let's start conversations, strive for innovations, and vote for protection of Indian Ocean region. Introducing Marine Time Research Center, Foundation for Underwater Domain Awareness. The concept of the Maritime Research Center, I thought of as a technology-driven think tank, because I feel there is a gap in terms of strategy not being backed by sound technology. And particularly when we talk about the Indian Ocean region, there is uh, significant <coughs> differences in our understanding of the underwater domain. And uh, the tropical littoral waters have their very specific challenges which need to be addressed. And that's how I thought of this uh, organization where we are going to be talking, uh, work, working on the policy technology and innovation and the human resource development. This going forward, when we look at the underwater domain awareness framework, it's going to be a huge opening and there's tremendous opportunities that are come, going to come. But to have a coherent and a comprehensive way forward, all the three aspects are important and that's how we are uh, looking at all these things. MRC is driven with a three-pronged mission to engage with decision makers and policy formulators to facilitate technology and innovation, to spread awareness and start conversations on underwater domain awareness. The underwater domain awareness framework is a concept that touches all the four stakeholders. When we look at the underwater domain, there are security requirements, whether it is internal security or external security, then there is a the blue economic requirement. There's tremendous opportunities uh, in terms of shipping, undersea resources, a whole lot of other things. The third is the environment and the disaster management. That also requires tremendous technologies and also proper policies where they can be addressed effectively. And the fourth is pure science and technology. We all know science and technology will be the driver for all things to come. But specifically having science and technology tailored for that requirement is very, very important. And that's how MRC tries to address the UDA framework in a very, very comprehensive manner. MRC wants to be a nodal agency dealing with the UDA framework. We want to look at all aspects of policy. We want to look at all aspects of technology and innovation. And we also want to be a nodal agency for the human resource, multidisciplinary human resource development. Here, when we look at human resource, we are like looking at two distinct communities, if I may use the word. One is people who are already in the domain, people who are part of the stakeholders. They have a reasonably good understanding of the domain, but they need to be given the right academic backing and the theoretical understanding to, or the research background so that they can contribute. So maybe, you know, stakeholders can go into the policy level with a uh, sound understanding of the uh, domain. Also, we need younger people to come in. I mean, we have, uh, say, a computer science uh, student, how he can apply his computer science understanding into the underwater domain awareness, or an electronic student, how he can apply his understanding in the underwater domain awareness, or even a law student, uh, or a history student, how they can bring value, or a mass communication student, how they can bring value. So we are looking at a multidisciplinary approach and also distinctly kind of uh, make it clear that what they can contribute and what, how they can build a future career in this domain.
21st century has seen a decisive shift in the global order. The Indian government has demonstrated significant maritime intent with the Sagar vision of the Honorable Prime Minister. This maritime focus has resulted in multiple mega projects by the government of India. Like the Sagar Mala, Bharat Wheel, Inland Water Transport, Multimodal Transport, the Deep Sea Mining Mission, International Seaway Authority allocation. With this strong maritime intent, India is well positioned geographically and geostrategically to play a leadership role in the region. The tropical littoral waters present unimaginable living and non-living undersea resources. The economic opportunities in the Indo-Pacific of the global commons as a facilitator for economic growth are waiting to be explored. It also comes with its fair share of challenges. The Indian Ocean region today is at the risk of facing Political challenges like volatility, fragmentation, instability, lack of synergy among nations in the region, over dependence on extra regional powers, economic challenges like inequalities, growth challenges, lack of big investment, and technological challenges. There is one promising solution. The Underwater Domain Awareness Framework proposed by Maritime Research Center provides a solution to these challenges and opportunities. Let's understand the UDA framework in its horizontal and vertical construct. Four stakeholders of UDA are maritime security, blue economy, environment and disaster management, and science and technology. The horizontal construct looks at resource availability in terms of technology, infrastructure, capability, and capacity. The vertical construct gives a hierarchy for establishing underwater domain events. Ground level looks at sensing underwater domain for threats, resources, and activities. The second level makes sense of the data gathered for security strategies, conservation, and resource utilization. The third level formulates and monitors regulatory framework at the local, national, and global level. In this way, the underwater domain awareness framework provides a comprehensive way forward for stakeholders to interact and solve multiple challenges being faced by the nation. The group of 20 represents world's major economies, 80% of the world GDP, 75% of global trade, and 60% of the world's population. This year, under the Indonesian presidency, the G20 is focusing on the theme, recover together, recover stronger. The Indonesian presidency has set three pillars for its term. Global health architecture, sustainable energy transition, and digital transformation. The UDF framework proposed by Maritime Research Center talks about pooling of resources and synergizing of efforts across multiple stakeholders such as maritime security, blue economy, disaster management, and science and technology. The three agenda points of the G20 summit meeting are explicitly addressed by the UDA framework as follows. Post the pandemic, the global health architecture has become a prime concern. Fresh water is the most critical component of human survival. UDA will play a key role in real-time monitoring and effective desiltation of the freshwater systems as well as acoustic capacity building for water resource management. The underwater domain is a storehouse of energy with both conventional and unconventional alternate energy sources. The UDA framework will be a significant driver for effective and efficient extraction of these resources for a sustainable energy transition. The UDA framework will play a key role in the digital ocean vision with science and technology leading artificial intelligence, and underwater robotics-based data analytics. UDA aims at achieving effective governance in the Indo-Pacific strategic space through a digital transformation. India will assume the presidency of the G20 for one year, from 1st December 2022 to 30th November 2022. India's presidency at G20 summit would consider introducing the UDA framework for a comprehensive policy and technology intervention with acoustic capacity. The entire Indo-Pacific strategic space can be included for the implementation of the UDA framework, which will allow all the member states to participate enthusiastically and place India in a very good position to play a leadership role in the G20.
The 21st century is witnessing unprecedented strategic interactions in the Indian Ocean region, IOR. The global power play is unfolding in the tropical littoral waters of the IOR. The region is also experiencing dramatic consequences of climate change, including sea level rise and warming ocean temperatures. This plethora of challenges and the regionalism has ensured that the IOR remains underdeveloped. The Indian Ocean Rim Association, IORA, was formally launched at the first ministerial meeting in Mauritius on 6-7 March 1997. It is a dynamic intergovernmental organization aimed at strengthening regional cooperation and sustainable development within the Indian Ocean region through its 23 member states and 10 dialogue partners. The IORA nations need to be extremely creative to appreciate the potential in the region and formulate their strategy to harness the opportunities. The four major broad opportunities are living resources, transportation, petroleum and minerals, along with science and technology. The Underwater Domain Awareness UDA framework proposed by the Maritime Research Center, MRC Pune, progresses the digital oceans construct to ensure good governance across the entire IOR. The transparency as a result of effective realization of the digital oceans will serve all the four stakeholders, namely maritime security, blue economy, environment and disaster management, and also the science and technology providers. The genesis of the UDA Digest was to provide a platform to present the multiple dimensions of the UDA framework. The two-year-old platform has come a long way in generating the body of work to demonstrate the wide spectrum of stakeholders, disciplines, applications, dynamics, and more. Underwater Domain Awareness, UDA, in simple terms, is a desire to know what is happening underwater. The Indian Ocean region, IOR, is of immense strategic importance. Countries in the Indian Ocean region vary in many areas, including economic development, demography, ethnic and sectarian issues, relations with neighboring countries, and more. These challenges are compounded further by the actions of the extra-regional powers. India, as the lead player in the IOR, has a lot at stake. The key is in capacity and capability building. We need pooling of resources and synergizing of effort at national and regional level India must take a lead role in driving underwater domain awareness to realize this vision. UDA Digest has emerged as a platform that is willing to give space for quality content so that we can deliver in a simple yet managed manner. Hi, I'm Nishtha and I am the editor of the UDA Digest eMag. Ever since I took over as the editor of the magazine, I've only seen exponential increase in the leadership of the magazine. Some of the domains under which we expect our experts to write for us are Blue Economy, Underwater Archaeology, Geopolitics and IR, Science and Technology, Maritime Security, Marine Environment, and so on and so forth. Become a part of our UTA Digest community to dive into an underwater adventure coming to your inbox every month. India is home to over 6% of global marine diversity. Over a 7,517 kilometer coastline, Indian oceans have been protecting us for millennia. Now, it's time for us to protect our oceans. Let's start conversations, strive for innovations, and vote for protection of Indian Ocean region. Introducing Marine Time Research Center, Foundation for Underwater Domain Awareness. The concept of the Maritime Research Center, I thought of as a technology-driven think tank, because I feel there is a gap in terms of strategy not being backed by sound technology. And particularly when we talk about the Indian Ocean region, there is uh, significant <coughs> differences 
in our understanding of the underwater domain. And uh, the tropical littoral waters have their very specific challenges which need to be addressed. And that's how I thought of this uh, organization where we are going to be talking, uh, working on the policy, technology and innovation and the human resource development. Because going forward, when we look at the underwater domain awareness framework, it's going to be a huge opening and there's tremendous opportunities that are come, going to come. But to have a coherent and a comprehensive way forward, all the three aspects are important and that's how we are uh, looking at all these things. MRC is driven with a three-pronged mission to engage with decision makers and policy formulators, to facilitate technology and innovation, to spread awareness and start conversations on underwater domain awareness. The underwater domain awareness framework is a concept that touches all the four stakeholders. When we look at the underwater domain, there are security requirements, whether it is internal security or external security. Then there is the blue economic requirement. There's tremendous opportunities uh, in terms of shipping, undersea resources, a whole lot of other things. The third is the environment and the disaster management. That also requires tremendous technologies and also proper policies where they can be addressed effectively. And the fourth is pure science and technology. We all know science and technology will be the driver for all things to come. But specifically having science and technology tailored for the requirement is very, very important. And that's how MRC tries to address the UDA framework in a very, very comprehensive manner. MRC wants to be a nodal agency dealing with the UDA framework. We want to look at all aspects of policy. We want to look at all aspects of technology and innovation. And we also want to be a nodal agency for the human resource, multidisciplinary human resource development. Here, when we look at human resource, we are like looking at two distinct communities, if I may use the word. One is people who are already in the domain, people who are part of the stakeholders. They have a reasonably good understanding of the domain, but they need to be given the right academic backing and the theoretical understanding to, or the research background so that they can contribute. So maybe, you know, stakeholders can go into the policy level with a uh, sound understanding of the uh, domain. Also, we need younger people to come in. I mean, we have, uh, say, a computer science uh, student, how he can apply his computer science understanding into the underwater domain awareness, or an electronic student, how he can apply his understanding in the underwater domain awareness, or even a law student, uh, or a history student, how they can bring value, or a mass communication student, how they can bring value. So we are looking at a multidisciplinary approach and also distinctly kind of uh, make it clear that what they can contribute and what, how they can build a future career in this domain. Twenty first century has seen a decisive shift in the global order. The Indian government has demonstrated significant maritime intent with the Sagar vision of the Honorable Prime Minister. This maritime focus has resulted in multiple mega projects by the government of India. Like the Sagar Malan, Bharat Vini, Inland Water Transport, Multimodal Transport, the Deep Sea Mining Mission, International Seaway Authority allocation. With this strong maritime intent, India is well positioned geographically and geostrategically to play a leadership role in the region. The tropical littoral waters present unimaginable living and non-living undersea resources. The economic opportunities in the Indo-Pacific of the global commons as a facilitator for economic growth are waiting to be explored. It also comes with its fair share of challenges. The Indian Ocean region today is at the risk of facing political challenges like volatility, fragmentation, instability, lack of synergy among nations in the region, over-dependence on extra-regional powers, 
economic challenges like inequalities, growth challenges, lack of big investment, and technological challenges. There is one promising solution. The Underwater Domain Awareness Framework proposed by Maritime Research Center provides a solution to these challenges and opportunities. Let's understand the UDA framework in its horizontal and vertical construct. Four stakeholders of UDA are maritime security, blue economy, environment and disaster management, and science and technology. The horizontal construct looks at resource availability in terms of technology, infrastructure, capability, and capacity. The vertical construct gives a hierarchy for establishing underwater domain events. Ground level looks at sensing underwater domain for threats, resources, and activities. The second level makes sense of the data gathered for security strategies, conservation, and resource utilization plans. The third level formulates and monitors regulatory framework at the local, national, and global level. In this way, the Underwater Domain Awareness Framework provides a comprehensive way forward for stakeholders to interact and solve multiple challenges being faced by the nation. The group of 20 represents world's major economies, 80% of the world GDP, 75% of global trade, and 60% of the world's population. This year, under the Indonesian presidency, the G20 is focusing on the theme, recover together, recover stronger. The Indonesian presidency has set three pillars for its term. Global health architecture, sustainable energy transition, and digital transformation. The UDA framework proposed by Maritime Research Center talks about pooling of resources and synergizing of effort across multiple stakeholders, such as maritime security, blue economy, disaster management, and science and technology. The three agenda points of the G20 summit meeting are explicitly addressed by the UDA framework as follows. Post the pandemic, the global health architecture has become a prime concern. Fresh water is the most critical component of human survival. UDA will play a key role in real-time monitoring and effective desiltation of the freshwater systems as well as acoustic capacity building for water resource management. The underwater domain is a storehouse of energy with both conventional and unconventional alternate energy sources. The UDA framework will be a significant driver for effective and efficient extraction of these resources for a sustainable energy transition. The UDA framework will play a key role in the digital ocean vision with science and technology leading artificial intelligence, and underwater robotics-based data analytics. UDA aims at achieving effective governance in the Indo-Pacific strategic space through a digital transformation. India will assume the presidency of the G20 for one year, from 1st December 2022 to 30th November 2022. India's presidency at G20 summit would consider introducing the UDA framework for a comprehensive policy and technology intervention with acoustic capacity. The entire Indo-Pacific strategic space can be included for the implementation of the UDA framework, which will allow all the member states to participate enthusiastically and place India in a very good position to play a leadership role in the G20. The 21st century is witnessing unprecedented strategic interactions in the Indian Ocean region, IOR. The global power play is unfolding in the tropical littoral waters of the IOR. The region is also experiencing dramatic consequences of climate change, including sea level rise and warming ocean temperatures. This plethora of challenges and the regionalism has ensured that the IOR remains underdeveloped. The Indian Ocean Gym Association, IORA, was formally launched at the first ministerial meeting in Mauritius on 6-7 March 1997. It is a dynamic intergovernmental organization aimed at strengthening regional cooperation and sustainable development within the Indian Ocean region through its 23 member states and 10 dialogue partners. The IORA nations need to be extremely creative to appreciate the potential in the region and formulate their strategy to harness the opportunities. The four major broad opportunities are living resources, transportation, 
petroleum and minerals, along with science and technology. The Underwater Domain Awareness, UDA framework, proposed by the Maritime Research Center, MRC, Pune, progresses the digital oceans construct to ensure good governance across the entire IOR. The transparency as a result of effective realization of the digital oceans will serve all the four stakeholders, namely maritime security, blue economy, environment and disaster management, and also the science and technology providers. The genesis of the UDA Digest was to provide a platform to present the multiple dimensions of the UDA framework. The two-year-old platform has come a long way in generating the body of work to demonstrate the wide spectrum of stakeholders, disciplines, applications, dynamics, and more. Underwater Domain Awareness, UDA, in simple terms, is a desire to know what is happening underwater. The Indian Ocean region, IOR, is of immense strategic importance. Countries in the Indian Ocean region vary in many areas, including economic development, demography, ethnic and sectarian issues, relations with neighboring countries, and more. These challenges are compounded further by the actions of the extra-regional powers. India, as the lead player in the IOR, has a lot at stake. The key is in capacity and capability building. We need pooling of resources and synergizing of effort at national and regional level India must take a lead role in driving underwater domain awareness to realize this vision. UD Digest has emerged as a platform that is willing to give space for quality content so that we can deliver in a simple yet managed manner. Hi, I'm Nishtha and I am the editor of the UD Digest eMac. Ever since I took over as the editor of the magazine, I've only seen exponential increase in the readership of the magazine. Some of the domains under which we expect our experts to write for us are Blue Economy, Underwater Archaeology, Geopolitics and IR, Science and Technology, Maritime Security, Marine Environment, and so on and so forth. Become a part of our UTA Digest community to dive into an underwater adventure coming to your inbox every month. India is home to over 6% of global marine diversity. Over a 7,517 kilometer coastline, Indian oceans have been protecting us for millennia. Now, it's time for us to protect our oceans. Let's start conversations, strive for innovations, and vote for protection of Indian Ocean region. Introducing Marine Time Research Center, Foundation for Underwater Domain Awareness. The concept of the Maritime Research Center, I thought of as a technology-driven think tank, because I feel there is a gap in terms of strategy not being backed by sound technology. And particularly when we talk about the Indian Ocean region, there is uh, significant <coughs> differences in our understanding of the underwater domain. And uh, the tropical littoral waters have their very specific challenges which need to be addressed. And that's how I thought of this uh, organization where we are going to be talking, uh, work, working on the policy technology and innovation and the human resource development. Because going forward, when we look at the underwater domain awareness framework, it's going to be a huge opening and there's tremendous opportunities that are come, going to come. But to have a coherent and a comprehensive way forward, all the three aspects are important and that's how we are uh, looking at all these things. MRC is driven with a three-pronged mission to engage with decision makers and policy formulators to facilitate technology and innovation, to spread awareness and start conversations on underwater domain awareness.
The underwater domain awareness framework is a concept that touches all the four stakeholders. When we look at the underwater domain, there are security requirements, whether it is internal security or external security. Then there is a blue economic requirement. There's tremendous opportunities uh, in terms of shipping, undersea resources, a whole lot of other things. The third is the environment and the disaster management. That also requires tremendous technologies and also proper policies where they can be addressed effectively. And the fourth is pure science and technology. We all know science and technology will be the driver for all things to come. But specifically having science and technology tailored for the requirement is very, very important. And that's how MRC tries to address the UDA framework in a very, very comprehensive manner. Marcy wants to be a nodal agency dealing with the UDA framework. We want to look at all aspects of policy. We want to look at all aspects of technology and innovation. And we also want to be a nodal agency for the human resource, multidisciplinary human resource development. Here, when we look at human resource, we are like looking at two distinct communities, if I may use the word. One is people who are already in the domain, people who are part of the stakeholders. They have a reasonably good understanding of the domain, but they need to be given the right academic backing and the theoretical understanding to, or the research background so that they can contribute. So maybe, you know, stakeholders can go into the policy level with a uh, sound understanding of the uh, domain. Also, we need younger people to come in. I mean, we have, uh, say, a computer science uh, student, how he can apply his computer science understanding into the underwater domain awareness, or an electronic student, how he can apply his understanding in the underwater domain awareness, or even a law student, uh, or a history student, how they can bring value, or a mass communication student, how they can bring value. So we are looking at a multidisciplinary approach and also distinctly kind of uh, make it clear that what they can contribute and what, how they can build a future career in this domain. The 21st century has seen a decisive shift in the global order. The Indian government has demonstrated significant maritime intent with the Sagar vision of the Honorable Prime Minister. This maritime focus has resulted in multiple mega projects by the government of India. Like the Sagar Mala, Bharat Fleet, Inland Water Transport, Multimodal Transport, the Deep Sea Mining Mission, International Seabed Authority allocation. With this strong maritime intent, India is well positioned geographically and geostrategically to play a leadership role in the region. The tropical littoral waters present unimaginable living and non-living undersea resources. The economic opportunities in the Indo-Pacific of the global commons as a facilitator for economic growth are waiting to be explored. It also comes with its fair share of challenges. The Indian Ocean region today is at the risk of facing political challenges like volatility, fragmentation, instability, lack of synergy among nations in the region, over-dependence on extra-regional powers, economic challenges like inequalities, growth challenges, lack of big investment, and technological challenges. There is one promising solution. The Underwater Domain Awareness Framework proposed by Maritime Research Center provides a solution to these challenges and opportunities. Let's understand the UDA framework in its horizontal and vertical construct. Four stakeholders of UDA are maritime security, blue economy, environment and disaster management, and science and technology. The horizontal construct looks at resource availability in terms of technology, infrastructure, capability, and capacity. The vertical construct gives a hierarchy for establishing underwater domain events. Ground level looks at sensing underwater domain for threats, resources, and activities. The second level makes sense of the data gathered for security strategies, conservation, and resource utilization plans. The third level formulates and monitors regulatory framework 
at the local, national, and global level. In this way, the Underwater Domain Awareness Framework provides a comprehensive way forward for stakeholders to interact and solve multiple challenges being faced by the nation today. The group of 20 represents world's major economies, 80% of the world GDP, 75% of global trade, and 60% of the world's population. This year, under the Indonesian presidency, the G20 is focusing on the theme, recover together, recover stronger. The Indonesian presidency has set three pillars for its term, global health architecture, sustainable energy transition, and digital transformation. The UDA framework proposed by Maritime Research Center talks about pooling of resources and synergizing of effort across multiple stakeholders, such as maritime security, new economy, disaster management, and science and technology. The three agenda points of the G20 summit meeting are explicitly addressed by the UDA framework as follows. Post the pandemic, the global health architecture has become a prime concern. Fresh water is the most critical component of human survival. UDA will play a key role in real-time monitoring and effective desiltation of the freshwater systems as well as acoustic capacity building for water resource management. The underwater domain is a storehouse of energy with both conventional and unconventional alternate energy sources. The UDA framework will be a significant driver for effective and efficient extraction of these resources for a sustainable energy transition. The UDA framework will play a key role in the digital ocean vision with science and technology leading artificial intelligence, and underwater robotics-based data analytics. UDA aims at achieving effective governance in the Indo-Pacific strategic space through a digital transformation. India will assume the presidency of the G20 for one year, from 1st December 2022 to 30th November 2022. India's presidency at G20 summit would consider introducing the UDA framework for a comprehensive policy and technology intervention with acoustic capacity. The entire Indo-Pacific strategic space can be included for the implementation of the UDA framework, which will allow all the member states to participate enthusiastically and place India in a very good position to play a leadership role in the G20. The 21st century is witnessing unprecedented strategic interactions in the Indian Ocean region, IOR. The global power play is unfolding in the tropical littoral waters of the IOR. The region is also experiencing dramatic consequences of climate change, including sea level rise and warming ocean temperatures. This plethora of challenges and the regionalism has ensured that the IOR remains underdeveloped. The Indian Ocean Rim Association, IORA, was formally launched at the first ministerial meeting in Mauritius on 6-7 March 1997. It is a dynamic intergovernmental organization aimed at strengthening regional cooperation and sustainable development within the Indian Ocean region through its 23 member states and 10 dialogue partners. The IORA nations need to be extremely creative to appreciate the potential in the region and formulate their strategy to harness the opportunities. The four major broad opportunities are living resources, transportation, petroleum and minerals, along with science and technology. The Underwater Domain Awareness, UDA framework, proposed by the Maritime Research Center, MRC, Pune, progresses the digital oceans construct to ensure good governance across the entire IOR. The transparency as a result of effective realization of the digital oceans will serve all the four stakeholders, namely maritime security, blue economy, environment and disaster management, and also the science and technology providers. The genesis of the UDA Digest was to provide a platform to present the multiple dimensions of the UDA framework 
The two-year-old platform has come a long way in generating the body of work to demonstrate the wide spectrum of stakeholders, disciplines, applications, dynamics, and more. Underwater domain awareness, UDA, in simple terms, is a desire to know what is happening underwater. The Indian Ocean region, IOR, is of immense strategic importance. Countries in the Indian Ocean region vary in many areas, including economic development, demography, ethnic and sectarian issues, relations with neighboring countries, and more. These challenges are compounded further by the actions of the extra-regional powers. India, as the lead player in the IOR, has a lot at stake. The key is in capacity and capability building. We need pooling of resources and synergizing of effort at national and regional level. India must take a lead role in driving underwater domain awareness to realize this vision. UD Digest has emerged as a platform that is willing to give space for quality content so that we can deliver in a simple yet managed manner. Hi, I'm Nishtha and I am the editor of the UD Digest eMap. Ever since I took over as the editor of the magazine, I've only seen exponential increase in the leadership of the magazine. Some of the domains under which we expect our experts to write for us are blue economy, underwater archaeology, geopolitics and IR, science and technology, maritime security, marine environment, and so on and so forth. Become a part of our UTA Digest community to dive into an underwater adventure coming to your inbox every month. India is home to over 6% of global marine diversity. Over a 7,517 kilometer coastline, Indian oceans have been protecting us for millennia. Now, it's time for us to protect our oceans. Let's start conversations, strive for innovations, and vote for protection of Indian Ocean region. Introducing Marine Time Research Center, Foundation for Underwater Domain Awareness. The concept of the Maritime Research Center, I thought of as a technology-driven think tank, because I feel there is a gap in terms of strategy not being backed by sound technology. And particularly when we talk about the Indian Ocean region, there is uh, significant <coughs> differences in our understanding of the underwater domain. And uh, the tropical littoral waters have their very specific challenges which need to be addressed. And that's how I thought of this uh, organization where we are going to be talking, uh, work, working on the policy technology and innovation and the human resource development. Because going forward, when we look at the underwater domain awareness framework, it's going to be a huge opening and there's tremendous opportunities that are come, going to come. But to have a coherent and a comprehensive way forward, all the three aspects are important and that's how we are uh, looking at all these things. MRC is driven with a three-pronged mission to engage with decision makers and policy formulators to facilitate technology and innovation, to spread awareness and start conversations on underwater domain awareness. The underwater domain awareness framework is a concept that touches all the four stakeholders. When you look at the underwater domain, there are security requirements, whether it is internal security or external security. Then there is the blue economic requirement. There's tremendous opportunities uh, in terms of shipping, undersea resources, a whole lot of other things. The third is the environment and the disaster management. That also requires tremendous technologies and also proper policies where they can be addressed effectively. And the fourth is pure science and technology. We all know science and technology will be the driver for all things to come. But specifically having science and technology tailored for the requirement is very, very important. And that's how MRC tries to address the UDA framework in a very, very comprehensive manner. MRC wants to be a nodal agency dealing with the UDA framework. 
we want to look at all aspects of policy. We want to look at all aspects of technology and innovation. And we also want to be a nodal agency for the human resource, multidisciplinary human resource development. Here, when we look at human resource, we are like looking at two distinct communities, if I may use the word. One is people who are already in the domain, people who are part of the stakeholders. They have a reasonably good understanding of the domain, but they need to be given the right academic backing and the theoretical understanding to, or the research background so that they can contribute. So maybe, you know, stakeholders can go into the policy level with a uh, uh, sound understanding of the uh, domain. Also, we need younger people to come in. I mean, we have, uh, say, a computer science uh, student, how he can apply his computer science understanding into the underwater domain awareness, or an electronic student, how he can apply his understanding in the underwater domain awareness, or even a law student, uh, or a history student, how they can bring value, or a mass communication student, how they can bring value. So we are looking at a multidisciplinary approach, and also distinctly, kind of uh, make it clear that what they can contribute and what, how they can build a future career in this domain. The 21st century has seen a decisive shift in the global order. The Indian government has demonstrated significant maritime intent with the Sagar vision of the Honorable Prime Minister. This maritime focus has resulted in multiple mega projects by the government of India. Like the Sagar Mala, Bharat Wheel, Inland Water Transport, Multimodal Transport, the Deep Sea Mining Mission, International Seabed Authority allocation. With this strong maritime intent, India is well positioned geographically and geostrategically to play a leadership role in the region. The tropical littoral waters present unimaginable living and non-living undersea resources. The economic opportunities in the Indo-Pacific of the global commons as a facilitator for economic growth are waiting to be explored. It also comes with its fair share of challenges. The Indian Ocean region today is at the risk of facing Political challenges like volatility, fragmentation, instability, lack of synergy among nations in the region, over dependence on extra regional powers, economic challenges like inequalities, growth challenges, lack of big investment, and technological challenges. There is one promising solution. The underwater domain awareness framework proposed by Maritime Research Center provides a solution to these challenges and opportunities. Let's understand the UDA framework in its horizontal and vertical construct. Four stakeholders of UDA are maritime security, blue economy, environment and disaster management, and science and technology. The horizontal construct looks at resource availability in terms of technology, infrastructure, capability, and capacity. The vertical construct gives a hierarchy for establishing underwater domain events. Ground level looks at sensing underwater domain for threats, resources, and activities. The second level makes sense of the data gathered for security strategies, conservation, and resource utilization plans. The third level formulates and monitors regulatory framework at the local, national, and global level. In this way, the underwater domain awareness framework provides a comprehensive way forward for stakeholders to interact and solve multiple challenges being faced by the nation. The group of 20 represents world's major economies, 80% of the world GDP, 75% of global trade, and 60% of the world's population. This year, under the Indonesian presidency, the G20 is focusing on the theme, recover together, recover stronger. The Indonesian presidency has set three pillars for its term. Global health architecture, sustainable energy transition, and digital transformation. The UDA framework proposed by Maritime Research Center talks about pooling of resources and synergizing of effort 
across multiple stakeholders, such as maritime security, blue economy, disaster management, and science and technology. The three agenda points of the G20 summit meeting are explicitly addressed by the UDA framework as follows. Post the pandemic, the global health architecture has become a prime concern. Fresh water is the most critical component of human survival. UDA will play a key role in real-time monitoring and effective desiltation of the freshwater systems, as well as acoustic capacity building for water resource management. The underwater domain is a storehouse of energy with both conventional and unconventional alternate energy sources. The UDA framework will be a significant driver for effective and efficient extraction of these resources for a sustainable energy transition. The UDA framework will play a key role in the digital ocean vision, with science and technology leading, artificial intelligence, and underwater robotics-based data analytics. UDA aims at achieving effective governance in the Indo-Pacific strategic space through a digital transformation. India will assume the presidency of the G20 for one year, from 1st December 2022 to 30th November 2022. India's presidency at G20 summit would consider introducing the UDA framework for a comprehensive policy and technology intervention with acoustic capacity. The entire Indo-Pacific strategic space can be included for the implementation of the UDA framework, which will allow all the member states to participate enthusiastically and place India in a very good position to play a leadership role at the G20. The 21st century is witnessing unprecedented strategic interactions in the Indian Ocean region, IOR. The global power play is unfolding in the tropical littoral waters of the IOR. The region is also experiencing dramatic consequences of climate change, including sea level rise and warming ocean temperatures. This plethora of challenges and the regionalism has ensured that the IOR remains underdeveloped. The Indian Ocean Rim Association, IORA, was formally launched at the first ministerial meeting in Mauritius on 6-7 March 1997. It is a dynamic intergovernmental organization aimed at strengthening regional cooperation and sustainable development within the Indian Ocean region through its 23 member states and 10 dialogue partners. The IORA nations need to be extremely creative to appreciate the potential in the region and formulate their strategy to harness the opportunities. The four major broad opportunities are living resources, transportation, petroleum and minerals, along with science and technology. The underwater domain awareness, UDA framework, proposed by the Maritime Research Center, MRC, Pune, progresses the digital oceans construct to ensure good governance across the entire IOR. The transparency as a result of effective realization of the digital oceans will serve all the four stakeholders, namely maritime security, blue economy, environment and disaster management, and also the science and technology providers. The genesis of the UDA Digest was to provide a platform to present the multiple dimensions of the UDA framework. The two-year-old platform has come a long way in generating the body of work to demonstrate the wide spectrum of stakeholders, disciplines, applications, dynamics, and more. Underwater Domain Awareness, UDA, in simple terms, is a desire to know what is happening underwater. The Indian Ocean region, IOR, is of immense strategic importance. Countries in the Indian Ocean region vary in many areas, including economic development, demography, ethnic and sectarian issues, relations with neighboring countries, and more. These challenges are compounded further by the actions of the extra-regional powers. India, as the lead player in the IOR, has a lot at stake. The key is in capacity and capability building. We need pooling of resources and synergizing of effort at national and regional level India must take a lead role in driving underwater domain awareness to realize this vision. 
UD Digest has emerged as a platform that is willing to give space for quality content so that we can deliver in a simple yet humanist manner. Hi, I'm Nishtha, and I am the editor of the UD Digest e Mac. Ever since I took over as the editor of the magazine, I've only seen exponential increase in the readership of the magazine. Some of the domains under which we expect our experts to write for us are blue economy, underwater archaeology, geopolitics and IR, science and technology, maritime security, marine environment, and so on and so forth. Become a part of our UTA Digest community to dive into an underwater adventure coming to your inbox every month. India is home to over 6% of global marine diversity. Over a 7,517 kilometer coastline, Indian oceans have been protecting us for millennia. Now, it's time for us to protect our oceans. Let's start conversations, strive for innovations, and vote for protection of Indian Ocean region. Introducing Marine Time Research Center, Foundation for Underwater Domain Awareness. The concept of the Maritime Research Center, I thought of as a technology-driven think tank, because I feel there is a gap in terms of strategy not being backed by sound technology. And particularly when we talk about the Indian Ocean region, there is uh, significant <coughs> differences in our understanding of the underwater domain. And uh, the tropical littoral waters have their very specific challenges which need to be addressed. And that's how I thought of this uh, organization where we are going to be talking, uh, work, working on the policy technology and innovation and the human resource development. Because going forward, when we look at the underwater domain awareness framework, it's going to be a huge opening and there's tremendous opportunities that are come, going to come. But to have a coherent and a comprehensive way forward, all the three aspects are important and that's how we are uh, looking at all these things. MRC is driven with a three-pronged mission to engage with decision makers and policy formulators to facilitate technology and innovation, to spread awareness and start conversations on underwater domain awareness. The underwater domain awareness framework is a concept that touches all the four stakeholders. When you look at the underwater domain, there are security requirements, whether it is internal security or external security. Then there is the blue economic requirement. There's tremendous opportunities uh, in terms of shipping, undersea resources, a whole lot of other things. The third is the environment and the disaster management. That also requires tremendous technologies and also proper policies where they can be addressed effectively. And the fourth is pure science and technology. We all know science and technology will be the driver for all things to come. But specifically having science and technology tailored for the requirement is very, very important. And that's how MRC tries to address the UDA framework in a very, very comprehensive manner. MRC wants to be a nodal agency dealing with the UDA framework. We want to look at all aspects of policy. We want to look at all aspects of technology and innovation. And we also want to be a nodal agency for the human resource, multidisciplinary human resource development. Here, when we look at human resource, we are like looking at two distinct communities, if I may use the word. One is people who are already in the domain, people who are part of the stakeholders. They have a reasonably good understanding of the domain, but they need to be given the right academic backing and the theoretical understanding to, or the research background so that they can contribute. So maybe, you know, stakeholders can go into the policy level with a uh, sound understanding of the uh, domain. Also, we need younger people to come in. 
I mean, we have, uh, say, a computer science uh, student, how he can apply his computer science understanding into the underwater domain awareness, or an electronic student, how he can apply his understanding in the underwater domain awareness, or even a law student, uh, or a history student, how they can bring value, or a mass communication student, how they can bring value. So we are looking at a multidisciplinary approach and also distinctly kind of uh, make it clear that what they can contribute and what, how they can build a future career in this domain. The 21st century has seen a decisive shift in the global order. The Indian government has demonstrated significant maritime intent with the Sagar vision of the Honorable Prime Minister. This maritime focus has resulted in multiple mega projects by the government of India. Like the Sagar Mala, Bharat Vee, Inland Water Transport, Multimodal Transport, the Deep Sea Mining Mission, International Seaway Authority allocation. With this strong maritime intent, India is well positioned geographically and geostrategically to play a leadership role in the region. The tropical littoral waters present unimaginable living and non-living undersea resources. The economic opportunities in the Indo-Pacific of the global commons as a facilitator for economic growth are waiting to be explored. It also comes with its fair share of challenges. The Indian Ocean region today is at the risk of facing Political challenges like volatility, fragmentation, instability, lack of synergy among nations in the region, over-dependence on extra-regional powers, economic challenges like inequalities, growth challenges, lack of big investment, and technological challenges. There is one promising solution. The Underwater Domain Awareness Framework proposed by Maritime Research Center provides Let's understand the UDA framework in its horizontal and vertical construct. Four stakeholders of UDA are maritime security, blue economy, environment and disaster management, and science and technology. The horizontal construct looks at resource availability in terms of technology, infrastructure, capability, and capacity. The vertical construct gives a hierarchy for establishing underwater domain events. Ground level looks at sensing underwater domain for threats, resources, and activities. The second level makes sense of the data gathered for security strategies, conservation, and resource utilization plans. The third level formulates and monitors regulatory framework at the local, national, and global level. In this way, the underwater domain awareness framework provides a comprehensive way forward for stakeholders to interact and solve multiple challenges being faced by the nation. The group of 20 represents world's major economies, 80% of the world GDP, 75% of global trade, and 60% of the world's population. This year, under the Indonesian presidency, the G20 is focusing on the theme, recover together, recover stronger. The Indonesian presidency has set three pillars for its term. Global health architecture, sustainable energy transition, and digital transformation. The UDA framework proposed by Maritime Research Center talks about pooling of resources and synergizing of effort across multiple stakeholders, such as maritime security, blue economy, disaster management, and science and technology. The three agenda points of the G20 summit meeting are explicitly addressed by the UDA framework as follows. Post the pandemic, the global health architecture has become a prime concern. Fresh water is the most critical component of human survival. UDA will play a key role in real-time monitoring and effective desiltation of the freshwater systems as well as acoustic capacity building for water resource management. The underwater domain is a storehouse of energy with both conventional and unconventional alternate energy sources. The UDA framework will be a significant driver for effective and efficient extraction of these resources for a sustainable energy transition. The UDA framework will play a key role in the digital ocean vision with science and technology leading. 
artificial intelligence, and underwater robotics based data analytics. UDA aims at achieving effective governance in the Indo Pacific strategic space through a digital transformation. India will assume the presidency of the G20 for one year, from 1st December 2022 to 30th November 2022. India's presidency at G20 summit could consider introducing the UDA framework for a comprehensive policy and technology intervention with acoustic capacity. The entire Indo Pacific strategic space can be included for the implementation of the UDA framework, which will allow all the member states to participate enthusiastically and place India in a very good position to play a leadership role in the G20. The 21st century is witnessing unprecedented strategic interactions in the Indian Ocean region, IOR. The global power play is unfolding in the tropical littoral waters of the IOR. The region is also experiencing dramatic consequences of climate change, including sea level rise and warming ocean temperatures. This plethora of challenges and the regionalism has ensured that the IOR remains underdeveloped. The Indian Ocean Rim Association, IORA, was formally launched at the first ministerial meeting in Mauritius on 6-7 March 1997. It is a dynamic intergovernmental organization aimed at strengthening regional cooperation and sustainable development within the Indian Ocean region through its 23 member states and 10 dialogue partners. The IORA nations need to be extremely creative to appreciate the potential in the region and formulate their strategy to harness the opportunities. The four major broad opportunities are living resources, transportation, petroleum and minerals, along with science and technology. The underwater domain awareness, UDA framework, proposed by the Maritime Research Center, MRC, Pune, progresses the digital oceans construct to ensure good governance across the entire IOR. The transparency as a result of effective realization of the digital oceans will serve all the four stakeholders, namely maritime security, blue economy, environment and disaster management, and also the science and technology providers. The genesis of the UDA Digest was to provide a platform to present the multiple dimensions of the UDA framework. The two-year-old platform has come a long way in generating the body of work to demonstrate the wide spectrum of stakeholders, disciplines, applications, dynamics, and more. Underwater Domain Awareness, UDA, in simple terms, is a desire to know what is happening underwater. The Indian Ocean region, IOR, is of immense strategic importance. Countries in the Indian Ocean region vary in many areas, including economic development, demography, ethnic and sectarian issues, relations with neighboring countries, and more. These challenges are compounded further by the actions of the extra-regional powers. India, as the lead player in the IOR, has a lot at stake. The key is in capacity and capability building. We need pooling of resources and synergizing of effort at national and regional level India must take a lead role in driving underwater domain awareness to realize this vision. UDA Digest has emerged as a platform that is willing to give space for quality content so that we can deliver in a simple yet managed manner. Hi, I'm Nishtha and I am the editor of the UDA Digest e -Mac. Ever since I took over as the editor of the magazine, I've only seen exponential increase in the leadership of the magazine. Some of the domains under which we expect our experts to write for us are Blue economy, underwater archaeology, geopolitics and IR, science and technology, maritime security, marine environment, and so on and so forth. Become a part of our UTA Digest community to dive into an underwater adventure coming to your inbox every month.
मेहुल थोड़ा बाहर देख लो और कोई है तो बुला लो Okay, welcome back. <clears throat> As per the program, we had Mr. Panchal uh, was supposed to speak on innovation and IP protection, but he is unwell, so he could manage to attend the panel discussion in the morning. So I will take this session on answering some of the questions that I have gathered, but I will be happy to take more questions. let us look at the uda framework as such in the larger global perspective how it has evolved over the last 100 years and some of our interactions now both at the national level and at the global level now if you look at the larger uda initiative it was in the cold war period after the second world war when the entire global community was divided into the two superpowers right that time the requirement was that they wanted to engage their adversary as far away from their territory as possible so between the americans and the russians it was the greenland iceland uk gap which became the theater of operation submarines had started emerging at that point so underwater domain awareness became a very very important requirement so one of the <clears throat> biggest investment at that time was the socio system sound surveillance system that was of the bahamas right what was it it was a basically a underwater sensor network it was a highly top secret project you have to look at it from all the three dimension political economic and military dimension what was the political dimension we were at war so as far as strategic security is concerned there is no questions asked the political leadership could approve any project in the name of national security are you with me on this neither environmental questions are asked nor economic questions or you know the funding now if you look at the whole american and the russian system that was the time they spend almost in finite amount of resources for military technology later on all these things were available i mean like kavra uh, talwelkar also mentioned the internet is all because of the military requirement your gas turbines aviation came because of military requirement so a lot of investments happened and you must also keep into account that during the uh, second world war the americans made tons of money because of their unique positioning geo strategically and geopolitically at that time and they developed that military complex military industry complex at that time and after the war when they did not require enough people for the military these people went on to build their military industry and the whole economy is based on that but then they started putting in so much of money if you remember towards the end of the cold war it was just about who blinks first if the russians could have withstood for a little longer americans would have fallen because they had become completely bankrupt so during the cold war couple of very important things happened socios was a beginning of a large it came out about in 1948 it started right and there was another infrastructure called the point sur lighthouse which was a basically an underwater lab set up by naval postgraduate school montere 
It was a complete underwater lab that they had set up in the Californian coast, and they used to do all kinds of testing there. The SOSUS was the beginning of the entire underwater sensor network project that started, and you know, later on they had almost 30 such stations. They the names kept on changing, but they had almost 30 stations like that across various locations. But slowly they started. So initially, SOSUS was a completely top secret project. Even some people in the Navy didn't know that such a facility existed. It was that kind of top secret project. But in the mid-60s, there was a very funny incident that happened. One of the captains on duty there, he reported airy sound coming out of the system. So they called, somebody called Roger Pine, who was a marine biologist, to come and give some advice. That's the time, first time they called somebody from outside. He was in the university. Roger Pine investigated this and found out that it was humpback whale sound. Humpback whale is a very unique creature. I mean, the whales have, you know, very well-structured notes of sound that they generate. And they sing for the, I mean, the males sing for the females 30 minutes or even an hour. So inadvertently, they involved him and he told, uh, sold 30 million copies of that recording. And this is the first time, which is a, the other side of underwater domain awareness. They realized, you know, what kind of sound. So this became a very big asset in terms of, and you imagine 24 hours, 24 seven, this data getting recorded, but they did not have the bandwidth to analyze the data. Data was just coming. Even social data is available today also for analysis and 90% has not been analyzed completely. It is only case to case basis. So we want to analyze this, but when data is coming, we can analyze it in a, and of course there was computational power was also not available then. And they started setting up. So this was one aspect of it. The second part is then sometime in 1984, the point sur facility had to be shut down. They have given multiple reasons, but it became economically unviable to actually maintain a facility, exclusive facility like that. And it had to be shut down. Socius, towards the end, there was no upgradation possible. So towards the late, uh, early 80s, out of 30 that was there during the peak of you know, 60s, it came down to three functional facilities. Because these things cost money. The other aspect is after the Cold War ended in 1991, the first thing that happened was the environmentalists also started getting heavy on the US Navy. In 1994, there was an incident in the coast of Greece, Kaprioska Beach, there were 17 beaked whale strandings. The people tried to push back, but still seven of them died on the beach. And this becomes a very big focusing event. Now, there's a public opinion that gets created. So there was a Greek marine biologist called Francis, Antonio Francis. He wrote a paper in Nature after a year that this stranding was because of sonar trials by the NATO forces. This was a sonar developed by the US Navy being tested on a NATO ship off the coast of Kaprioska. And this became a major focusing event. Focusing event is an event which creates a significant amount of public opinion that the political leadership is forced to take action. So this was one of the major focusing event in terms of underwater noise. NRDC went to court. NRDC and an NGO in the US, they went to court and they forced the US Navy, they were obviously gunning for a complete ban on such sonar, sonar trials, but they could manage to get significant funding 
for research. The American president had to use his special powers to avoid any ban on sonar trials. You just see the period, it was post-Cold War. The whole political climate was different. You understand what I'm saying? So that is what we need to understand. Politics becomes, we had a lecture by Professor Anamika Barua on the first day of the first workshop. And she talked about, there is always, I mean, there is nothing like economics. There's always a political economy. So politics will, politics of the time will have a major bearing on decision making also. The American Navy had to be very cautious. The other uh, event was the Surtas LFA, low frequency active. This was another system the American Navy had developed for monitoring. I mean, after the Soshus, it came down to Surtas and then it became Todere. So they used to use active frequency, low frequency active. They used to keep the whole area illuminated so that if there is any intrusion by the Russian submarines in the region, they would get. Surtas LFA was forced to submit an environment impact statement in 94. Can you imagine the US Navy being forced to submit an environment impact statement? And that is the beginning of a monitoring by the environmental scope. There was another system called ATOC, Acoustic Thermometry of the Ocean. This was a low frequency system developed by the US Navy. They start, uh, first deployed it in the, they had a different name earlier and then they, they deployed in the Hawaii region. When you use very low frequency, you can detect up to thousands of kilometers. The real reason, as many of us understand, is any monitoring, any underwater monitoring. But what this tried to tell the world is to basically detect global warming. Well, underwater sound is very sensitive to the temperature, right? As I said, one degree centigrade change makes 4.6 meters per second difference in the sound speed. But this is extremely harmful for marine mammals, marine creatures. If you constantly subject them to radiation, what are you doing? So ATOC also had to be slowly withdrawn after a point of time. So that was the changing scenario in terms of, you know, Understanding. So when we were proposing the underwater domain awareness framework, our effort is to bring all the stakeholders together. And particularly when you talk about democracies, the political leadership in a democracy has to balance a lot of socio-economic and socio-cultural and socio-political also factors. To say that strategic security needs I mean, that's why, you know, in India also, in many other countries, sometimes it is a very frustrating effort for the naval leadership to get a certain projects passed. Because the leadership has to balance various other things. Because it's a democracy, next time they have to get elected. But the same case in the US also, that's also a democracy. So as a political scientist, you have to understand the whole crux of the dynamics of the present era. Now, after the Cold War ended, in a decade's time, the American establishment realized that the Chinese have developed significant underwater capabilities in terms of submarines and other things. And now they have to have a presence in the South China Sea. So in 2000, University of Washington and five other universities of the US were asked by the Office of Naval Research to develop capabilities in the South China Sea and East China Sea. Because if the American establishment comes down, then it will create a lot of diplomatic backlash. 
So University of Washington and five other universities in the US got together to plan the entire modeling and simulation in South China Sea and East China Sea. Because they had no idea before that. And as I said, the tropical waters are different. So they, they took some time and then what they initiated what is called an Asia X. You can Google Asia X. Asia X took more than three years or four years of data collection in the South China Sea. And so in the first phase, these six universities got together to do the entire modeling. But when they had to do the field validation of the model, they needed local support. So altogether, 20 universities, including these six universities, came together to start what is called Asia X. They collected data for more than four years. Again, the problem of computational infrastructure, computational backing, they could not really do the analysis of the entire thing, but there is a lot of data. Even 2006, when I was in IIT Delhi, James Miller and various other, Peter Dahl and all these guys had come down from US to meet us and they wanted data analytics support. 2019, I was in Brest in France, University of Brest. The French have sensors in the central Indian Ocean. The French have the maximum EZ in the Indian Ocean. How many of you know this? Right? Right? So, but they have these sensors, they're collecting data. They say they are monitoring marine mammals. University of Brest is tasked to do the data analytics. So I met those folks there and they needed help in terms of data analytics. They don't have people, they don't have the kind of intelligentsia that our people have. So what I realized is that the global community needs significant amount of support from India, even for these kind of efforts. It is easy to collect data. You can put sensor data, and once you put sensors, 24-7 data will keep coming. And it makes no sense to collect data like that. The best way is you have a plan. You go out, collect data, come back and analyze. You know what are the mistakes you have done in terms of the planning of the entire design of data collection. There are various places, uh, ways you can go wrong. And once you have sorted that out, then you go to, again for data collection. Otherwise, there's tons of data they have collected and they don't know what to do with it. And of course, they and between 2003 or four to now, what kind of computational advancements we have. AI is a 10-year-old or 15-year-old phenomena, right? Deep learning is even lesser than that. And now we are talking about quantum computing and a whole lot of other things. So what I'm trying to say is that we are in a better time now. We don't have to exactly do what they have done, but we can do something better than that. We have lessons to learn from what they have done and what where they have gone wrong. But we also have the advantage of the excellent human resource that we have. We can put thousands of engineers with a specific problem and they can give us a good amount of returns that we want. And the entire UDA can be looked at in a very different way. So <clears throat> Asia X itself was another big UDA initiative in the South China Sea. Now you look at the Chinese perspective. Asia X, we had multiple Chinese universities which have participated in Asia X. I've interacted with few of them. I was in 2016, I attended Oceans for the first time. First time mainland China hosted uh, Oceans. Ocean is the biggest uh, underwater conference that happens in the world. Once a year it is in uh, US and once a year, it is outside of US. Last year, we hosted in India, Oceans, first time. So in 2016, Ch Shanghai hosted 
oceans and I was there. Two very interesting interactions I had. I went around asking people, why did you participate in Asia X? The Chinese were very clear. In 2000, we did not have the capability to do an experiment of this size. So we wanted to learn. It was not that they didn't know that Americans are here to collect data. And if you look at it, so many Chinese naval officers and their DRDO equivalent, they have gone to University of Washington to get their master's and PhD. But they have a very clear brief to go and come back and contribute. They are sponsored by the government. They come back and set up things here. In 2015, China announced what is called an underwater Great Wall project. And what was the underwater Great Wall project? It was something similar to Point Sur in California. And if you look at what they announced in 2015, that is an effort of minimum 20, 25 years. So they had embarked on a plan way back. And they had been developing. And in fact, when I was in Singapore in 2015, 16, they were very regularly interacting with our lab to set up a complete underwater lab. I mean, the Great Wall was a work in progress, but they had achieved a lot of capabilities. And they were open to collaboration. But till 2015, they did not speak a word. 2016, when President Trump, look at the sequence of events. When President Trump was a president-elect those 20 days, China had captured a US drone deployed by USS Bowditch. They captured it, kept it for three days and returned it. Capturing a drone is actually a infringement into the sovereignty. Right? I mean, naval officers know this. And Trump, as a president elect, was not president, he was president elect, he had to break silence and speak. He used this exact word infringement on the American sovereignty. And the Chinese just said, he released it. And that was a declaration that, and yes, after that Asia X in 2003, four Americans adopted underwater drones as a regular part of the American Navy operations. And every cruise in the South China Sea and East China Sea, because after Asia X, they needed continuous data flow to keep on updating their models and the validation. And the Chinese were fully aware of it. So they wanted to tell in 2015, once they had declared underwater Great Wall project, and that was a change in the whole geopolitical scenario. China was no more emerging, it had emerged. And if you remember after 2016, all this talk about freedom of navigation and all that started, it became very aggressive. So there is a continuous link of UDA capabilities. And China has gone in multiple ways. They deploy fishing fleets of the size of 300, 400, up to 500 fishing boats. A carrier battle group cannot cross that, right? So they have developed various other, and they had a massive restructuring of the armed forces some 20 years back, right? And all the people were laterally shifted to these, play I mean, they are, their fishing boats are not like fishing boats, they are far more capable, not only in terms of their endurance, but even in terms of what they carry. So there is a complete chain of events which we must understand. But I am not aware of something like Asia X. 
it's called a swamp swallow shallow water measurement acoustic measurement exercise we need swamps in the indian ocean region it has to be of a scale that can give you data of some relevance and that cannot be done without the support of the big powers because we cannot we don't have the ability to do it at a scale which they have done so that is the larger journey somehow you know we have not invested in the kind of modeling see you cannot many times i have seen i don't want to name organizations that if the user says i want x they said give me data but can you collect data like that data is actual real data is supposed to be used for validation i have a model like i showed you that underwater radiated noise spatio temporal map that i showed you for the entire indian ocean region can you collect and it is a spatio temporal spatially can you collect data in every point temporally can you collect uh, data uh, of all the points how do you do it you make a model you test the model on those critical points and if that model is fine then you have faith in this model so you give a certain confidence level on this model and then for anything whether it is a naval deployment or any non naval deployment you can use it suppose maybe your coast guard says you know the top commander says that we need to deploy assets in x location sitting here your system should tell you what is the condition in that location or if you say we are planning for a deployment after 3 months or 2 months or whatever your system should be able to give you your model should be able to run and tell you what will be the situation then and based on that plus minus a little bit you plan today even for sonar trials we don't know what we are doing even to plan i mean there's a technical officer here if you have x sonar to be tried before you plan the trial don't you think we must find out what will be the condition and what is the predicted performance and plus minus that is acceptable but we have no plan only because we don't have the tool for that plan but the sonar performance as we know in the tropical conditions will have a huge variation depending on the conditions do we have a system where we take into account all the possible conditions so based on this we make a plan and what is required for sonar trial snr data and channel model y of n is equal to x of n convolution h of n plus w of n that's a simple formula so if you can predict w of n and you can predict h of n x of n is known so what is the spectrum of y of n we need to establish if we can do that we are doing well otherwise we go out to sail a ship is not a joke to sail a submarine is not a joke I mean, my ex officer friends will know, uh, will uh, bear with me. It takes so much. I mean, there are plans already there. If you have to deviate from that plan, it is so very difficult for my operational plan. And you are not prepared for that deviation. You are going blind. It cannot happen like that. Even. for any other purpose also whether it is environment forget i'm not talking about navy here i'm no more part of the navy but i'm saying even for a environmental monitoring exercise if you have to go out 
Don't you think you need to know what, what are you going to encounter there? And it is easy to do to, in today's world. Real-time computations are easily available. We don't, nowadays you don't have to buy supercomputers at all. You can hire computational, my team does not, uh, they go on the cloud and do the uh, computation. So it's very much easy, that's what I'm saying. But of course, if it is a strategic requirement, you cannot use that. For that you can spend money. I mean, to have a dedicated thing, and for that, I don't think we have shortage of resources. But for proving the concept for an organization like us, we do it like that. And the ecosystem provides you for that. Like even Venkat said, you can go on the cloud and do even quantum, and for that also, you don't need any specialization. If you know Python, you can do that. Python is known by every young youngster in the college knows Python. So today the tools are available, you have to just know how to use it. More than you, even that is not required. You have to know what you want. If you know what you want, how to do it is possible. So the larger picture is now going forward. Whatever I could envisage. One is, there is, I feel there's a disconnect between user academy and industry, right? So the National Skill Development Corporation, NSDC, has this thing of sector skill councils. So we have proposed for setting up a sector skill council on the underwater domain awareness framework. This brings all the industry together. So we have been backed by the Maratha Chamber in Pune, and now it has gone to FIKI. Uh, to the NSDC. In fact, this time we were supposed to have the CEO of the NSDC, but he could not attend at the, but at least he's aware of us. And I'm also part of the FIKI task force, so we are going to push it from there also. But now I think we have a convincing enough case, but it has to go through their process. And at a certain level, there is a reasonable coherence that such a thing is required. Even just to support the Sagar vision of the Honorable Prime Minister also, it is very much part of that whole thing. And because now we are, why NSDC is important? Because they have a complete, see, there is no point creating new instruments. There are already enough instruments in the whole government governance mechanism. You just need to pick up the Rhine's instrument and make them come together or, you know, connect those modules. Because government is also looking at now exporting skilling and knowledge to the region. So NSDC already has certain mechanisms of reaching out to the entire IORA and the BIMSTEC and various other forums. Even to ASEAN, they have been a hackathon on, not on underwater, but there have been hackathons for the ASEAN countries also. Ministry of Education has an innovation cell and they have done hackathons at that level. So we just want to use that framework to propagate UDA. We are in talk with various agencies and we are hoping that we'll be able to do that. So that is one framework. The second is, now if you have to make a policy change, you have to get the entire policy making mechanism to know what is UDA and we have to reach out. So now we are embarking on a twofold thing. One is we are making 10, initially 10 different e-learning modules to cover, because if you say UDA, there is communities, coastal communities and riverine communities. There is fisheries and the entire fishing ministry itself, fisheries ministry itself. Then there is strategic security is one aspect. Then there is sustainable blue economy is one aspect. So we've identified 10 different such stakeholders and we are, we are working on e-learning modules for that. And once we have done the initial uh, first level, then we'll go into the details of it. So so that you know, it becomes a thing and it will be, it will be hosted on the IGOT platform of the Capacity Building Commission. The second is they are also supporting us to do workshops with the stakeholders. So 10 has been approved now, but it will basically go on in a more aggressive manner. We are also in April, we are likely to host the Honorable Minister, who's Minister PMO, he is also Minister 
for Ministry of Earth Sciences and Ministry of Science and Technology. So M uh, Ministry of Science and Technology already DST has multiple funding uh, opportunities and we just need to align itself and all the secretaries of these ministries will be attending that. It will be a one day workshop that we are doing in Delhi in April. So that is one aspect to sensitize the whole ecosystem. And I think Defense Secretary will also be there for that and to make sure that we are able to re, uh, we are a, uh, heard by the right people. And the series of things, we also made a detailed report on which we were tasked by the Niti Aayog because Niti Aayog is a think tank for the government of India. So Niti Aayog commissioned a report. For, uh, uh, I mean, they asked us to make a report on what should be the whole of nation capacity and capability plan to take UDA forward. So in that, see, there are instruments called the Inter-University Center. Under the University Grants Commission, there are eight IUCs that are available. Four are in education itself. Your NAC and all these things are also one of the IUCs. And there are four physical IUCs that have been set up. One is on material sciences. One is in nuclear sciences. One is in Ahmedabad, one is in Delhi. Uh, sorry, one is in Indore and one is in <laughs> Delhi. Now, recently, uh, uh, IUC has been set up. Uh, so, the third one is on in Pune itself, in Pune University, on astronomy and astrophysics. And the fourth one is on yogic sciences, which have been recently set up in Bangalore. I did have an interaction with the chairman of the Parliamentary Committee on Education, and he even tweeted this. That I had a discussion with Arnab on setting up an IUC on underwater. But while I was doing this Niti Aayog report, I realized that the whole uniqueness of the different stakeholders that we are talking about, whether it is traditional knowledge, whether it is coastal community, whether it is coastal governance, whether it is uh, strategic security or sustainable blue economy, if we put everything together, it will lose the uniqueness or even inland water transport. It will lose the uniqueness uh, of everything and you know it, we may not achieve what we want. So in that report, I said there has to be a diversity versus consolidation debate. And let the policy maker be aware of what it is. And you know they are <coughs> trying to. So that is an ongoing discussion. I hope soon there will be some decision on that. And that report is now being circulated to various ministries. It has gone to MOD also. It, it has gone to MOES also. And we are awaiting the response. We reached out to the MEA to have a series of workshops like this for Iora countries. I mean, the Indo-Pacific division of the MEA has processed this. They took comments from MOD and MOES, and both of them have, MOD said that we must be invited as observers. We obviously want them to, but that was the only comment they came, and they said, please go ahead. MEA cannot take on anything without the um, uh, line ministries on board. And MOES, in a one line, said that this is of importance, and we should go ahead with that. So now we are working out. There are 23 IORA countries. Out of that, 18 are ITEC countries. ITEC are the countries which are supported under the ITEC program. ITEC is technology and <coughs> economics. Uh, Government of India funds participants from these nations to come and attend workshops. So that process is on, and hopefully May or June, we may have that as well. So we'll get a reach to these countries and we will be able to, the way you all have come, we want to reach out to the larger international or the regional community. And at some point, we also want to look at certain policy making in the region. One case which is already on is the underwater noise factor. So already we have a project from the International Maritime Organization on managing the shipping noise itself. But I have re I'm reaching out to the government to say that instead of just following what IMO is saying, under the Sagar vision, like, let us take it up in a little bigger scale and cover various other aspects because small island is a very big issue. The, I was in Sri Lanka and I realized I had meetings with everybody, even the naval uh, top leadership of the Navy, the former CDS from Sri Lanka has come on our platform. He is even, if you go to our UDA Digest platform, he has written an article for us. So they are quite keen to get 
support from us on that. We have an MOU with Pathfinder. Based on their inv invitation, I was there. But I could, what I could sense is that there is a lot we can contribute to them. And it gives me a confidence, you know, even like in India, you can see that there are gaps which we can definitely fill up. So, so many of these countries, we can do a lot to make sure that they can build their capacity. And we are very clear that we are not going to touch their data. We are not going to touch any of their strategic security. Uh, you know, uh, I mean, we are not going to share or not going to touch their strategic security data also, any classified data. I mean, even if by mistake something happens from there and we should not be even blamed for it. So we are going to work on a very, very clear model where their classified data remains with them I mean, we are very clear as MRC and NDT that we are not going to touch your classified data at all. We'll build a mechanism where the data remains with you. We will help you run our algorithms, use your data through our platform, but we will not try to even take access to the data. And this is very reassuring for many countries because uh, like there is an <clears throat> Indian Ocean Commission, which is led by the French. India is an observer. Now we have reluctantly got into it as an observer. And we are driving Indian Ocean Rim Association. Both are for the same region, but we don't talk to each other. IOC has set up a complete set, uh, thing in Mauritius. I met the IOC Secretary General. And he said that French have given us some machines, they don't work. And we have no bandwidth to make them work. Can you do something about it? I said, we can do, but now, I'm an Indian, working in India. Although I'm a private agency, legally I don't need permission, but it may not be correct for me to do that. So I discussed with, MEA and they said, you better stay away. I said, okay. But largely what I'm trying to say is that is huge requirement for capacity and capability building in the region. And why I'm saying this to the young people is that this is an opportunity for all of you to be part of this journey and take advantage of this journey. The whole global community is I was in Europe in December, I went to UNESCO, I went to EU, DG Mayor, uh, Director General Maritime Affairs. I went and saw various ocean innovation hubs in Europe. And everywhere I could see that there is a huge opportunity for us to contribute. Europeans are very good at heavy engineering something which requires a lot of investment, they're very good at it. But what they are lack is the human resource. And I think we have in abundance. We just need to be a little more focused and acquire the right kind of skills. So we see that as an opportunity to make a difference and contribute. So, largely speaking, Definitely there is seriousness in the country, but a bit of direction is required, which at least I'm happy that government is very open to discussion. I mean, if you look at our first workshop, we had Secretary of Capacity Building Commission who came and spent two days with us. We had a lot of senior people coming on, uh, down to Pune to discuss. We are keen to take things forward and we are happy that there is a huge difference in the way they are approaching things. A lot of our cases are now getting, Ministry of Earth Sciences has signed an MOU with us. We are very excited to contribute to the larger deep ocean mission and capacity building for the deep ocean mission. In fact, I had an opportunity to interact with the Secretary General of the International Seabird Authority also. And they are also facing this challenge that many countries, now see, it has to be so many countries which have to come be part of this whole International Seabed Authority's initiative of deep sea mining. But even policy makers do not understand the challenges that exist. So they are also in talks with us 
to build capacity on that front. So we are working with three UN agencies. UNESCO has asked us to set up a center of excellence in to support Africa and South Asia. Again, in Africa also, if you look at many countries, there are even landlocked, landlocked, uh, landlocked countries which have got uh, huge freshwater bodies. And there's a lot that they need to do. Now, even talking about with the increasing maritime activity, underwater search and recovery. I'm using the word recovery in a very, very <clears throat> focused thing because rescue is only 48 hours, right? There won't be any survivor beyond that. But if we have to take the maritime activity seriously, any accident has to first analyze. Whether there's an aircraft going down or a surface platform going on or even an AUV getting lost at sea. I mean, now with so many activities, so many AUVs will be deployed, right? We have to recover and do a postmortem to understand what went wrong. We can't just forget about it. But if you look at the AN32 that went down in 2016 and various other accidents, we could not even recover it. Now, it's very basic. If right now, if we are sitting here and somebody tells us that there is an aircraft which has ditched at so and so place, what is your course of action from now? You have to mobilize assets. Do you know what assets to mobilize? Depending on what is the depth, depending on what is the condition there, whether it is a surface craft or a subsurface craft to be deployed with what kind of payload it has to be deployed, there has to be some SOPs, right? Now, from the time that we have got the report that at so-and-so coordinates, uh, a craft has ditched or whatever accident has happened, is that asset going to wait or target going to wait for us? And the mobilization will take at least three to four days. Right? Everybody is with me on that. What has happened to the target in that three days? Where do we start the search and what kind of search will we initiate? What assets will be mobilized? Don't you think these are important questions to answer? Do we, I mean, in the that is the tactical part. From a strategic part, do we have those resources? Do we have those assets? Now, to say what we have to do, we need some data. Is that data available? If I say I want X data, will the organization that is supposed to give you that data will respond? It has to be a seamless thing. No, you press off a button, that data should be available to you. So there are certain policy interventions that are required. What kind of MOUs or what kind of, because it has to be a absolute automatic reaction to what is required. And moment you take your cursor, if I have the position in this place, moment I take the cursor, there should be a drop down menu to say, if there is a search required here, this is the asset that you need to deploy. Are you with me? Is it difficult to do? In today's world, that is possible. And once you say that assets are required, is it available with you? Is it available with your partner organization? Or do you need to find a partner? Is it available in the country or is it available outside? Don't you think somebody has to really understand that and put it into an SOP? Even for the data, what drift, what are the currents, what are the local conditions at that point, Incois has all the data. But do we have an MOU with them on this? Does it, is there a mechanism that seamlessly that data will come to you? Or do you have a setup which will 
receive the data and start processing it. So there is a lot of, so there is an issue of policy intervention. Policy intervention also includes SOPs, best practices. You can't tell the officer, duty officer at MOC to just start reacting, no? He has to have an SOP. He has to have best, best practices because everything can't be as per SOP, but what is it? Does he have the kind of training that is required? What kind of technology intervention is required? What kind of computational framework that is required? What kind of data inputs that will be required? And is it that mechanism, is it there? And how will that get transmitted to the operational team, which has to be mobilized? Are they standby or is there a mechanism to put them in standby in some way? Is it available within the organization or does it have to, does it need support from the partner organizations? So there's a lot of work to be done there. Even in terms of your underwater pollution monitoring, do we have the complete wherewithal to monitor the status? Do we have sensors? I mean, anything underwater requires to see, to understand, and to share. Do we have the sensor or the platform which can be, it can be even some boys which can be thrown and you can get the data. I mean, mom moment there is an oil spill case. If you have those sensors and the boys ready, an aircraft can go and drop them. The way you we drop uh, sono boys, it's possible to go and drop them. and collect the data and it can be made available. What are the short term and long term impact can be assessed? Oil spill is not the only problem. There are many other problems which need to be taken into account. So are we prepared for all of it? So there is a lot one can do and one can build on. And right from policy interventions to technology, even, I mean, no, like you heard, this is part of MSP also. You heard Sanskar yesterday. The legal framework is also important, no? Have you thought through and do you have the permissions from all the authorities with whom, I mean, Ministry of Environment also has to be involved in this. Are the certain acts of parliament aligned to this requirement or not? That has to be analyzed. And many times, some of the acts are in conflict with each other and it can get sorted out. But somebody has to take it up and discuss it at the top level. Then at the local level, what are the local agencies you will involve? And do you have the mandate to involve them? They have to be also looked at. And then issue of SOP and all that has to be looked at. So, and then capacity building, your own internal capacity building. Is it part of the regular tra training programs that you run. People have to be aware, otherwise it will come like a shock. People will be completely un unprepared for it. So that is a larger spectrum of things that we need to do, to look at. Any questions? Sir, during the course of your presentation, you mentioned that uh, not only for matlab, various other countries in IOR, that in case if you have to indulge with those countries and, uh, you know, without, because what happens is any data underwater becomes, uh, you know, uh, people are uh, spectral about sharing that particular information. So if you do set up a model, if you give it to them and at the same time to give them the assurance that this will be totally classified. I mean, how do you uh, intend going ahead with this? No, see, if 
if we have to work with another country, there are two things. One is if it's a government driven, then MEA has to be involved. Then it has to be part of the track one and track two or track 2.5 people. Some people say there is nothing called track 2.5 or 3, but people have their own definition. For the youngsters, track one is absolutely government to government interactions. Track 1.5 is along with the government officials, some non government people like, say, a person like me, or if it is related to my subject, I can accompany them and be part of that meeting. So it is called 1.5. Or track 2 can be that government says MRC, go and talk and come out with a whatever thing. Or it could be a group of individuals can go, that is also 2.5 or something like that. Or sometimes you don't want officially to own up and you can send some people to discuss and if something positive emerges, then the government takes ownership and do things. But the other part is MRC as an individual private agency can also go and do certain things. We can provide consultancy to countries where they are completely assured that MRC is, is an, a private entity and they will not be. See, the problem with MDA has been that it is outright security driven thing. And that's why, you know, when you drive, I mean, Ambassador Mudgal was here when Sagar Vision was declared in Mauritius. He advised the government to keep it more focused on blue economy rather than completely strategic security. See that, see smaller countries will always be worried about being completely taken, taken over by a bigger power. Like, I don't know if I've told you, yeah, I think I've not discussed with you. Last Quad Summit in Tokyo, they declared two major things. One is data sharing for larger public good. And the second is Indo-Pacific Economic Forum. Now, many of us have written, even I've written, if you go through, what is data sharing for public good? in the entire Indo-Pacific region. It's a very big statement to make, we'll share data. Aapke pocket mein data hai, aap de doge kisi ko? There is a, where is the mechanism for data sharing? The mechanism is there are eight data centers, including our IMAC. There is one in Solomon Island driven by Australia and all that, you know, there are eight data centers. You can go through my paper. All of them are military driven. Do these data center understand what is public good? When we say public good, we are talking about supporting the communities. Do these centers understand what is public good? The second is, are they open to sharing data? And when I'm saying open to sharing data, you have to have a calibrated approach. What is shareable and what is not? You have to have an SOP. Do we have that? I mean, in my time in the Navy, every piece of data was top secret. Yes. Any organization, I was in underwater ranges, any data in underwater ranges is top secret. Then where is the question of data sharing? But according to me, every piece of data cannot be top secret. So have we made a mechanism where we can distinguish or calibrate what is top secret, what is secret, what is classified, what is unclassified? Then only you can say this much can be shared. Otherwise, this is just a lofty announcement at the summit level. It's funny if you read some of the articles I've quoted also, if you read, the analysts have really made fun of. It's very irresponsible when global leaders come together and make such announcements, which is not doable. Quad 
US, Japan, Australia, India. So many of these summit level declarations are said to be high level parties because nothing comes out of it. It makes no sense. I mean, that's why other countries in the region have no faith in the leadership. Because it doesn't match up with the reality down below, right? And the other aspect of it is who's going to provide the data? Hawkeye 360 is a comp US company which has collected a lot of satellite data. It is a business opportunity for a US firm. It's not I'm saying, it's, it's available in literature. So you are actually using global forums to market your own companies. Is it acceptable to a smaller country? It's not. So are they going to accept your leadership? I mean, it's like you are making a not-for-profit entity and saying, well, you'll back-channel commercial activity through that. So all this has been discussed. Hawkeye 360 is going to be, because they have invested big time, they want return on investment, so this is a route. So those are the issues we need to really be aware of to make sure that we really understand what is being said and what is being done in the garb of global leadership. And that's why the US hegemon is now declining and if and people know what is the capability that is available today to support such announcements. Any more questions? No questions? Okay. So I hope I have answered some of your questions. So we will we'll, yeah, okay. Okay, thank you. We'll break for tea and then we'll come back for the next session. Thank you. India is home to over 6% of global marine diversity. Over a 7,517 kilometer coastline, Indian oceans have been protecting us for millennia. Now, it's time for us to protect our oceans. Let's start conversations, strive for innovations, and vote for protection of Indian Ocean region. Introducing Marine Time Research Center, Foundation for Underwater Domain Awareness. The concept of the Maritime Research Center, I thought of as a technology-driven think tank, because I feel there is a gap in terms of strategy not being backed by sound technology. And particularly when we talk about the Indian Ocean region, there is uh, significant <coughs> differences in our understanding of the underwater domain. And uh, the tropical littoral waters have their very specific challenges which need to be addressed. And that's how I thought of this uh, organization where we are going to be talking, uh, work, working on the policy technology and innovation and the human resource development. Because going forward, when we look at the underwater domain awareness framework, it's going to be a huge opening and there's tremendous opportunities that are come, going to come. But to have a coherent and a comprehensive way forward, all the three aspects are important and that's how we are 
looking at all these things. MRC is driven with a three-pronged mission to engage with decision makers and policy formulators, to facilitate technology and innovation, to spread awareness and start conversations on underwater domain awareness. The underwater domain awareness framework is a concept that touches all the four stakeholders. When we look at the underwater domain, there are security requirements, whether it is internal security or external security. Then there is the blue economic requirement. There's tremendous opportunities uh, in terms of shipping, undersea resources, a whole lot of other things. The third is the environment and the disaster management. That also requires tremendous technologies and also proper policies where they can be addressed effectively. And the fourth is pure science and technology. We all know science and technology will be the driver for all things to come. But specifically having science and technology tailored for the requirement is very, very important. And that's how MRC tries to address the UDA framework in a very, very comprehensive manner. MRC wants to be a nodal agency dealing with the UDA framework. We want to look at all aspects of policy. We want to look at all aspects of technology and innovation. And we also want to be a nodal agency for the human resource, multidisciplinary human resource development. Here, when we look at human resource, we are like looking at two distinct communities, if I may use the word. One is people who are already in the domain, people who are part of the stakeholders. They have a reasonably good understanding of the domain, but they need to be given the right academic backing and the theoretical understanding or the research background so that they can contribute. So maybe, you know, stakeholders can go into the policy level with a uh, sound understanding of the uh, domain. Also, we need younger people to come in. I mean, we have, uh, say, a computer science uh, student, how he can apply his computer science understanding into the underwater domain awareness, or an electronic student, how he can apply his understanding in the underwater domain awareness, or even a law student, uh, or a history student, how they can bring value, or a mass communication student, how they can bring value. So we are looking at a multidisciplinary approach and also distinctly kind of uh, make it clear that what they can contribute and what, how they can build a future career in this domain. Twenty first century has seen a decisive shift in the global order. The Indian government has demonstrated significant maritime intent with the Sagar vision of the Honorable Prime Minister. This maritime focus has resulted in multiple mega projects by the government of India, like the Sagar Mala, Bharat Mail, Inland Water Transport, Multimodal Transport, the Deep Sea Mining Mission, International Seabed Authority allocation. With this strong maritime intent, India is well positioned geographically and geostrategically to play a leadership role in the region. The tropical littoral waters present unimaginable living and non-living undersea resources. The economic opportunities in the Indo-Pacific of the global commons as a facilitator for economic growth are waiting to be explored. It also comes with its fair share of challenges. The Indian Ocean region today is at the risk of facing political challenges like volatility, fragmentation, instability, lack of synergy among nations in the region, over-dependence on extra-regional powers, economic challenges like inequalities, growth challenges, lack of big investment, and technological challenges. There is one promising solution. The Underwater Domain Awareness Framework proposed by Maritime Research Centre provides a solution to these challenges and opportunities. Let's understand the UDA framework in its horizontal and vertical construct. Four stakeholders of UDA are maritime security, blue economy, environment and disaster management, and science and technology. The horizontal construct looks at resource availability in terms of technology, infrastructure, 
capability and capacity. The vertical construct gives a hierarchy for establishing underwater domain events. Ground level looks at sensing underwater domain for threats, resources, and activities. The second level makes sense of the data gathered for security strategies, conservation, and resource utilization plans. The third level formulates and monitors regulatory framework at the local, national, and global level. In this way, the underwater domain awareness framework provides a comprehensive way forward for stakeholders to interact and solve multiple challenges being faced by the nation. The group of 20 represents world's major economies, 80% of the world GDP, 75% of global trade, and 60% of the world's population. This year, under the Indonesian presidency, the G20 is focusing on the theme, recover together, recover stronger. The Indonesian presidency has set three pillars for its term. Global health architecture, sustainable energy transition, and digital transformation. The UDA framework proposed by Maritime Research Center talks about pooling of resources and synergizing of efforts across multiple stakeholders, such as maritime security, blue economy, disaster management, and science and technology. The three agenda points of the G20 summit meeting are explicitly addressed by the UDA framework as follows. Post the pandemic, the global health architecture has become a prime concern. Fresh water is the most critical component of human survival. UDA will play a key role in real-time monitoring and effective desiltation of the freshwater systems, as well as acoustic capacity building for water resource management. The underwater domain is a storehouse of energy with both conventional and unconventional alternate energy sources. The UDA framework will be a significant driver for effective and efficient extraction of these resources for a sustainable energy transition. The UDA framework will play a key role in the digital ocean vision through science and technology leading, artificial intelligence, and underwater robotics-based data analytics. UDA aims at achieving effective governance in the Indo-Pacific strategic space through a digital transformation. India will assume the presidency of the G20 for one year, from 1st December 2022 to 30th November 2022. India's presidency at G20 summit would consider introducing the UDA framework for a comprehensive policy and technology intervention with acoustic capacity. The entire Indo-Pacific strategic space can be included for the implementation of the UDA framework, which will allow all the member states to participate enthusiastically and place India in a very good position to play a leadership role at the G20. The 21st century is witnessing unprecedented strategic interactions in the Indian Ocean region, IOR. The global power play is unfolding in the tropical littoral waters of the IOR. The region is also experiencing dramatic consequences of climate change, including sea level rise and warming ocean temperatures. This plethora of challenges and the regionalism has ensured that the IOR remains underdeveloped. The Indian Ocean Rim Association, IORA, was formally launched at the first ministerial meeting in Mauritius on 6-7 March 1997. It is a dynamic intergovernmental organization aimed at strengthening regional cooperation and sustainable development within the Indian Ocean region through its 23 member states and 10 dialogue partners. The IORA nations need to be extremely creative to appreciate the potential in the region and formulate their strategy to harness the opportunities. The four major broad opportunities are living resources, transportation, petroleum and minerals, along with science and technology. The Underwater Domain Awareness UDA framework proposed by the Maritime Research Center, MRC, Pune, progresses the digital oceans construct to ensure good governance across the entire IOR. The transparency as a result of effective realization of the digital oceans will serve all the four stakeholders, namely maritime security, blue economy, environment and disaster management, and also the science and technology providers.
The genesis of the UDA Digest was to provide a platform to present the multiple dimensions of the UDA framework. The two-year-old platform has come a long way in generating the body of work to demonstrate the wide spectrum of stakeholders, disciplines, applications, dynamics, and more. Underwater domain awareness, UDA, in simple terms, is a desire to know what is happening underwater. The Indian Ocean region, IOR, is of immense strategic importance. Countries in the Indian Ocean region vary in many areas, including economic development, demography, ethnic and sectarian issues, relations with neighboring countries, and more. These challenges are compounded further by the actions of the extra-regional powers. India, as the lead player in the IOR, has a lot at stake. The key is in capacity and capability building. We need pooling of resources and synergizing of effort at national and regional level. India must take a lead role in driving underwater domain awareness to realize this vision. UD Digest has emerged as a platform that is willing to give space for quality content so that we can deliver in a simple yet managed manner. Hi, I'm Nishtha and I am the editor of the UDA Digest, the Mac. Ever since I took over as the editor of the magazine, I've only seen exponential increase in the leadership of the magazine. Some of the domains under which we expect our experts to write for us are Blue Economy, Underwater Archaeology, Geopolitics and IR, Science and Technology, Maritime Security, Marine Environment, and so on and so forth. Become a part of our UTA Digest community to dive into an underwater adventure coming to your inbox every month. India is home to over 6% of global marine diversity. Over a 7,517 kilometer coastline, Indian oceans have been protecting us for millennia. Now, it's time for us to protect our oceans. Let's start conversations, strive for innovations, and vote for protection of Indian Ocean region. Introducing Marine Time Research Center, Foundation for Underwater Domain Awareness. The concept of the Maritime Research Center, I thought of as a technology-driven think tank, because I feel there is a gap in terms of strategy not being backed by sound technology. And particularly when we talk about the Indian Ocean region, there is uh, significant <coughs> differences in our understanding of the underwater domain. And uh, the tropical littoral waters have their very specific challenges which need to be addressed. And that's how I thought of this uh, organization where we are going to be talking, uh, work, working on the policy technology and innovation and the human resource development. Because going forward, when we look at the underwater domain awareness framework, it's going to be a huge opening and there's tremendous opportunities that are come, going to come. But to have a coherent and a comprehensive way forward, all the three aspects are important and that's how we are uh, looking at all these things. MRC is driven with a three-pronged mission to engage with decision makers and policy formulators to facilitate technology and innovation, to spread awareness and start conversations on underwater domain awareness. The underwater domain awareness framework is a concept that touches all the four stakeholders. When we look at the underwater domain, there are security requirements, whether it is internal security or external security. Then there is the blue economic requirement. There's tremendous opportunities uh, in terms of shipping, undersea resources, a whole lot of other things. The third is the environment and the disaster management. That also requires tremendous technologies and also proper policies where they can be addressed effectively. And the fourth is pure science and technology. We all know science and technology will be the driver for all things to come. But specifically having science and technology tailored for the requirement is very, very important. And that's how MRC tries to address the UDA framework in a very, very comprehensive manner.
Marsi wants to be a nodal agency dealing with the UDA framework. We want to look at all aspects of policy. We want to look at all aspects of technology and innovation. And we also want to be a nodal agency for the human resource, multidisciplinary human resource development. Here, when we look at human resource, we are like looking at two distinct communities, if I may use the word. One is people who are already in the domain, people who are part of the stakeholders. They have a reasonably good understanding of the domain, but they need to be given the right academic backing and the theoretical understanding to, or the research background so that they can contribute. So maybe, you know, stakeholders can go into the policy level with a uh, uh, sound understanding of the uh, domain. Also, we need younger people to come in. I mean, we have, uh, say, a computer science uh, student, how he can apply his computer science understanding into the underwater domain awareness, or an electronic student, how he can apply his understanding in the underwater domain awareness, or even a law student, uh, or a history student, how they can bring value, or a mass communication student, how they can bring value. So we are looking at a multidisciplinary approach and also distinctly kind of uh, make it clear that what they can contribute and what, how they can build a future career in this domain. The 21st century has seen a decisive shift in the global order. The Indian government has demonstrated significant maritime intent with the Sagar vision of the Honorable Prime Minister. This maritime focus has resulted in multiple mega projects by the government of India. Like the Sagar Malan, Bharat Vini, Inland Water Transport, Multimodal Transport, the Deep Sea Mining Mission, International Seabed Authority or Location. With this strong maritime intent, India is well positioned geographically and geostrategically to play a leadership role in the region. The tropical littoral waters present unimaginable living and non-living undersea resources. The economic opportunities in the Indo-Pacific of the global commons as a facilitator for economic growth are waiting to be explored. It also comes with its fair share of challenges. The Indian Ocean region today is at the risk of facing Political challenges like volatility, fragmentation, instability, lack of synergy among nations in the region, over dependence on extra regional powers, economic challenges like inequalities, growth challenges, lack of big investment, and technological challenges. There is one promising solution. The Underwater Domain Awareness Framework proposed by Maritime Research Center provides a solution to these challenges and opportunities. Let's understand the UDA framework in its horizontal and vertical construct. Four stakeholders of UDA are maritime security, blue economy, environment and disaster management, and science and technology. The horizontal construct looks at resource availability in terms of technology, infrastructure, capability, and capacity. The vertical construct gives a hierarchy for establishing underwater domain events. Ground level looks at sensing underwater domain for threats, resources, and activities. The second level makes sense of the data gathered for security strategies, conservation, and resource utilization. The third level formulates and monitors regulatory framework at the local, national, and global level. In this way, the underwater domain awareness framework provides a comprehensive way forward for stakeholders to interact and solve multiple challenges being faced by the nation today. The group of 20 represents world's major economies, 80% of the world GDP, 75% of global trade, and 60% of the world's population. This year, under the Indonesian presidency, the G20 is focusing on the theme, recover together, recover stronger. The Indonesian presidency has set three pillars for its term. Global health architecture, sustainable energy transition, and digital transformation. The UDA framework proposed by Maritime Research Center talks about pooling of resources and synergizing of effort 
across multiple stakeholders, such as maritime security, blue economy, disaster management, and science and technology. The three agenda points of the G20 summit meeting are explicitly addressed by the UDA framework as follows. Post the pandemic, the global health architecture has become a prime concern. Fresh water is the most critical component of human survival. UDA will play a key role in real-time monitoring and effective desilitation of the freshwater systems, as well as acoustic capacity building for water resource management. The underwater domain is a storehouse of energy with both conventional and unconventional alternate energy sources. The UDA framework will be a significant driver for effective and efficient extraction of these resources for a sustainable energy transition. The UDA framework will play a key role in the digital ocean vision with science and technology leading, artificial intelligence and underwater robotics-based data analytics. UDA aims at achieving effective governance in the Indo-Pacific strategic space through a digital transformation. India will assume the presidency of the G20 for one year, from 1st December 2022 to 30th November 2022. India's presidency at G20 summit would consider introducing the UDA framework for a comprehensive policy and technology intervention with acoustic capacity. The entire Indo-Pacific strategic space can be included for the implementation of the UDA framework, which will allow all the member states to participate enthusiastically and place India in a very good position to play a leadership role in the G20. The 21st century is witnessing unprecedented strategic interactions in the Indian Ocean region, IOR. The global power play is unfolding in the tropical littoral waters of the IOR. The region is also experiencing dramatic consequences of climate change, including sea level rise and warming ocean temperatures. This plethora of challenges and the regionalism has ensured that the IOR remains underdeveloped. The Indian Ocean Rim Association, IORA, was formally launched at the first ministerial meeting in Mauritius on 6-7 March 1997. It is a dynamic intergovernmental organization aimed at strengthening regional cooperation and sustainable development within the Indian Ocean region through its 23 member states and 10 dialogue partners. The IORA nations need to be extremely creative to appreciate the potential in the region and formulate their strategy to harness the opportunities. The four major broad opportunities are living resources, transportation, petroleum and minerals, along with science and technology. The Underwater Domain Awareness, UDA framework proposed by the Maritime Research Center, MRC, Pune, progresses the digital oceans construct to ensure good governance across the entire IOR. The transparency as a result of effective realization of the digital oceans will serve all the four stakeholders, namely maritime security, blue economy, environment and disaster management, and also the science and technology providers. The genesis of the UDA Digest was to provide a platform to present the multiple dimensions of the UDA framework. The two-year-old platform has come a long way in generating the body of work to demonstrate the wide spectrum of stakeholders, disciplines, applications, dynamics, and more. Underwater Domain Awareness, UDA, in simple terms, is a desire to know what is happening underwater. The Indian Ocean region, IOR, is of immense strategic importance. Countries in the Indian Ocean region vary in many areas, including economic development, demography, ethnic and sectarian issues, relations with neighboring countries, and more. These challenges are compounded further by the actions of the extra-regional powers. India, as the lead player in the IOR, has a lot at stake. The key is in capacity and capability building. We need pooling of resources and synergizing of effort at national and regional level India must take a lead role in driving underwater domain awareness to realize this vision. 
UD Digest has emerged as a platform that is willing to give space for quality content so that we can deliver in a simple yet nuanced manner. Hi, I'm Nishtha and I am the editor of the UD Digest eMag. Ever since I took over as the editor of the magazine, I've only seen exponential increase in the readership of the magazine. Some of the domains under which we expect our experts to write for us are blue economy, underwater archaeology, geopolitics and IR, science and technology, maritime security, marine environment, and so on and so forth. Become a part of our UTA Digest community to dive into an underwater adventure coming to your inbox every month. India is home to over 6% of global marine diversity. Over a 7,517 kilometer coastline, Indian oceans have been protecting us for millennia. Now, it's time for us to protect our oceans. Let's start conversations, strive for innovations, and vote for protection of Indian Ocean region. Introducing Marine Time Research Center, Foundation for Underwater Domain Awareness. The concept of the Maritime Research Center, I thought of as a technology-driven think tank, because I feel there is a gap in terms of strategy not being backed by sound technology. And particularly when we talk about the Indian Ocean region, there is uh, significant <coughs> differences in our understanding of the underwater domain. And uh, the tropical littoral waters have their very specific challenges which need to be addressed. And that's how I thought of this organization where we are going to be talking, uh, work, working on the policy technology and innovation and the human resource development. Because going forward, when we look at the underwater domain awareness framework, it's going to be a huge opening and there's tremendous opportunities that are come, going to come. But to have a coherent and a comprehensive way forward, all the three aspects are important and that's how we are uh, looking at all these things. MRC is driven with a three-pronged mission to engage with decision makers and policy formulators to facilitate technology and innovation, to spread awareness and start conversations on underwater domain awareness. The underwater domain awareness framework is a concept that touches all the four stakeholders. When we look at the underwater domain, there are security requirements, whether it is internal security or external security. Then there is the blue economic requirement. There's tremendous opportunities uh, in terms of shipping, undersea resources, a whole lot of other things. The third is the environment and the disaster management. That also requires tremendous technologies and also proper policies where they can be addressed effectively. And the fourth is pure science and technology. We all know science and technology will be the driver for all things to come. But specifically having science and technology tailored for the requirement is very, very important. And that's how MRC tries to address the UDA framework in a very, very comprehensive manner. MRC wants to be a nodal agency dealing with the UDA framework. We want to look at all aspects of policy. We want to look at all aspects of technology and innovation. And we also want to be a nodal agency for the human resource, multidisciplinary human resource development. Here, when we look at human resource, we are like looking at two distinct communities, if I may use the word. One is people who are already in the domain, people who are part of the stakeholders. They have a reasonably good understanding of the domain, but they need to be given the right academic backing and the theoretical understanding to, or the research background so that they can contribute. So maybe, you know, stakeholders can go into the policy level with a uh, sound understanding of the uh, domain. Also, we need younger people to come in. 
I mean, we have, uh, say, a computer science uh, student, how he can apply his computer science understanding into the underwater domain awareness, or an electronic student, how he can apply his understanding in the underwater domain awareness, or even a law student, uh, or a history student, how they can bring value, or a mass communication student, how they can bring value. So we are looking at a multidisciplinary approach and also distinctly kind of uh, make it clear that what they can contribute and what, how they can build a future career in this domain. The 21st century has seen a decisive shift in the global order. The Indian government has demonstrated significant maritime intent with the Sagar vision of the Honorable Prime Minister. This maritime focus has resulted in multiple mega projects by the government of India. Like the Sagar Mala, Bharat Wheel, Inland Water Transport, Multimodal Transport, the Deep Sea Mining Mission, International Seabed Authority allocation. With this strong maritime intent, India is well positioned geographically and geostrategically to play a leadership role in the region. The tropical littoral waters present unimaginable living and non-living undersea resources. The economic opportunities in the Indo-Pacific of the global commons as a facilitator for economic growth are waiting to be explored. It also comes with its fair share of challenges. The Indian Ocean region today is at the risk of facing Political challenges like volatility, fragmentation, instability, lack of synergy among nations in the region, over-dependence on extra-regional powers, economic challenges like inequalities, growth challenges, lack of big investment, and technological challenges. There is one promising solution. The Underwater Domain Awareness Framework proposed by Maritime Research Centre provides a solution to these challenges and opportunities. Let's understand the UDA framework in its horizontal and vertical construct. Four stakeholders of UDA are maritime security, blue economy, environment and disaster management, and science and technology. The horizontal construct looks at resource availability in terms of technology, infrastructure, capability, and capacity. The vertical construct gives a hierarchy for establishing underwater domain events. Ground level looks at sensing underwater domain for threats, resources, and activities. The second level makes sense of the data gathered for security strategies, conservation, and resource utilization plans. The third level formulates and monitors regulatory framework at the local, national, and global level. In this way, the underwater domain awareness framework provides a comprehensive way forward for stakeholders to interact and solve multiple challenges being faced by the nation. The group of 20 represents world's major economies, 80% of the world GDP, 75% of global trade, and 60% of the world's population. This year, under the Indonesian presidency, the G20 is focusing on the theme, recover together, recover stronger. The Indonesian presidency has set three pillars for its term. Global health architecture, sustainable energy transition, and digital transformation. The UDA framework proposed by Maritime Research Center talks about pooling of resources and synergizing of effort across multiple stakeholders, such as maritime security, new economy, disaster management, and science and technology. The three agenda points of the G20 summit meeting are explicitly addressed by the UDA framework as follows. Post the pandemic, the global health architecture has become a prime concern. Fresh water is the most critical component of human survival. UDA will play a key role in real-time monitoring and effective desilitation of the freshwater systems as well as acoustic capacity building for water resource management. The underwater domain is a storehouse of energy with both conventional and unconventional alternate energy sources. The UDA framework will be a significant driver for effective and efficient extraction of these resources for a sustainable energy transition. The UDA framework will play a key role in the digital ocean vision through science and technology leading. 
artificial intelligence, and underwater robotics based data analytics. UDA aims at achieving effective governance in the Indo Pacific strategic space through a digital transformation. India will assume the presidency of the G20 for one year from 1st December 2022 to 30th November 2023. India's presidency at G20 summit would consider introducing the UDA framework for a comprehensive policy and technology intervention with acoustic capacity. The entire Indo Pacific strategic space can be included for the implementation of the UDA framework, which will allow all the member states to participate enthusiastically and place India in a very good position to play a leadership role in the G20. The 21st century is witnessing unprecedented strategic interactions in the Indian Ocean region, IOR. The global power play is unfolding in the tropical littoral waters of the IOR. The region is also experiencing dramatic consequences of climate change, including sea level rise and warming ocean temperatures. This plethora of challenges and the regionalism has ensured that the IOR remains underdeveloped. The Indian Ocean Rim Association, IORA, was formally launched at the first ministerial meeting in Mauritius on 6-7 March 1997. It is a dynamic intergovernmental organization aimed at strengthening regional cooperation and sustainable development within the Indian Ocean region through its 23 member states and 10 dialogue partners. The IORA nations need to be extremely creative to appreciate the potential in the region and formulate their strategy to harness the opportunities. The four major broad opportunities are living resources, transportation, petroleum and minerals, along with science and technology. The underwater domain awareness, UDA framework proposed by the Maritime Research Center, MRC, Pune, progresses the digital oceans construct to ensure good governance across the entire IOR. The transparency as a result of effective realization of the digital oceans will serve all the four stakeholders, namely maritime security, blue economy, environment and disaster management, and also the science and technology providers. Catherine, you're ready? Who's Romit is doing right. Yeah, from here. Uh, Romit, you're ready? Uh, yeah, I'll just share okay. my screen. Okay, so we have our MRC research fellows presentation now. We have Romit uh, who will be talking about sediment classification and followed by Catherine. So, Romit, over to you. Yeah. So good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'm Romit Kaure, a research fellow at MRC and uh, pursuing my undergraduate in civil engineering from IIT Delhi. So today I'll present about the sediment classification, its application and some of the policy interventions in the tropical waters. So our discussion will be uh, about some uh, sediment classification, some introductory part about it. Then the three major areas of interest we'll talk about and then we will see what are by the policy interventions are needed in the uh, tropical waters can be formulated policy uh, uh, policy formulation can be done and then some concluding remarks so one of the uh, first question that comes to our mind is why should we like study the seabed so uh, the co the complex nature of the seabed is uh, like due to the various processes that had occurred uh, in millions of years uh, so uh, due to this various recreational economic military and Oceanic applications need the uh, qualities of the sediment or the seabed, uh, and then for locating the various marine environment, uh, the marine environment and the operation of the various structures, say drilling rigs or oil rigs are there. Uh, when support structures, they require the geotechnical applications of the sediments. 
the density or the moisture content, the shape, size, structure are also needed in order to have proper construction uh, of these offshore uh, structures. The seabed structure is also vital for planning the submarine routes as well as different marine environments are also characterized by the sediment type that is present at that a particular location. Hence, it uh, influences what are the various abiotic and the biotic components in the marine ecosystem. So, like uh, we have been like studying the uh, like seabed and conducting research activities for like many decades now. So, conventionally, if we have to conduct some test and all, the detection site is located and then physical samples are being uh, extracted and then uh, Many tests are conducted based on what is the application, what are the needs and all. But again, this, uh, these tests uh, are conducted by having some, uh, we have uh, corers and grabbers are there. So there is a vibro core sampler or uh, box, sam uh, box sampler is there. Uh, so all these samplers are there which may physically extract the samples and all. But again, these are uh, limited in scale, uh, time consuming and as well as maybe expensive as well. So like more recently, there has been remote sensing based uh, acoustics uh, classification system. So they use uh, the various sonars and all and has a lot broad coverage as well as is uh, like cost effective as well. So these are the new modern day techniques that have evolved. Now, apart from all these technologies, we also need to identify what are the corresponding stakeholders, have proper consultations with them in order to have a holistic development without uh, any delays and all. And in order to do this, we also need to understand what are the various policies that are there in place uh, when we consider the global, regional or the national scale and to understand what are the policy gaps that are there uh, when we come to the uh, Indian Ocean region. So uh, like with the uh, development of the various technologies and all, a lot of interest have been developed in the many applications of the seabed. So we see that, uh, we see that the exploration and extraction of the various uh, minerals or other resources require offshore construction and support structures and all. And these are all uh, like supported by the foundation. So these foundations are like, uh, how can we design them, the strength of the foundation or are determined by the sediment bearing pressure. So it is significant in the design and detailing part of the, how the site would be selected, what kind of such uh, process needs to be involved for like uh, constructing the particular structure and all. Uh, the other one is like, uh, there is a lot of marine resources when we consider the living resources. So they are exploited with the, uh, the benthic boundary there to, uh, in the lowest part of the ecosystem in the particular water body. So their management also becomes crucial as uh, we all, we need to establish what is the particular, we need to identify what is the health status and all monitor and maintain our biodiversity and all. Another part is that a lot of trash deposits, say marine litter is been like floating around our oceans like a lot of pieces are uh, there and they may cause a lot of uh, like uh, problems to the marine ecosystem as well hence you know we need to identify them and then choose parts of uh, like recovery needs to be done then a lot of communication between the islands and the mainland is done through underwater cable underwater transmission they may be of commercial use uh, or maybe of military use as well so planning these uh, cable routes also is an another interesting uh, like application then with the improve uh, like technology is uh, evolving day by day and with uh, like a lot of uh, uh, stress on our uh, existing resources there has been new uh, mineral oil gas resource uh, explorations in the untapped regions of the indian ocean region as well so all these are the various interests that are there in the seabed we will talk about three of them the first one being the sediment bearing pressure so the sediment bearing pressure is the uh, the sediment bearing pressure is basically the uh, the pressure that can be ex uh, exerted on the sediment which is in contact with the seabed as uh, which is in contact with the seabed now this pressure that can be uh, exerted or can be like taken by the sediment uh, depend on the on the uh, like uh, the characteristics of the sediment say the moisture content density the roughness and the texture of this sediment as well thus uh, these uh, sediment bearing pressure is necessary in order to have a good engineering and geotechnical investigations about the various foundation design, retaining wall or the seismic uh, soil stabilization as well. It is necessary to uh, like have these sediment bearing pressure 
analysis in mind in order to have a safe and secure structure which will not collapse or fail under excessive settlement. Thus, the structure may be of like strategic importance or economic imp uh, importance as well. So, example, if the army wants to uh, uh, wants to deploy some amphibious uh, vehicles or set tanks in a uh, in a subtop in a like shallow water region, so they may require what is the sediment bearing capacity of that particular region, or else the assets which they are gonna deploy they may sink. So this kind of studies have extensive military applications as well. So, when considering how can we calculate the sediment bearing pressure, conventionally, uh, uh, what happens is we have a detection site, uh, ships figure are sent, and then they physically extract those sampler, uh, those samples, and then based on what are the parameters that are needed for the calculation, extensive laboratory tests are performed. So there have uh, so many tests may be performed, triaxial tests may be performed on them to determine what is the strength of the sample or to characterize uh, what is the uh, texture and classify it on based on the grain size and all. But again, as I mentioned, these are time consuming and do not have a lot of coverage as well. So that's why uh, these acoustic systems which deploy the use of the various side scan sonars, multi beam echo sounder or the sub bottom profilers, they can be used uh, because uh, again, they have broad applicability as well. So uh, like this in the image, you can uh, see these can be mounted on AUV submarines on sh or ships, depending on the specific needs and the resources that are available. Again, this uh, image shows how are, like these acoustic systems, they're complemented by having some mathematical models or some data analysis models as well. So this is one of the model how the input data is taken, then what are the various processes through which it can go in order to have different uh, parameters to, uh, to be uh, determined. Correction factors all as well can be determined. And this is a conventional borehole or like uh, data of the geotechnical investigation of the soil to classify okay, what type of soil it is, uh, at what particular depth, or, or what is the soil type, what is its classification, uh, then how what are the various sediment uh, grain size classification is present. So this is one of the conventional way that it can be done. So coming to the uh, Policy part, what are the various policies that govern the uh, construction in the mostly in the exclusive economic zone region of the uh, of a particular coastal state. So for this, the United Nations Convention on the Laws of Seas, their UN clause, it has various guidelines for like managing the oceans, including the EZ, uh, the seabed, subsoil and the water column as well. The international seabed authorities there. Uh, which has mandate to regulate activities in the international seabed as well. Uh, in the construction part, it has various regulations and uh, like activities for the exploration and exploitation of the particular international seabed. And then how can the environmental impact assessment be carried out? What are the various monitoring and reporting guidelines, safety standards for the various operations? These are all mentioned. Apart from this, the convention also has the various articles. So article 56 has provided the coastal state with the various jurisdiction in regards to the construction or the establishment of the artificial island um, of for construction uh, installations and structures. Article 60 has also some relevant uh, provisions regarding the same. Coming to India, there is the ter uh, Territorial Waters Continental Shift and Exclusive Economic Zones Act, uh, which has the legal framework for managing and regulating India's maritime like zones, which includes construction in the EZ as well. There is the Coastal Regulation Zone, which has like uh, the under the Environmental Protection Act has various guidelines for coastal zone and for construction activities in the EZ, what are the various uh, requirements for obtaining environmental clearances and all, then there's the EI notification, which involves that any construction activity, which may cause a significant environmental impact should have an EI done before it should be, uh, before it should be like approved. Then there is again the National Green Tribunal dealing in cases, in cases of environmental di uh, law disputes as well. So there are a lot of policies internationally as well in the uh, national level as well. So coming to our next uh, area of interest, that is the benthic ecosystem assessment. So benthic ecosystem is the ecological uh, or the ecological niche lying in the lowest region of the water body and is in contact with the substrate or the bottom. They are necessary because they not only help in the nutrient cycling and energy transfer, but they also help in identifying and monitoring the health of the ecosystem that is present. Uh, so 
we need to monitor these benthic uh, ecosystems in order to like firstly see the natural variability of these particular benthic uh, ecosystem then to see what are their variation with respect to many other uh, natural factors say ocean warming is there and then in order to have a, a time series or a future predictability and how the uh, of the various risk associated uh, with the current scenarios would affect these benthic ecosystems or we can say these ecological assets. So that's why these monitoring uh, systems are required. So again, uh, when we come to the technology part, how can we identify these benthic ecosystems? So the traditional methods involve having biological samples there, there would be sediment graph samples or datas would be there, or there would be rapid visuals uh, assessments of the particular parameter by diving sur surveys as well. Now with uh, again use of technology, uh, with the development of technology, there are these acoustic sensors, uh, uh, which use again, we can use the side scan sonars and all. These can be mounted on the AUVs or the remotely operated vehicles as well, so that they can be pre-programmed in order to investigate some isolated areas and then, there are various benthic indicators as well. So depending on what region you are, you want to identify what type of uh, species you want to identify, different types of indicators are developed to uh, uh, determine the health of the particular uh, benthic ecosystem. So there are uh, like most of them are in the Mediterranean region as well. Then with the uh, like large scale, uh, there is a need for a large scale spatial data on these benthic species as well. So various computer, computational simulation and modeling techniques have also been developed. One of them is the distribution modeling techniques that has been developed, which uh, lead to a like a full scale uh, prediction of the spatial uh, benthic ecosystems as well. So basically all these technologies uh, are, uh, all these technologies and they all depend on what are the various users need what or input parameters are needed so we we need to understand the more larger source path receiver model so basically uh, what are the various input parameters you need what are the parameters you need to study how are you able to uh, collect the data source the various data then through which path you want to analyze these uh, the data that is there and then uh, depending on the receiver how you want to visualize it how you want to show it to the receiver so there are three aspects in this, the two C to understand and the two share aspect. So in the two C aspect, we would uh, like to see uh, what kind of sensor needs to be used, what hardware needs to be sourced, what are the various techniques do we need to go to acoustic path or through optical technique way, how we need to be deployed those sensors, either they need to be uh, towed uh, by submarines, ROVs, or be mounted on ships, be towed, how we need to, uh, what vehicles need to be deployed and what is the specifications of these sensors? Because like depending on the uh, acoustic sensors, depending on the frequency, different, uh, so the uh, range of the uh, depth through, uh, up to which we can determine or classify these sediments, they also vary. So what are the specific uh, uh, specifications of the sensors used? Now, once we have the data and we have collected it, the next part is how can we interpret the data based on what the parameters are needed. So there may be a lot of data, be pre-processing, post-processing, a lot of data analytics which involve the use of machine learning or artificial intelligence like some use unsupervised learning, supervised learning, some mathematical models like uh, in the sediment classification, there's a biostore model, it can be used. So what kind of, do you need a Fourier transform series and all? So depending on the specific needs, uh, how these data processing uh, techniques needs to be used, uh, needs to be like analyzed. And then according to what type of user is there, what is their need? We need to show them differently what type of data, like yesterday Arnab said told, if a policy maker is there, he, uh, the policy maker would require to have some data uh, of some decades or maybe a hundred years. So how on what time skills we are trying to represent to data some user may require the data on a some we need to develop some web based graphical user interface or some would require a mobile application to for the data to be presented or some or for some application maybe on the hardware itself the data needs to be presented again how can we show the data to maps tabular uh, to tables and all again in this the marine special planning would come to our rescue so basically 
then uh, what kind of application it is so again uh, the navy would have some different specifications of data than a researcher and some may require real time data fit so how can we share this data so all these aspects are different research topics at all so depending on what type what is the uh, or main focus of uh, of this research different uh, research techniques can be used different so yeah that's the main thing we need to consider and then this is the distribution so the distribution modeling method the computational simulation how it basically shows how the concept may be done how various input data can be carried then how the model parameters can be thought of what are the various model parameters and then once we have some predictions how can we use them to monitor them we could predict some future scenarios as well how can marine special planning be used in it and also again a lot of planning and policy formulation would also go into it now the image on the left uh, this is an uh, like a uh, reconstruction of a particular tropical land, uh, coastal landscape from a uav survey while on the right you can see the digital elevation models of a particular location through bathymetric surveys they have been able to reconstruct the uh, like uh, the uh, topographic scale as well so again these techniques would help us in order to map the uh, map our uh, like seabed in extremely new ways now coming to the uh, uh coming to the uh, the policy part so like most of the uh, international community has been there to like have uh, uh, various policies in uh, in areas which are beyond the national jurisdiction as well so internationally we have the uh international union for convention of Na uh, conservation of nature it has the ocean governance which has various processes and agreements in place for the like uh, protecting areas which are beyond the national jurisdiction as well the convention on the laws of seas it has dedicated part 12 for providing legal protection on the marine environment as well there is the article 207 which has duties of states towards the rejuvenation and the preservation of these marine ecosystem the article 208 talks about the various seabed activities and how the human activities would lead to the uh, various survival of the benthi communities as well uh, coming to the uh, india we have the article 48a and the clause g of the article 51a which like mandates the state to protect the forest and wildlife of, of the country which includes the marine ecosystem as well the environment protection act is there which like there is the water act which banned industry from trying to pollute the environment and the marine ecosystem as well uh, in the us the environment protection agency also has various guidelines uh, in order to how can we monitor assess uh, conduct surveys of these benthic ecosystems uh, in the eu the marine strategic framework directive uh, it uh, like directs the eu member states to like assess and monitor their uh, marine environment to achieve a, a good environmental status its biodiversity and its seafloor integrity as well so again uh, nationally regionally globally a lot of these regional agreements are in place now uh, we also look into a case study in order to look why such policy formulations would also have would pose some kind of uh, complexity as well so uh, there was a case study in which uh, they uh basically wanted to uh, know the ecological status of 700 mediter uh, sites in the mediterranean region so as very little quantitative data or research data is there which uh, they needed to have a comprehensive study which would represent the actual health of the marine ecosystem in the mediterranean region so again the uh, what the researchers tried is that they took four major habitats and then as i mentioned there are various benthic indicators so depending on what type of uh, region they wanted and what type of uh, species they wanted to assess they used this in, uh, indexes like the rapid easy index or the the carlet index and they also calculated the ecological quality ratio so the basically the ratio of the indices at the specific site and to the uh, indices at the reference site this study however highlighted that there are differences in this habitat classification system monitoring methods and the threshold uh, methods that are there between the various uh, nations this hindered the actual representation of how the ecosystem is getting degraded also there are a lot of indicators that are being used which make, are making the comparisons difficult thus impairing uh, like how to have a reliable and an extensive uh, 
pictures or uh, picture of the uh, health of this particular benthic ecosystem thus according to them there is was there was an urgent need to achieve a consensus on which type of data needs to be collected what indicators need to be used how can we classify them based on the marine ecosystem health because the current policies are too fragmented based on the various decision makers the uh, the nations the researchers the policy makers and the practitioners as well so again a lot of agreements or a lot of uh, indicators in place lead to more complexity now coming to our next uh, uh, next application that is the abiotic element detection now it is one of the most crucial parts which in, uh, involves identifying and locating objects which are not part of the natural seabed environment which may include uh, lost or discarded items or wreckage from ships as well uh, plastics which also considered a major part of marine litter are like just lying across our uh, oceans and all so this uh, forms a major part of this uh, abiotic element another one are the polymetallic nodules so there are manganese cobalt or copper which are uh, present in good quantities in the indian region as well uh, in uh, potato size nodules which are called as the polymetallic nodules so these are also of various commercial viability as well uh, for some facts india was the first country to receive the status of pioneer investor in the 1987 Uh, and was allotted an exclusive area in the central indian ocean for this polymetallic nodule uh, utilization in fact india uh, is one of is in the top 8 countries which is implementing implementing a long term contract uh, for this exploration of this polymetallic nodules so again you can use this new modern machine learning algorithms as well so you have some diving surveys and also and then Uh, you can integrate these machine learning algorithms to have real time classification of what kind of object it is whether it is a when say sea urchin and all and then uh, or a plastic object and all or a rock so depending on what kind of object it is we can classify this abiotic systems as well so again this shows a conceptual model of how the marine litter can be um, how can we understand the uh, problems of the marine litter how can we map them um, we have some modeling techniques how can the various stakeholders be brought in how can the legislation involve uh, uh, in managing these marine litter and then how can we recycle them reduce them so uh, basically all of them are involved in a particular strategic uh, planning so again coming to the capability part so again if we need to conventionally uh, see what kind of litter is there we would have some grab samplers in the particular detection place we have these crawler systems so these have some excuse me these are some crawlers which would be there there are pumps vacuums which would then take in those systems recover these uh, some of these samples in order to have extensive laboratory testing and all again there would be diving surveys in order to visually inspect if uh, some of these techniques may not be able to effectively classify now with the rise of these acoustic systems we can use sonar or some of these uh, uh, foreign objects would also have magnetic properties which could be uh, taken up by the magnetometer so we could have magnetic surveying as well again we could have videographic surveys optical imaging or uh, with the growing uh, technologies uh, the use of machine learning we could have some uh, so some researchers uh, researchers try to uh, integrate the machine learning algorithms like you only look one model was there some use the uh, regional proposal network rpn while some use the faster rcnn networks in order to integrate them with the uh, video service that were conducted in order to have a proper classification system in place so these could be again uh, these videographic surveys would again be conducted by placing them over auvs or rovs they could be like pre programmed or again autonomous so yeah with growing technologies uh, we could have proper uh, like location and identification of what kind of marine litter is there and then proper recovery methods could be developed coming to the policy part so according to the convention of uh, the united nations convention on the laws of seas so it has various laws for the seabed and ocean floor and how can we use its resources and then these resources are Uh, common resource for the human kind so they must be effectively used and uh, uh, not a lot of pollution be caused then there is the 
uh, International Convention on the Prevention of Marine Pollution from Ships or the MARPOL, which is developed by the International Maritime Organization. Coming to the EU, there was a the, uh, Barcelona Convention in 1976, which aimed to protect the Mediterranean Sea against pollution uh, and preventing and eliminating pollution by dumping from ships on aircraft or by incineration at sea. In India, the Ministry of the Earth Sciences, uh, along with the National Center for the Coastal Research of this Temporal and Spatial Distribution of Marine uh, Litter in the, along the Indian coast and the neighboring seas as well. The Ministry of Environment has the plastic waste management rules uh, and the, uh, under which like they have prohibited the manufacture or storing, uh, stocking, uh, import or distribution of plastics that are less than 50 microns thick in order to uh, uh, like in order to prevent this uh, marine litter going into the our, uh, Indian Ocean region as well, which may cause harm to the uh, marine ecosystem as well. So having seen that uh, a lot of these policies are then placed say, the nationally or regionally or internationally. So we need to uh, know why do we really have some policy frameworks in the Indian Ocean region? So we may first look at some facts of the Indian Ocean region. So the Indian Ocean region is one of the busiest anger route in the world carrying around 500 million metric tons of uh, oil. Now most of this uh, oil may get seeped into the or uh, may get uh, like there may be some oil slips which may cause a lot of damage to the coastal environment and the mangrove forest along with the coral reefs as well. And then again, the Indian Ocean region is abundant in the uh, manganese rodules as well. There is a high concentration of the politically unstable governance deficit and the uh, conflict blown nationalities as well. So there is Indian Ocean region is a very interesting and unique place because it is of commercial and military application of the coastal states as well as every other uh, major uh, power uh, of the world as well. So again, there has been a lot of like uh, when considering the various international uh, conventions that are in place, a lot of problems have also been come up. So like there are many ob observers have noted that there are a lot of uh, reception facilities in in terms of their high uses, usage costs are there. And so many of the shipping um, uh, companies tend to like, they just uh, like ignore the Maripol convention and then they uh, like the Maripol and then uh, dump that litter overboard. Many of them, the Indian Ocean region countries also have less agreements in place when we compare them to the uh, European counterparts or we say the United States as well. Many of these countries do uh, have their respective laws and regulations, but again, they are governance deficit and are largely ineffective to like uh, in mitigating the illegal, uh, underreported, and the unregulated fishing as well. We also need to consider the Indian Ocean region countries have some of the most polluted rivers as well. So a lot of these rivers may dump their marine litter into the Indian Ocean region only. Again, many countries lack the proper standards, guidelines, and enforcement mechanisms owing to the limited scientific data as well. Again, uh, there is not a, a single organization that would encompass all the Indian Ocean region countries. So there is the Indian Ocean Rim Organi uh, Association, but again, it would like think of uh, its focus would be on the uh, like trade and not a lot of on the social, political, or the social economic uh, issues as well. So international, so regionally there have been a lot of problems uh, regarding the international conventions that are in place. Now coming to the uh, Indian part, uh, there is there was like an issue said the Therma port construction was there in Bhadrak, Orisha. So it also gained a lot of reasonable attention because like it was prox uh, close to the uh, vulnerable olive ridley turtle nesting place as well. So it also drew a lot of attention were there proper environmental consultations in place. Again, there are since there are a lot of laws in the state on the state and the national level, there might be some kind of mismatch and a lot of complexity occurs. So there was a ship which had some toxic substances, which was due to under the Indian coast. So the Gujarat Maritime Board and the Indian customs like uh, they uh, let it through for us, but the Ministry of Shipping and the Ministry of Environment sought further details. So there is a complexity uh, and there is a mismatch of information as well. Again. There is a lack of uh, 
capacity, skills, and access to cost-effective technologies that make it difficult to like overcome barriers of sustainable management of the aquatic resources as well. Uh, again, the region is concentrated with a lot of governance deficit. There are a lot of political and political conflicts as well. So there is a lack of regional trust between including the various countries as well. So uh, we have seen that the ever-growing tensions are there in the our maritime neighbor only. So in the South China Sea, there is a rise of dominance over the particular Indian Ocean region as well. Thus, it is high time that particular frameworks are to be worked on for national interests. Uh, again, whilst a lot of excessive delays are also led through some projects maybe of economic and strategic importance as well. So we saw the uh, uh, Mumbai Worli, uh, there was a worldly sailing which saw excessive cost overruns or delay in five of five years as well. No, in accordance with the government of India's new vision by 2030, it highlights blue economy as one of the 10 core uh, dimensions of growth. And so there is a need of a coherent policy which has different sectors which, which improve the lives of these coastal and uh, coastal communities, accelerate development and, and, uh, and their employment as well. Thus, India must recognize its position at an economic and strategic axis in, uh, and then strive for an efficient and sustainable uh, utilization of these already scarce and untapped ocean resources in order to have these uh, ocean related opportunities, capabilities, and then safeguarding the environment in uh, regards of the UN sustainability, uh, UN sustainable development goals as well. Again, you can see uh, this picture shows that when we come to the Indian Ocean region, it lacks in a lot of environmental baseline and the deep sea mining scientific gaps. So if you, anyone wants to have a proper study or research or formulate policies as well, uh, the data is limited. Uh, not a lo lot of data is available in the public domain. So there is a pressing need to have a, uh, like a formulation of the policy coming to the sediment classification framework. Now this could be worked upon utilizing the current floor, which is uh, given by the National Framework for Sediment Management or the UDA Framework. And then some extensions can be dot upon which would include the blue economic policies as well, because the uh, like as the G20 presidency is with India, one of its pillars is the blue economy, which is a more coherent issue uh, coming to the global south as compared to the global north. The security and growth for all in the region, that is the Sagar Initiative or the BIMSTEC, they are largely contributing for this advanced ocean cooperation and blue economic activities in the region. The blue economic uh, policy also proposes to regulate various activities under the sustainable development goals uh, and then bring in the private players as well, uh, which could have a lot of investments and partnerships in the Indian Ocean region. The maritime sector is also going through an uh, industry 4.0 revolution. So a lot of new technologies like advanced robotics, uh, uh, this sophisticated sensors are there, internet of things, machine learning, cloud computing. So all these are also required in order to have transformed the marine sector and then have a greater growth and development. Now, keeping in view of the various stakeholders that are there, there needs to be a, a good consolidation between all those stakeholders. Upskilling of those uh, stakeholders needs to be done with proper value addition as well. Thus, a comprehensive plan would also incorporate the freshwater systems uh, to enhance the maritime security within our borders as well. Science and technology is also one of the like key drivers of the. Uh, safety, security, and the sustainable development of our oceans. Thus, it is important to know uh, our, uh, what are our, uh, uh, what do we do not know about the various undersea ecosystem, how the various interactions are there between the components of the marine ecosystem, and how human interventions are basically uh, causing a variation in this marine eco working of the marine ecosystem and the total uh, working of these ecosystem at all. So, like in conclusion, I would suggest that India should uh, should leverage its position in the Indian Ocean region to have a proper uh, policy framework, including the blue economy, uh, the sustainable development goals, ensuring that there is peace, harmony and security within the uh, mighty Indian Ocean. So, with the like comment of the formal uh, UN Secretary General Ban Ki-moon that the Earth is our only home. Together we must protect and cherish it. Uh, I'll end my discussion. So, yeah.
Thank you. Hello? I hope you can distinguish between the presentation done by Rishika and uh, Romit uh, and also Sanskar because uh, what Romit is addressing is the sediment at the bottom of the water body and there are varied dimension and what is important is that if we now need to look at the smaller players to get into the underwater startups, a lot of data or information is required. The startups will not have the bandwidth or the resources to do some basic study. There is already a GIS policy announced by the government. The blue economy policy is going to be announced very soon. Uh, and I think it is very fundamental that some of the basic information must be available for somebody to build on. Otherwise, it becomes a non-starter right at the beginning. So from that perspective, we feel that this kind of work is, so this is just about building the basic framework, but then we need a massive multiplier a network of startups who can go and actually region-specific, application-specific, sector-specific, mapping and then take it forward so if there are no questions chat me hai okay there's a question uh, romit do you want to answer that there's a question in the chat box so uh yeah, like uh, I believe that uh, as Arnab sir mentioned, a lot of data uh, is there. So like uh, we ha uh, we may have a lot of uh, uh, we can uh, based on the various different applications, different kind of data can be uh, done. So again, uh, sharing of this data, how can we share between the various um, or various users or various nations? I think cloud computing and all can uh, like really help in how we can share the data. Uh, between various stakeholders are there or between various nations are there. So, yeah, I mean, because again, it is not only like a one, because again, the Indian Ocean region is a large area. So it's not that only one country can be able to like correct all the data. So or it's, it's a like, uh, like a lot of countries needs to need to come together. And I think in that way, in our, how can we share our data? How can we uh, like, have this co coherent policies as well. Again, as I mentioned that in order to have any base, any studies or any policy formulation or data is required. And the Indian Ocean lacks a lot of scientific gaps at their environmental baselines or other key, uh, as I mentioned, the uh, Mediterranean study. So uh, the Indian Ocean region lacks in this. So I guess, yeah, cloud computing could really help in that. Yeah, I think there are many tools, uh, as you have seen, there are a lot of presentations that you've seen and uh, so those tools or those uh, computational infrastructure will be extremely critical and we'll have to have a combination of many such tools and uh, as somebody had even asked the question uh, about you know the supercomputing mission versus the quantum computing and so these are all tools that will be required and they can all contribute to the larger. So, I mean, at the policy level, the government will have to take a call. And it's also when we take about, talk about the digital transformation, there are also concerns of security. So are we really prepared for those kind of, and it's also a political question because will the nations in the region allow the data to be available on a common platform is also a question that we need to answer. So. There has to be a multi-pronged approach. The entire policy structure has to be looked at. The technology intervention has to be looked at. And also, 
you know, the capacity and capability building it has to be looked at very, very differently, both at the national as well as the regional level. I hope I've answered your question. So we will move on to the next. Thank you, Romit. Uh, it was a good presentation. Uh, we'll move on to the next presentation. Catherine, kindly make your presentation. Uh, good evening, sir. Good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Catherine, and I'll be presenting today on Indus Basin Water Future. Um, so, this is our Indus Basin. Uh, we have the major tributaries, Kabul and Afghanistan, and then Jehlam, Chenab, Ravi, Bias, Satlaj flowing through India into Pakistan. The riparian countries for the Indus Basin include, um, the majority is in Pakistan, 47%, India, 39%, China 8% and Afghanistan 6%. But China holds a very important position because it is the upper riparian to uh, majority of the rivers. And then in India, we have Jammu and Kashmir where the Indus Basin contributes the most. The whole of the Jammu and Kashmir is actually encompassed by the Indus Basin. And then we have Imachal Pradesh 16% and Punjab is heavily dependent on the Indus Basin, the breadbasket of our country and then Rajasthan, 4.9%. And uh, the Indus Basin is actually home to about 268 million people. In this presentation, I'll actually go through first the historical context of how the Indus Basin governance evolved and how the Indus Water Treaty was signed. And then what is the current scenario of the Indus Basin in terms of its, uh, in terms of our governance and also in terms of the water um, scenario. And then what are the conflicts around the Indus Water Treaty and the basin? And what is the way ahead? So uh, coming to the historical perspective, uh, there are various events that actually impacted how the Indus Water Treaty was formulated. First of all, India and Pakistan had been newly partitioned. So there was a question of territory and sovereignty. So when the Indus water uh, problem arose, it actually became a very vital turning point for how India and Pakistan define their boundaries. So the land was divided by the Radcliffe line. So how was the water going to be divided? Because this was something that was actually not in anybody's control. So the basin was transboundary. So how are we going to define the territory and how the, both the nations are going to have, an, uh, have, have defined their sovereignty? And then second, the riparian positioning. So India is upstream to Pakistan in terms of the Indus Basin uh, position. So India actually claimed India actually claimed um, the uh, equitable uh, allocation because in, uh, India was like, I have majority of the land, uh, I have a considerable amount of the land where the Indus Basin is, uh, Indus waters are flowing. So I need an equitable amount of water. But then the Pakistan was like, I want prior appropriation um, uh, I, I want to apply prior appropriation rules because most of the irrigation structures that the Britishers had built during the time of the British were in Pakistan. So the uh, so Pakistan was like we already have the water structures, so we need the water. Uh, we need more water located to us. So that was also one of the major uh, points that was discussed, and then India wanted total sovereignty of the eastern rivers. So the eastern rivers were what feeding Punjab. So, and India was at, uh, under a lot of stress to feed its population. So 
from the food security point of view, India actually weighed its pros and cons and decided we need total sovereignty over the eastern rivers. So demanding that, they had to give up something which was the western rivers control. And then Pakistan also wanted independence from the upstream control from India. So the, the problem actually arose when India actually blocked the water going into Pakistan because most of the head work for the irrigation system was in India. The, after India and Pakistan got divided, the irrigation canal network was in Pakistan and most of the head works was in India. So India had the control over when the water was flowing into Pakistan. So this created a huge security issue for Pakistan. And then in India, we had a lot of internal conflicts, wherein the farmers in Punjab and Haryana and other places were like demanding the, uh, the government to actually provide for irrigation system for them, because their fertile land was laying barren. And then in the Punjab borderlands, as I said, there was constant conflict like the local level conflicts, which were creating a lot of problems. Looking at the whole uh, scenario of how India and Pakistan is juggling with all of this, David Lilianthal visited India. He's an American techno technocrat and a water manager. So he visited India, wrote a paper uh, in 1951, which actually uh, was uh, grabbed the attention of World Bank. So the World Bank started getting interested. World Bank was at that moment a very young institute, about a decade old. So they were concerned about how in the South Asian, uh, the, uh, the, the volatility in South Asian countries could impact its lending programs. So it was also concerned about how to solve this particular issue. So they wanted to mediate the whole uh, treaty. And then other Western policy makers were afraid of the cold war that was about to happen that might happen if india and pakistan keep on fighting and um, then pakistan started to like given because uh, india and the world bank actually um, agreed to give a certain amount of money to create a new canal network for themselves through the western rivers and um, give up the eastern rivers for india in this whole uh, in this whole discussion, initially when David started um, in, uh, David started negotiating and mediating, there was a lot of uh, focus on the science to consider the Indus Basin as a whole hydrological unit. But as the negotiations were progressing, the politics took over. So finally, the political uh, goals or agendas or the notions of Nehru and Ayub uh, succeeded and um, most of the scientific ideas were left behind. So the treaty is actually a very um, engineering heavy plus politics heavy uh, document. And um, Indus Water Treaty is today regarded as a very successful document because it has been, it has managed to overcome a lot of standoffs and wars between India and Pakistan. And at that moment when it was being signed, it was also a moment of, a historical moment of decolonization. When India and Pakistan accepted uh, the mediation from World Bank and there weren't told to do so and so. So this was a very important moment of decolonization. So we need to appreciate the historical perspective to appreciate what we have today. And um, so the treaty provisions actually said that the Eastern tributaries of Indus, uh, Satlaj, Bias and Ravi were uh, for India's exclusive use. So this amounted for 33 million MAF. And the Western rivers, the Indus, Shinab, and Jhelum, whose mean annual flow is 80 MAF, were allocated to Pakistan. And in this part, in, in these Western rivers, India was allowed to uh, construct hydroelectric uh, power plants uh, of run of the river models only. Um, so, 
So as you can see here, the eastern and western rivers are uh, pretty clear. So uh, it was a very, um, e uh, it looks very easy how they did it. But it took about it took about ten years to actually come uh, formulate the Indus Water Treaty. So the Ravi, Bias, and Satluj on the eastern side belonged to now is being used by India exclusively, and uh, Indus, Shenab, and Jhelum is used by Pakistan. So what is the current scenario? Um, so this is all the riparian countries of the Indus Basin. China, India, Pakistan, and Afghanistan. So here I have compiled all, uh, all the data available on the amount of water which is uh, coming from China, which is originating in India, and how much of Eastern and Western rivers are, is available in India, and how much is flowing to Pakistan and uh, through the Western rivers and Eastern rivers, and how much Pakistan is getting from Kabul and other tributaries, and how much is finally going to the sea. So we don't have a consensus, of course, on what is the actual number. So if you, you can see every box has multiple numbers because for the same quantity, we have different uh, numbers. So there is definitely a, a, a gap where we don't have the required data. We don't have an accurate and dependable data. So the, the point of this particular chart is like, India needs to work on its data collection and real-time monitoring so that we, if we don't have the uh, actual data to uh, uh, say how much we have and how much we are uh, leaving. For example, in the eastern rivers, we are supposed to use all of it. But uh, to Pakistan, we are giving actually between 2.4 BCM to 11.1 BCM. So we don't know actually how much is flowing into east, uh, through the eastern rivers into Pakistan. And recently, uh, uh, there was a lot of political uh, tussle after the uh, terrorism, uh, terrorist attacks. And then this Eastern River water was supposed to be a point of contention because we are, we, uh, are we actually like uh, giving up all the water or are we using all the water? Is Pakistan uh, just using the water uh, with, uh, even though the Indus Water Treaty says that it's for us? Uh, is that technology is properly in place to utilize that water? So all of those questions cannot be answered if uh, till we have the necessary data. So, um, and other things that are, other important thing that is impacting our uh, basin is the climate uh, change. So, of course, there's going to be a decline and uh, the decline is mostly going to be in the, um, the snow melt, the flow of, uh, according to the NDP study, the flow of Indus, which receives 90% of its water from the upper mountain catchments, could decline by 70% by 2080. So are we ready to have a uh, climate-proof future? Um, so similar studies are available, but they don't have uh, enough um, data or they aren't region-specific or, um, you know, um, it's specific enough to have proper interventions designed for them. Um, coming to the major issues in the West Eastern rivers for India. So uh, globally, the climate change is affecting all the um, major water resources. But in India, if we talk about it, what are the issues that we are facing when we, uh, when we are talking about the Eastern rivers? So the Eastern river water is, uh, all of them are, uh, Located to Punjab, Haryana, Rajasthan, Jammu and Kashmir, and Delhi. Um, so it's a very um, so till Delhi, it's dependent on our uh, on the uh, Indus uh, uh, River. Um, so and our canal systems are really old, around two hundred years old. So they are silting, and there's there's a lot of water loss. So we uh, there's been repairs happening, but then it's not giving the desired result, and. Um, and then we also have the farmer issue. We are growing paddy and uh, rice uh, heavily, which is like draining the um, water resources and uh, soil uh, fertility. So how do we add value to the farmers and also increase the farmer income without, uh, without 
damaging our natural resources. So the water quality, the groundwater quality, the surface water quality is 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 in a huge mess. Uh, the soil quality, because of the heavy use of fertilizers, this might not look like uh, issues which concern the bigger picture, but they are because the farmers are the one of the major stakeholders in in the Indus Basin. And then, um, what is what are we doing to make uh, to combat the water stress that is happening? So right now we are using the water uh, resources at 186 uh, percent of its uh, of what it's capable of. So uh, the uh, groundwater and surface water. So how are we going to manage all of that use in the eastern uh, region? And the major issues that are uh, in the western uh, rivers, of course, is the first uh, hydropower um, demand. So we have a lot of um, capacity to build hydropower uh, plants in the western rivers, but because of Pakistan's continuous interruptions, we haven't been able, the projects have delayed uh, considerably, which has cost a lot of money, which has cost a lot of time. Um, so this is one of the major issue. And then the flood and sediment management of the dams, because Himalayans, Himalaya is a very young uh, mountain. Um, so the sediment issue is particularly very important. And uh, this hasn't been, we, we haven't been able to take care of that because uh, the treaty kind of specifies certain design restrictions for the dams, where, wherein we cannot uh, alter the uh, design to incorporate technological uh, advances to manage sediments. So this is one of the major uh, issues that we are facing uh, right now. And then cross-border terrorism, because for Pakistan, Kashmir is an, uh, the, the claim it has on Kashmir has intensified because most, because Pakistan's economy is dependent on Indus, Indus Basin. Most of it, uh, Pakistan is drained by the Indus Basin. It doesn't have other sources. So uh, Kashmir, where uh, most of the rivers originate, becomes a very important um, part important point where they uh, they claim uh, strongly so terrorism act is an eventuality of what uh, their other policies are so our relationship with pakistan actually makes uh, uh, will uh, actually influence how the indus basin is um, managed and governed so in the treaty, we have the following mechanism for conflict resolution. So um, in this, uh, the first is the permanent Indus Commission, wherein the two uh, Indus commissioners from India and Pakistan, they constitute the permanent Indus Commission. So if there is a, any particular problem, any question, so a question is raised with PIC. And if that question is not solved, a uh, difference is deemed to have arisen and a neutral expert is invited to actually decide who is uh, in the right and who is in the wrong. And then if that doesn't solve the issue, we have a court of arbitration, wherein um, after a dispute is arisen, um, a court of arbitration is uh, established uh, to, uh, to resolve the dispute. So given this mechanism, our treaty has survived two major wars between India and Pakistan and has survived a number of military standoffs. So there is something about the treaty which has, uh, in, in its crux, which has managed to keep peace uh, between India and Pakistan in terms of its water allocation, but has it kept with the uh, changing times? Um, that's the question. So uh, the most recent conflict that India and Pakistan had with respect to uh, the Indus Water Treaty was the Kishan Ganga hydroelectric power plant. So Pakistan's objection was that if KHEP is built, it will um, reduce the water in the channel that is uh, irrigating thousands of acres on its side and also impact the other power plant that it has 
uh, itself, uh, it has planned for itself Neelam Jhelum project downstream. So as you can see in the diagram, Kishan Ganga is in the top right corner where um, there is a tunnel, KHEP tunnel, um, connecting it to the power plant. So the power plant is actually uh, at the uh, at, at downstream of the um, uh, Kishan Ganga dam. So the idea here is that Kishan Ganga flowing uh, north uh, on the north side of Jhelum River actually creates a a uh, force where wherein which uh, a natural force where which can be utilized for power generation so this concept this same concept has been used by pakistan to do the same so but who conceived the idea first is the question so this is where uh, india actually had the upper hand so india had conceived the idea in 1990s so when it came to the court of arbitration India actually had the upper hand, of course. And uh, so what the Indus Water Treaty says uh, is that where a plant is located on a tributary of the Jhelum on which Pakistan has any agricultural use or hydroelectric use, the water released below the plant may be delivered if necessary into another tributary, but only to the extent that the then existing agricultural use or hydroelectric use by Pakistan on former tributary would not be adversely affected. So what this means is that if Pakistan had an existing hydroelectric use on the river, Pakistan could claim uh, that India's uh, project is illegal. But since India conceived the idea first, India started the work first, the court of arbitration declared that uh, India is in the right to do it. But and also, it is a uh, it is a inter basin transfer of water uh, between uh, to the Jhelum uh, Valley. So, in that case, what about the environmental flows for the rest of the channel uh, below the dam? So, this is where the Court of Arbitration actually uh, said that release nine cumex at all times after um, considerable discussion. So this was what the verdict was on KHEP after Pakistan raised number of objections. Most of them were rejected and India actually reduced the height of the dam and um, kind of uh, ended up with the project. And in 2018, our prime minister actually inaugurated the project. Um, another important contention that um, Pakistan had about the um, about the dam was the drawdown flushing to release the sediments. So sediment flushing is a very important uh, problem because uh, as, as I mentioned before, Himalayas are a um, young mountain and in the Salal project that was uh, constructed uh, before, um, before uh, uh, Kishan Ganga, in two seasons, the uh, dam got filled. So this means that uh, it means a huge uh, loss of money and uh, uh, waste of uh, time and everything. So in Baglihar Dam, which was constructed uh, before, uh, which was also uh, 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 referred to by to a neutral expert in the, the second stage of the conflict resolution, Baglihar Dam was referred. So there, Pakistan had said the same thing and then their drawdown flushing was agreed upon but in khep this um, uh, the court of arbitration actually rejected drawdown flushing because pakistan considers it as a key security issue so if pakistan uh, if india had this drawdown flushing what is drawdown flushing drawdown flushing is this uh, orifice spillway on the dam which is below the dead storage level so that it could flush the uh, sediments uh, uh, to make the uh, uh, plant work properly. So um, Pakistan thinks that if India has this uh, particular feature in its dam, it can manipulate the water to flood or uh, to uh, starve the downstream areas of water. So, but. Uh, so that's why the Court of Arbitration also read the treaty uh, similarly and uh, actually supported Pakistan in this particular claim. 
So we have a lot, but the neutral expert who had referred to the Baglihar case actually said that drawdown flushing was uh, is okay because he considered the climate change issues and other factors to say that yeah this is a uh, this is this particular feature is important uh, uh, in that uh, area. So here, we, uh, the, the, in conclusion, we have a lot of confusion regarding the interpretation of the treaty, the use of technology, and uh, various other uh, policy issues which needs to be addressed. Which which Indus-Water Treaty is not actually um, be it's it's not actually being able to um, do it at the moment. So what? So we need this is uh, we need a transboundary water cooperation wherein um, we have a treaty which is equitable. We need environmental factors to be uh, um, included. We need it to be sustainable. We need it to be technologically flexible. And we need it to be process-based. So our Indus Water Treaty is a very static instrument which hasn't changed in the past uh, since its conception in 1960. So such a static instrument is not uh, particularly desirable in our case where various issues such as climate change, changing uh, diplomatic relations are considered. So we need a process-based uh, uh, formulation. We have a lot of international laws and uh, treaties which can help us do that. We have Vienna Convention of 1961, which governs a diplomatic relations, how the diplomatic relations should be conducted in terms of various natural resources. And then we have Helsinki rules where groundwater and surface water, how in conjunction they should be governed in, in transboundary uh, issues. And then finally, we have the Berlin rules, wherein other than the rights of the riparian countries, we have obligations of the riparian countries, how to protect the uh, water, uh, how the protection of water is is a responsibility of all the riparian countries. So the Indus Water Treaty actually doesn't have a lot of these concepts yet because um, our understanding has also evolved considerably. So uh, the recommendations are um, the new treaty, uh, the amendments or uh, if the treaty is uh, 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 rewritten, how uh, it, it needs to have the sustainability, the environmental needs and climate change uh, factors to be addressed. Uh, China, a huge, uh, one of the major riparian countries, which is uh, which hasn't uh, actually done much right now, but China is actually partnered with Pakistan to build the hydropower dams, which we are talking about in Pakistan. So China is silently, indirectly influencing our um, basin. So um, we need to consider how to combat Chinese influences properly and how to make sure that our relationship with Pakistan doesn't deteriorate. Uh, we need to um, involve technology innovations. So when we um, make sure that technological innovations are considered, uh, instead of limiting the technology, like how the Indus Water Treaty is doing, uh, Indus Water Treaty specifically says that only run of the river projects are to be allowed. So instead of that, we can have operational restrictions, wherein um, if Pakistan demonstrates um, damage after a particular uh, power plant is op uh, hydropower plant is operated, then we can take particular steps to uh, reduce its operation or change its um, design. So, uh, and then uh, we also have how, uh, when the treaty is considered, how in uh, the already existing uh, structures, where, where are we going to put them? How the cumulative effect is going to be? So the cumulative impact assessment is not considered in the treaty. So um, we need to consider that as well. And uh, in the uh, bottom right corner, you can see a diagram wherein we can see the types of transboundary rivers. So in this particular paper by, by Gledich, you can see that there are four categorizations, wherein um, the first two are cross-border rivers, and the second is a border river which, uh, which runs very close to the border, and the third is a hybrid. So 
when we consider this particular um, differentiation of the rivers, our treaty lacks in, in this aspect wherein we have uh, one rule applies to all concept. So we can make our treaty a little bit more river specific. We have many tributaries, so we can have, instead of uh, classifying it as Western and Eastern rivers, we can have treaty speci uh, river specific uh, provisions in the treaty. Um, and then uh, finally, to do all of that, uh, the marine spatial planning tools as discussed earlier could actually provide a very good basis to start off the conversation, to start off the uh, negotiation for uh, a, a more comprehensive treaty. So the policy interventions that we can plan are a sound balance between socio-political goals and scientific understandings to, uh, and address the uh, food security issues. We can, uh, we can take steps to improve India-Pakistan relations by scientific and technological collaborations and transactions. And then we can have, uh, we can also, we, we also need policies wherein we can we combat China's economic and political interference, which is happening directly and indirectly. And overall, we need to strategize India as a regional leader to, uh, because to, to make sure our food security and water security issues are uh, combated and uh, our economic power also increases. And then finally, we need digital interventions for which policy interventions are a must. And then marine spatial planning also needs to become an important part of the uh, policy uh, considerations. So the further work which is required in the Indus Basin um, future is uh, to actually, under, uh, first of all, understand the shortcomings more clearly about what the socio-political, socio-economic, socio-cultural and technological and environmental shortcomings are. Then digitization and strategic security uh, requirements of the basin. So this needs to be very site specific and how the water flow and water quality uh, monitoring is done. So these this, these are huge gaps that are present, and these needs the, uh, they need work. And how we control the uh, how we manage flood and sediment, and then what are we doing to make the Indus Basin uh, climate change resilient? And how are we managing water demand, groundwater and surface water? And uh, how is the stake mo uh, stakeholder mobilization happening? So recently, India actually sent a notice to Pakistan to actually uh, 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 inviting them to uh, discuss the treaty again, to uh, treaty provisions. But uh, Pakistan hasn't been responding um, positively yet. So how the stakeholders are going to mobilize? So that is a very important uh, aspect of the policy work and how the capacity is going to be built regarding the same. So the MSP tool, uh, marine, how the marine spatial planning tools can be used for transboundary water cooperation. So the vision is that the political process that is happening needs to become a public process, wherein all the tools and everything becomes operational. And the tools are needs to be ecosystem-based, area-based, it needs to be integrated, adaptive, uh, strategic and participatory. Um, so the planning needs to be, it, it has multiple objectives, it needs to be spatially focused, site specific, and it needs to have an integrated approach. So the way ahead uh, with underwater domain awareness, as the underwater domain awareness uh, framework says, first we need to sense the gaps and then analyze uh, sense and then analyze uh, the data and everything. And then we need to uh, make uh, regulation frameworks to make the same, uh, to make sure that we are the quality management, flood and sediment management, climate resilience, farm practices and income management, food and energy security, acknowledging the ecosystem services. 
So if India is letting go of water to Pakistan, the Western rivers in its pristine form, Pakistan actually is indebted to India to do that. So are we, so this comes under the ecosystem services factor. So are we, do we have transactions to do that? And if we are polluting, so do, uh, do we have, or if Pakistan is polluting the water, which is going into the sea, or if, so we, do we have transactions and uh, penalties to uh, make sure that that doesn't happen? So, and we have to keep up with the technological innovations that are happening and make sure that the treaty doesn't impose severe restrictions on technology because those restrictions has what made, has what, uh, made uh, India and Kashmir's issue even more um, uh, uh, strangled because of the uh, technological uh, restrictions. Uh, and then we have marine spatial planning, uh, wherein, as discussed before uh, in uh, by, uh, presentations by other fellows, they have the uh, potential to make sure that the Indus Basin is properly governed and uh, scientifically governed. So I will end my presentation uh, with this following quote. Allocating water in transboundary basins is not a new practice. The looming water crisis accelerated social, economic, and technological developments, and climate variability and change call for new flexible approaches in allocation in order to future-proof water management. Thank you. Thank you, Catherine. I think it's very timely on 24th January. India has given notice to Pakistan and uh, the re relevant issues have been raised by you. Sediment management is a very important aspect. Digital transformation is a very important aspect. Environment and water quality as a strategic security challenge is something which needs to be recognized. and. Going forward, we have to create those instruments to make sure that we have, like, even the pandemic has been a great wake-up call where a lot can happen. And particularly when we talk about transboundary river, water being used for domestic purposes, there's a huge strategic security concern. So do we have the wherewithal to really keep track of what is happening, do we have the instruments to monitor whether we are safe or not is a question that we need to ask ourselves. And uh, also, there are so many other dimensions which you highlighted, Catherine, when within the federal structure between the states, the gaps have increased. You can see today we have not been using the entire allocation that has been given to us. And it's not so easy to say, how, how will you... Uh, now, what are the larger water-consuming instruments that you have? Industries, is it easy to set up industries if you do not have the power for it? So there are a lot of interconnected things that we need to understand. And a lot more studies are required. Broadly, few things are now understood, but uh, this is an ongoing process. MRC is very seriously working on this project. We are also giving inputs to the authorities on certain way ahead. And uh, is there any questions uh, on this? Chat box. So the question reads, um, India issues notice to Pakistan to amend the 1960 Indus Water Treaty. So the so Chetan Kale asks why. Um, so as I mentioned in my uh, entire presentation, there are a lot of in multiple interpretation of the treaty. The treaty doesn't have enough uh, bandwidth to actually incorporate the technological innovations. So. And in the recent Kishan Ganga uh, issue, 
um pakistan again raised objection uh, af, uh in 2018 saying that uh, it it still doesn't agree with the court of arbitration uh, uh verdict and it says that it needs a neutral expert now so Pak india said that we still need a coa so uh, there's this huge uh, confusion regarding how indus basin is going to be managed climate change is not at all considered in the treaty and it is one of the hot issues which needs to be considered uh, in any basin so and even groundwater is not considered so we have a transboundary groundwater which we share which is not considered so there are a lot of aspects which are not there in the present treaty and india is right to say that it needs to amend in a more peaceful way in a more uh, coll collaborative way if pakistan uh, and uh, looking at the fact that pakistan's huge, uh, most of the economy depends on in this water india and pakistan needs to come to a common uh, ground to actually decide what is best for both of them so yes sir th uh, that's my answer so oh, thank you katrina i think you've covered most of it so thank you very much uh, this is a topic we can discuss a lot uh, i think i will not indulge into that now because it is uh, issue which has been raised by the government and we don't want to comment too much on what the intricate issues are but uh, i'll be happy to answer some questions in a private conversation but uh, thank you very much katherine uh, you've done a great job in covering various aspects and uh, when you touch upon policy i hope the participants appreciate there are so many dimensions to be covered and it requires a very very multidisciplinary approach to the whole uh, thing and Catherine comes from a very fantastic background and I think she's quite appropriate uh, to kind of deal with a topic like this. She is from St. Stephen's and then Ashoka University and then Shiv Nadar and uh, has been working on this for more than a year now and now we are getting into a little more serious work of how to bring the all aspects of intervention on the ground. And the digital transformation, I think, will become a very, very important aspect. And thank you, Catherine. It was a good presentation. So we will end the day today. <clears throat> thank you very much. Uh, we have enjoyed uh, delivering. And you can see the diverse nature of projects and how they are interconnected. And there are many more projects, but I think there is not enough time. But I would encourage you to visit our Marcy website. You will get a spectrum of there is a similar project on the Brahmaputra as well because there are issues there also and uh, but we don't have much time to present each and every but we'll be happy to interact with you please go on our website and see the different projects that we are doing even we have a project on impact of underwater noise on the diving because now with so much of activities going on a lot of diving activities will be required both recreational and occupational but the entire uh, you know pollution i mean uh, we have taken in that project, we have taken the specific aspect of underwater noise, uh, how it will affect and, you know, what should be the regulatory framework uh, looking at it. And even, you know, a technology tool to manage diving. Suppose you and me decide today that we want to go and dive in a particular place. Don't you think we need a, a tool to make sure how safe it is to dive in a particular area? And even from a regulatory perspective, if permissions have to be given, uh, don't you think there is a tool required which can, uh, from a public health and safety perspective, what should be? So we have uh, developed a tool on that as well. And uh, so we keep finding new ideas and keep working without worrying too much about whether we get a project on that or not. We have been working on the fundamental framework of the UDA. We have done a lot of projects. Uh, if you look at uh, the number of research notes that we have, you will get a lot of inputs. Young students can look at ideas. Uh, one is for their own degree requirement where they need to do projects. You can join us. But also startup uh, uh, enthusiasts can also come to us and look at certain ideas and we'll be happy to help. Thank you so much. We'll end day two. Happy to co continue the conversation tomorrow. Thank you.